Victor bowed his head wordlessly. Well, I'll let you steal away with your guest, Lady Nettle said. I'm sure she's not here to entertain me. With that, she moved off with Thistle, followed by a wake of other guests all vying for the Thalavar matriarch's attention. Alias offered Victor some cheese from her plate. The ship was rounding the harbor entrance now, and everything on the ship cast two shadows, one from the stern light, the other from the lighthouse. Looking across to the Westlight Plaza, Alias saw a group of people scurrying around in the twilight, setting up some sort of display on the northern shore of the peninsula. What's going on out there? she asked Victor. Ah, well, that's a surprise. You'll just have to wait and see, the nobleman said. Alias nodded. I shouldn't ask, but how did your business go with young Erdo? the swordswoman queried. Victor grinned conspiratorially. We discussed how easy it was to make an apology. Taking my cue from my father, who apologized for his arrest, I thought I might just apologize in advance, in case Hastor happens to fall overboard and no one notices. Should he falter in his attempt to swim ashore, or, gods forbid, should the Quelzarn happen to devour him, I assured him that my apologies to his family would be profuse, if not sincere. There isn't really a Quelzarn, is there? Alias asked knowing that such giant sea serpents were reputed to be very rare. Of course there is, Victor insisted. What do you think eats all the garbage tossed into the bay? Alias gave the nobleman a suspicious look. Have you ever seen this Quelzarn? she demanded. Many times, he replied, then added, though only on foggy nights when I'm alone, without, alas, any witnesses to back up my story. Alias laughed. So where is Hastor now? she asked. Victor looked around the deck, then shrugged. I've no idea, he answered, raising his eyebrows theatrically. Victor, you wouldn't... Alias looked around the deck uncertainly. The young nobleman chuckled. He's over there, hugging the mainmast. I don't imagine he'll go anywhere near the rails this evening. He's not a strong swimmer. Alias looked in the direction Victor had nodded. Hastor Erdo was surrounded by several young men and women who chatted with him amicably, but he was indeed keeping the mainmast at his back. I haven't seen Centaur Erdo, Alias noted. Wasn't he invited? Each noble house is invited, and each sends at least one representative, so the rest of the houses cannot gossip freely about it. Centaur Erdo, however, is prey to seasickness. Ordinarily, Centaur would send his oldest son, Marden, and Marden's wife. By sending Hastor in his stead, his father is showing Hastor his support. Hastor, despite the scandal of being arrested as a night mask, will remain a power. Consequently, sycophants will flock about him, seizing this opportunity to offer their support. Such people are liable to snub you given a chance. They aren't worth worrying about. Considering the company I'm in, I doubt I should notice them, Alias replied. She set aside her empty plate and glass. Shall we continue our tour? Victor smiled, took her arm, and steered her aft. The masts and keel, he explained, were fashioned from redwood logged in the far north, around Hartsvale, land of giants and giant trees. And where do you get the oarsmen? Alias asked. Sentence criminals? Sometimes, responded Victor. This particular crew, however, is made up of shareholders. Shareholders? Victor nodded. Of course. You didn't think we'd risk all the heads of Westgate in a boat with a crew of criminals, did you? People work better when they have a stake in the outcome. In this case, fight better and row better. They get a small portion of the profits this ship will make from House Dostar. Any who agreed to serve for this frivolous maiden voyage gets a double share of the first venture. We have no trouble finding rowers. At the deck level, the stern castle was open to the fore. In the rear, two sailors manned the tiller, but the rest of the area was taken up by tables for the guests. Lure Dostar and most of the noble clan elders sat at a table in the front of the stern castle, drinking, playing dice, and telling sea stories from their past. The crow mark nodded briefly at his son. He gave no indication of noticing Alias. Durgar, who sat on the Cromark's right, smiled ever so slightly at the swordswoman, 
but then turned his attention back to some elderly noble describing a run-in he'd had with pirates back when the world was young. Victor led Alias past the tables to the stairs in the back. Up or down? Alias asked. Up, said the young noble. Down is storage and berths for the crew. Alias climbed the steep stairs and paused at the first level. Victor gave her a peek into the officers' and guests' quarters. All but the captain's cabin looked cramped, but all were snug and smelled pleasantly of fresh pine. They climbed another set of steep stairs and stood alone on the roof of the stern castle. There was no one else up there. They could look down on the party below, but when they turned their backs, it seemed to disappear. Alias looked up into the darkness overhead, but due to the glare of the stern light, the lighthouse, and the waxing moon, she could pick out only the brightest stars. Victor strolled to the stern railing, and Alias drifted behind him. For the first time, Alias felt as if they were truly at sea, and not just because they'd left the bay. A stiff breeze shot across the port side. Alias shivered in the wind. I forgot I might need a cloak out here, she said. In the interest of chivalry, I feel obliged to offer you an arm around your shoulder, Victor said. In the interest of encouraging chivalry wherever I find it, I feel obliged to accept, Alias replied. Victor slid his arm around her back and Alias leaned against his side. The wide sleeves of his tunic served well as a shawl, and the warmth of his hand on her shoulder was wonderfully pleasant. Westgate was ablaze with lights that rivaled the stars above. The lighthouse, the street lights, the campfires on the shore. It's beautiful, isn't it? Victor said, regarding the city. Lit up on a clear night like this, it looks every bit as magical as ever meet as exotic of Karatur, as wealthy as Zakara, like a place of make-believe, a place where legends can be born. Alias made an agreeable and non-committal, mmm, unable to put out of her mind the night mask rot at the city's heart. As if he could read her thoughts, Victor added, if only we could excise the night masks without damaging the city. Well, we may be another step closer, Alias said. I've traced a protection racket from the shore back to a wealthy vintner in the city. His name's Melman. I wanted to be sure he wasn't some noble's cousin or brother-in-law. Victor furrowed his brow and thought, Melman, my father and I have exported some of his wine. No, he's not related to any of the noble houses. Good, I'm hoping he's a high-ranking night mask or will lead us to one. I've heard some stories. His house has an evil reputation, Victor said. Promise me you won't go there alone. Alias nodded. She didn't mention she knew the house well or that she planned to visit it later this very night. There was no sense worrying the young nobleman. Better still, why not just have Durgar arrest the man, Victor asked. Alias shook her head. Jamal, she said, has suggested that if we can just find the Faceless's treasury... We should be able to capture the artifact that keeps him and the Nightmasters magically sheltered from scrying and divinations. I'm hoping Melman might lead me to the Nightmasters' lair. He's not going to cooperate locked in a cell in the tower. How does Jamal know all this? Victor asked. She has a network of her own informants, Alice answered. I realize she must be a friend, but, well, she seems to know so much. Are you certain... Do you think it's possible that all this theater against the night masks is maybe a smokescreen? She could be one herself. She could be the faceless for all we know. Alias shook her head with a scowl. That's no more likely than your father being the faceless. Father, that's ridiculous. Is it? You said he refuses to pay the night masks protection, yet the night masks haven't wreaked their revenge on your operations as they have on House Thalavar. That's because they're afraid that father would make good on his threat to start a war in the streets. Or they have orders not to harm your opera. Alias halted, struck by a sudden idea. What is it? Victor asked. Or they've been geesed not to harm your family. Kimball would certainly make an excellent candidate. Victor shook his head. I keep an eye on Kimball. If he were running a thieves' guild on the side, I would know. But I'm also sure the faceless is not father. So am I, Alias agreed. But you just said. I was just pointing out that there are some inconsistencies. 
I suspect your father pays the night masks but is too proud to admit it. He's simply not a logical candidate. He has more money than an ancient dragon and the most powerful position in the whole city. He has no reason to belong to the night masks. Victor remained silent for too long. What's wrong? Alice asked. Nothing, Victor assured her, shaking himself. I was just thinking about how much my father wants to be Crowmark. You might also say he covets the post. After his first two terms, I was sure he'd recommend me. But then he insisted the time was wrong for a new man, and he offered himself for the third term. Then, after Lansdall Semp made such a mess of his four years, father told me he had to take up the next term, so I wasn't blamed for any problems Sem left behind. I know I'd make a good crow mark, but I need father's support to be elected. I know you'd make a good one too, Alice said. I have such plans. I know. You told me about them the day we met. Those are just the plans if I find Verovin's treasure. I have others I'd start without it. Build a navy to protect our trading ships from pirates, for one. And train an army of Westgate citizens, not mercenaries, to protect our caravans from brigands, for another. I've even begun to toy with your idea of offering more people a vote in the council. Not everyone, like you said. That would be chaos. But smaller merchants and important artisans and craftsmen. Bring in some new blood, like my father said about you. You should be Crowmark, Alias said. Don't wait for your father any more. When his term is up, tell him you're running with or without his support. I don't think I'd have enough support to defy him. You might be surprised, Alia said. Lady Thalivar thinks highly of you. She said everyone knows the Gleason was your victory. If I've managed to bring in the Faceless by then, everyone who stands against the Night Masks will support you too. Victor turned toward her, his face only inches from her own. And you? Would I have the support of one clever, beautiful warrior? Of course, Alias replied. Though I don't think my support means much in this city. With you by my side, I feel like I could conquer the world. What? Why are you laughing? Alias worked hard at stifling a giggle. I'm sorry. You just sounded for a moment like the hero in an opera. Opera's drawn from real life, after all, Victor replied. Maybe if you close your eyes and listen hard, you'll hear music, too. Alias closed her eyes. She felt Victor's lips brush against hers. I do hear that music, the swordswoman whispered as she slid her arms around the nobleman's waist. It sounds very far off, though. We need to bring it closer. She pulled Victor toward her and pressed her lips against his. At the base of the west light, Kimball checked his hourglass then nodded to the waiting servants. With smoldering sticks, the servants began lighting the fuses of the smoke powder novelties imported from Carateur. They spiraled up into the darkness on columns of sparks, finally exploding in flower-like bursts of light. The sky above flashed with color, reflected in the bay below. A few citizens of the city, those who'd actually witnessed magical fireball attacks, were bemused by this new toy of the wealthy. The less experienced, especially the children, were delighted with a spectacle they could share for free. Aboard the Gleason, although they were careful not to indicate how impressed they were by the displays, the nobles all agreed it was a fitting signal for the end of the ship's maiden voyage. Chapter 13 Conversations Ashore Ooh, that's a pretty one! Jamal exclaimed, as a golden marigold blossomed on the horizon. Mintassin harumped politely. When the first explosion sounded, Jamal had insisted they run up to Mintassin's airy, a balcony reached from a window of his attic. The sage's home was far enough up the hill for them to have a clear view of the fireworks blossoming over the bay. The sage and the actress reclined in heavy iron garden chairs which, after years of exposure to the elements, looked as if they'd been gnawed upon by rust monsters. Kel, newly scrubbed and dressed in some old clothes of the sages, leaned out over the balcony railing with all the disdain for personal safety a teenage boy could muster. Fireworks were still so rare in occurrence that the young thief was unable to hide his pleasure beneath his usual veneer of apathy. 
From his shouts and applause, it was obvious he preferred the noisier explosions to the more visually elaborate ones. Jamal rearranged the faded, mildew-ridden cushion at her back and took another sip of her wine. Ever think of getting some new furniture out here? she asked the sage. Not much reason to sit out here anymore, Mintassin grumbled. Since they added that blasted magical light to the harbor tower, the sky's too bright. Can't see the stars I chose to observe from my treatise on astronomy. Jamal looked up at the sky. The ones you can still see are lovely enough. I suppose, the sage said with a shrug. He was eyeing Kel nervously, certain that the boy would flip over the railing any minute, requiring a magical flying spell for his rescue. The sage leaned nearer the actress and murmured softly, He, Mintassin indicated Kel with a jerk of his head, was looking over the silver tea set, estimating its resale value. He could calculate a 27% cut in his head, but he can't read. He said he doesn't need to learn to read. How can he say that? How can he think that? No one's given him reason enough, Jamal replied. Although I'm sure a clever man like yourself can find some motivation for him. Me? Why me? Well, it's not likely he'd want to imitate an old lady with modest thespian skills. Boys need to look up to men. Because I'm a man, my home has become a shelter for homeless actresses and underage rogues? More likely because you're a powerful mage, remember? Jamal retorted. Mintassin shrugged off the comment. I'm beginning to dread it when Alias goes out after night masks. Who knows what she'll bring back next? Maybe she'll bring back young Victor Dostar, Jamal suggested. Mintassin scowled. I'm not taking him in. I don't even know why I agreed to take Kel, he complained. Because Alias asked you, and she's a clever, pretty woman, Jamal stated. Mentassin flushed ever so slightly. I'm simply extending her a courtesy because she's a friend of Griff's, he argued. Is that what Victor Dostar is doing by inviting her to his posh party? Simply extending a courtesy? Jamal asked, peering with concern at a firework that exploded a little too low on the horizon. I don't imagine he's failed to notice how attractive she is. I noticed she was pretty, said so the first night she came in here. I can't understand why she would have anything to do with Victor Dostar, though. She's a bright, experienced adventurer. He's a puffed-up greengrocer, Mintassin declared, using the adventurer's term for a merchant. Well, when he's not standing in his father's shadow, people seem to think he's pretty capable, Jamal remarked. If Lura were to die this millennium, Victor might take his place as Kromark. Kromark, oh, that's different, Mintassin said contemptuously, his face illuminated by the light from a distant skyrocket. King of the Green Grocers. And he and Alias do have something in common. What? What do they have in common? Mintassin demanded. A desire to rid the city of the night masks. I don't especially like them either, the sage pointed out. But you don't care much about Westgate. That's not true. I grew up in this city, the same as you. And you left it just as soon as you could to go gadding about the plains and other bizarre places. You only think of this city as a convenient place to store all the junk you bring back from adventuring. Mintassin paused thoughtfully, then shrugged. All right, I admit it. I find cities boring, full of boring people. Present company accepted, of course. Alias wasn't interested in Westgate either when she first came. Dragon baiting you talked her into the job. I think Victor Dostar had more to do with it than we did, Jamal replied. Sure, rub it in. Mentassin grumbled into his wine. Still, as you pointed out, Victor Dostar is just a green grocer. He really can't do too much to protect her. It wouldn't hurt to have a wizard watching her back. She can't be scried, remember? You don't get close to a person by watching her through a crystal ball. I was thinking you might involve yourself in a more active role. Offer to go with her the next time you have a chance, Jamal suggested. I think behind this request to look out for your cheap hero is an ulterior motive, playing matchmaker, the sage noted. I'm too busy to worry about nonsense like that. My ulterior motive is to unnerve the faceless, Jamal replied. He relies on the neutrality of people like you, Mintassin. I'm hoping he'll grow anxious and careless if he perceives the balance shifting against him. You're bringing out all your reserves for this battle, Jamal. 
So certain you can end the war this season? Mentassin asked. The actress sighed. Not really, but the fight is beginning to wear me down. I'm giving it all I've got before I get another year older. The horizon lit up with the fireworks finale, a shower of multiple bursts that raced along the length of the peninsula. Scattered applause broke out from watchers in the street. Kel climbed down from the balcony railing, his eyes wide and alert. Did you enjoy the fireworks? Jamal prodded him. The youth's eyes took on a wariness common to all young people when called upon to pass judgment on adult endeavors. It was all right, he allowed with a shrug. He was too excited to remain indifferent for long. I want to be able to do that someday, he admitted. You want to work with fireworks? Mintassin queried, bemused. No, the boy corrected, shooting Mintassin a look suggesting the sage was as dumb as a rock. I want to be a great thief, like the Faceless, or an important merchant, like one of the Doe Stars, so I can afford to have fireworks every night. Then I'd get some serious respect. Mintassin looked down at the youth with astonishment. It took him more than a moment to recover and ask, You think their wealth is something to respect? Sure, Kel answered. What could be better? The sage harumped and rose to his feet. How about this? he responded. Pointing to the iron chair he just vacated, he intoned, Quesarius, Amano, Elusar, Joe! A miniature sphere of orange and white flame formed at his fingertip, then streaked toward the chair, emitting an ear-splitting shriek. A second and a third sphere formed and sped after the first. As the flaming orbs hurtled past, Kel could see on their surfaces tiny faces with howling mouths. The fiery spheres orbited around the iron chair, faster and faster, spinning a cocoon of white light. The cocoon began to stretch and deform as something within grew and pushed outward. An iron claw slashed through the cocoon, and an iron muzzle poked out. With the sound of shattering glass, the cocoon dissipated into myriad light motes, which sparkled and vanished to reveal a miniature iron dragon. The worm flapped its wings, arched its neck, and gave a low roar. Smoke, smelling like burning mildewy cushions, streamed from the creature's nostrils. Then the beast settled back on its rear haunches, folded its wings, and became still. Kel, his eyes as wide as saucers, reached out gingerly and touched the transmuted iron chair, now in a mobile sculpture of ornate detail and great beauty. Holding Kel in place with a hand on his shoulder, Mintassin lifted the boy's chin so that their eyes met. Knowledge is better than wealth, the sage said. It cannot be stolen. It cannot be bought. Once you possess it, it is yours for life. You can accumulate knowledge by observing, listening, and questioning. The truly wise can do so by reading and writing as well. Kel squinted with a doubtful look trying to analyze the truth of Mentassin's arguments. If I learn to read, can I do that? he asked, pointing at the Iron Dragon. Mentassin snorted derisively. Reading isn't a skill you acquire to learn parlor tricks. Reading lights the pathways to all knowledge. The ability to travel each pathway varies with the individual, but reading makes the journey easier. The expression on Kel's face indicated he was struggling to understand the sage's metaphor. He glanced back at the iron dragon as if it could offer him illumination. Then he looked back at the sage. So, how do I learn this stuff, he asked. First, you need to get a good night's sleep, Mintassin said. Lessons are learned better in the morning. The boy clambered back into the attic and bolted for the stairs, as if speed would bring the next day closer. You really know how to motivate a child, Jamal said with a grin. Great thieves and rich merchants, what sort of heroes are those for young boys to have? Mintassin asked with a shake of his head. The sort that fade into obscurity when better men make an effort to impress them, Jamal replied, giving the sage's shoulder a grateful squeeze. Good night, she murmured as she slipped through the attic window. Mintassin remained on the balcony for a while longer, alone with his thoughts. The fireworks have been over for half an hour now, Olive said. She should be back soon. The halfling stood at the open window. Although the second story of Blaze House did not offer a clear view of the harbor, 
She had been able to catch sight of the higher sky rockets and, of course, hear the entire display. Dragonbait, his attention focused on the chessboard, made a non-committal noise. He'd beaten Olive at two games already, and he had been winning a third when the halfling had abandoned the game to watch the fireworks. Not surprisingly, when the fireworks ended, the Sariel had been unable to coax Olive back to the board. So now he was continuing the game solitaire, playing both sides. The chess pieces gilded in white gold represented the Cormerian forces. Those in yellow gold, the Twigan horde. Dragonbait made a clicking noise with his tongue and dragged Vangardahas diagonally across the length of the board to capture a Hordland's horseman. Then the Sariel switched positions at the table and considered the halfling's crumbling defenses. Olive peered out into the darkness where she could just make out the west light. I wonder what's going on out there, she said, not for the first time that evening. On the boat, I mean. This Lord Victor seems genial enough for a human, but he is still one of the merchant nobles. The most poisonous snakes are the most brightly colored, my mother used to say. Dragonbait made the same disinterested huffing noise he'd made the last three times Olive had tried to draw him into a discussion of the party on the Gleason, or Victor's character. He maneuvered the remaining Hordsland's horsemen to threaten the Cormerian sage Dimswart, but the move only delayed the inevitable. Olive had left her Tweegan forces in complete disarray. This time, Olive would not be deterred from her speculations. Jamal says Lady Gleason, his mother, Victor said is, died young. Considering Lord Lure's reputation for arrogance, one has to wonder how Lord Victor turned out to be so pleasant. Maybe he had a halfling nanny or something. She's out there alone, alias I mean, not even a chaperone. Dragonbait changed sides and stared at the situation from the Cormerian side. From behind the King Azun figure, it looked like mate in three moves. He couldn't imagine what Olive was worrying about. Alias had once taken on a dragon single-handedly. How the swordswoman could have trouble on a two-hour cruise eluded him. More likely, the Sariel reasoned, Olive was trying to cover her nervousness about their planned excursion to Cassana's old house. A long pause ensued as Dragonbait changed sides again and tried to discover a way out of his self-inflicted attack. But an escape was denied the Tweegans. Mate in two now. At least the Tweegans should have something more to show for it. He took the Dimswart piece and the horseman. At least she has her sword with her, Olive said. Dragonbait toppled the Tweegan Khan and growled. Olive turned at the Sariel's guttural roar. In the thieves hand cant the paladin signed she'll be all right don't worry don't worry olive retorted alice is out there alone with that green grocer give me one good reason why i shouldn't worry alice is in good hands the paladin signed lord victor is an honest valiant and worthy young human she spent most of her life in the lost vale with your people and now she should spend time with her own people you just can't throw her into this society alone. You didn't have any of these objections when Giyogi Wyvernspur married her sister Kat. That's because I knew Giyogi well enough to trust him. He was a really nice boy. I've looked into Lord Victor, the paladin signed. The closest the hand can't could come to expressing his Shen sight. His intentions are good. Well, we all know what road good intentions pave. Alias can take care of herself. The paladin signed hard and fast, and the halfling could detect the chicken-like scent of his impatience. Physically, yes, Olive agreed, but emotionally, she's still just a child. Her feelings have grown more quickly the last few years. Even worse, Olive retorted, that would make her a teenager, impulsive and reckless. Why does this worry you so? I do think of her as my friend, you know. I don't want to see her get hurt making the same mistakes I did when I was young. Lord Victor could be as nice as Giogi Wyvernspur. Olive looked doubtful. Even so, that leaves us with another problem. I don't know how it works among your people, but among the fur-bearing races of halflings and humans, love wreaks havoc on us. It's like pouring sand into the fine gearwork of the mind.
When you should be thinking about your enemy's position and your defenses and where to strike, your mind is wandering off and you're thinking about his eyes or his smile or what he said last. The paladin thought of Alias's own comments about the lovers by the fountain on the day they arrived in Westgate. With eyes only for each other, they were sitting ducks, she'd said. Alias knows enough to guard against that, he signed. Ha! Olive declared. Shows what you know. I'll never be that stupid, is what every woman thinks until it happens to her. Then, too, something could happen to Lord Victor. He could be hurt or kidnapped. Alias wasn't all that rational when she thought Finder was threatened. What would she be like if something happened to someone else she'd grown attached to? The halfling's warnings were cut short by the sound of horses' hooves on the cobblestones outside. The halfling and Sariel exchanged glances, then Olive padded over to the window. Standing in the shadow of the curtain, she looked down onto the street. After a moment, she waved Dragonbait to approach. The Sariel sighed and ambled forward, but the halfling grabbed his tunic and jerked him to the side. Stand in the shadows, she hissed. Feeling a little foolish and a little guilty, but also a little anxious, the paladin did as instructed before looking down on the street. He shifted nervously, made uncomfortable by the sight below. Victor's carriage stood outside the hotel door. As Lord Victor helped Alias down, she slid into his arms, threw her own around his neck, and pressed her lips against his. The pair remained embracing, lips locked against each other for an embarrassingly long period to witness. Dragonbait pulled Olive away from the window, back to the chessboard, and made her sit down opposite him. They both stared at the chessboard without seeing the pieces, waiting for Alias's return. When Victor finally released her, Alias drew in a deep breath and giggled. You make me feel so good, Victor whispered. Good as in virtuous, Alias teased, gently nibbling at his ear. Lucky, happy, fortunate, fated, delighted, the young noble burbled. I've never had anyone I could really talk to. Knowing you understand that you're with me, he faltered for words. Are you sure you have to go? The swordswoman nodded. It's late. We both have a lot to do tomorrow. It's already tomorrow, Victor murmured, sliding his hand up and down her back. Exactly, Alias retorted, and she slipped gracefully from his grasp and began climbing the steps to the hotel door. Lord Victor reached out and grasped her wrist. Alias, he entreated her. Yes, the swordswoman answered, making no attempt to pull her captured arm away. Lord Victor moved closer, standing on the step just beneath hers. He looked up into her eyes. Give me a token, he demanded with a grin, or I shall never let you go. A token? Alias replied with a little laugh, not certain she heard him correctly. A token to show your regard for me. At least that is, I hope you have some regard for me. For my feelings, for what you mean to me. Please, some trinket to remind me of you when we're apart. Alias thought of her new earrings, but somehow they didn't seem enough a part of her. I don't think I have, she started to say. Then she thought of something appropriate. Wait. You have to let go of my hand first, though. Victor released her and held out both his hands cupped together, waiting for his boon. With a deft motion, Alias released the peace bond knot tying her sword to her scabbard. She drew out her sword and raised it to her head. She held out the strand of hair she wore in an ornamental braid and sliced the braid off with the blade of her weapon. She slid her sword back into its scabbard. After curling the braid into a tiny loop, she laid it in the young noble's palms. Your token, my lord, she whispered. Accepted gratefully, my lady, Victor replied, bending briefly to one knee. He tucked the red ringlet into his shirt. Then his arms snaked out again and grasped the swordswoman about her waist. He pulled her toward him until they stood lips to lips. They kissed again. Finally, the young noble released the swordswoman. Alias ran up the steps and into the hotel. Lord Victor climbed back into his carriage and urged his horses forward. As the carriage rolled away, the halfling and the sariel could hear Alias moving toward them in the hallway, singing a love song. Oh yeah, she seems really guarded to me, Olive mocked the paladin. She sat back down beside the chessboard and righted her overturned king. 
Your move, dragon bait, she said. The paladin sat across from the halfling, his brow furrowed as the ham-like scent of his anxiety wafted out the open window. Chapter 14 Melman's Place It took the swordswoman only a few minutes to change from her finery back into her armor, but in that time the weather had turned. Clouds rolled in from the east, veiling the moon and mist rolled up from the bay and the river, shrouding the streets. Despite the cover this provided the three adventurers, Olive insisted they take one extra precaution to elude any possible night masks who might be spying on them, leave the city via the Thalavar's secret underground tunnel. Once outside the city, Olive crept southward, keeping in the shadow of the city wall, with Alias and Dragonbait following behind. Since only the halfling had been both conscious and free of the sorceress Cassana's magical controls when they last used the tunnel that led to Cassana's former home, they had to rely on Olive to lead them to the outside entrance. They sneaked over the fence into the Sem family stockyards and made their way to the eastern end of the yards. As the halfling rustled through an overgrown dry wash, searching for the entrance, Alias and Dragonbait kept watch at the wash's rim. The moon broke through the clouds for a few moments, and then Alias could make out seven mounds to the southeast. There was a good deal of activity in the stockyards to the west of the dry wash. Caravans were being readied for departure in the morning. Alias shifted nervously, worried that she would be discovered trespassing, and Orgul Sem would add his complaints to those of Centaur Erdo, further annoying the Croamark. Olive, she whispered, what's taking you so long? I'll bet the passage hasn't been used since Finder and I came through it. The gully is really overgrown, the halfling whispered back. An eternity of heartbeat seemed to pass before Olive called out to report her success. Dragonbait, able to detect the heat of the halfling's body in the dark, took Alias's arm and led her to Olive's location. The halfling crawled out from beneath a thicket of wild raspberry. I don't think either of you could get through like I could, Olive reported. You'll have to hack at the brush some. The two warriors drew their swords and cut into the briars until they cleared a path into a tributary of the gully. There, Olive whispered excitedly, pointing into the hillside. The doorway was partially blocked by mud and rock carried by heavy rains. But the door was still visible. Fortunately, it opened inward, so they weren't required to do any digging. Alias pushed up the latch with the tip of her weapon and nudged the door open with her foot. The door's hinges made an alarming squeal, and a decade's worth of dust assailed the swordswoman's nostrils. Dragonbait whispered, Toast, in Sariel, causing his enchanted blade to blaze. Igniting a straw from the paladin's sword, Alias used it to light a conventional lantern. Dragonbait took the point. Alias followed behind him. Olive, after one last look down the dry wash to be sure no one had observed them, slipped through the door behind the warriors. The passageway beneath the city wall was so narrow that the adventurers had to go single file. Olive's nose twitched in the dusty sepulchral air. Smells like Zri Prakis, the halfling complained. Remembering the lich's smell, Alia shuddered in spite of herself. Prakis had been among the alliance of evil beings who'd created her. Each being had had some evil purpose for the swordswoman, but it was Prakis's purpose that had unnerved Alias the most. Prakis had had a long-abiding love-hate relationship with Cassana, even after he'd become undead. He wanted an enslaved Alias to replace Cassana. That's good, though, Alias said, if it means that no one has been using the passage since then. Look, ours are the first footprints in the dust in years. Maybe because it's haunted, the halfling suggested unhappily. Spiderwebs across the passage crackled and fizzled away, ignited by Dragonbait's fiery blade as they moved forward. But there was nothing they could do to keep the dust from swirling up into their faces. Olive, who was closer to the floor, had to put up with more, and she muttered nonstop complaints all the way down the passage. Alias began to sense that the shorter woman was fighting a growing sense of panic. The halfling had also been a prisoner in this house. 
in all but name. They're all dead, Olive, Alia said, trying to reassure the woman. Nothing but dust is left of them, she added. Then realized as Olive puffed at the dust in the air that that probably wasn't the most reassuring thing she could have said. Olive laughed a little nervously. They reached a dead end in the passage, a wall of solid rock. Dragonbait sniffed at the blockage, trying to discern any breeze or whiff of fresh air that would reveal a hidden mechanism. Allow me, the halfling said, stepping forward. Coming out of Kazana's, the catch to move this wall was on the right. We can probably reach it from the left, going in this direction. Olive ran her hand along the wall until it disappeared into a hole in the rock. There was a click which echoed down the secret passage behind them. Olive stepped back. I've done my bit. Now it's your turn. Push here on the right side. The wall pivots. You'll have to put some muscle into it to get it started. But then its weight swings it around. Alia set down the lantern and began shoving at the wall. After a moment, she felt it begin to move but something seemed to be jamming it on the other side. Dragonbait held his sword out for Olive to hold. The halfling took the heavy weapon with some trepidation. The paladin put his back into the labor along with Alias. The door moved another inch, then another. Just like old times, Olive said in an excited whisper. My brains, your brawn. A dusty dungeon, the hint of danger. Now all we need is... The door rotated a full ninety degrees, and something clattered to the ground behind it. Gold coins glinted in the lantern light as they rolled across the floor. Treasure, Olive concluded, handing Dragonbait back his weapon. With a squeal of delight, she pressed her way past the two warriors. The cellar floor was carpeted with a layer of shifting gold coins and a smattering of silver utensils, bowls, and tea services. It appeared that a mound of treasure had been piled up against the secret door. Olive went scuffling through the coins like a child kicking up fallen leaves in the autumn, humming happily. Her practiced eye made a quick survey for gems, jewels, or particular stunning pieces of silver. But there were none of those. She contented herself by rolling about atop the coins and washing her hands in them with a laugh. Not bad at all, the halfling said with a sigh. It doesn't appear that the current owners know anything about the secret passage, or this treasure wouldn't have been left so conveniently in our path. Alias frowned as she peered at the glistening walls around the dungeon. Olive, she whispered. Do you remember the walls down here being damp? Bound to be some seepage in the basement this deep, the halfling replied, scooping handfuls of coins into her pockets. The halfling giggled as she moved down the corridor. I can just picture whoever settled Cassana's estate trying to sell the old place. Yes, madam, the walls of the basement do leak, but that's a minor inconvenience when you consider the value. Four bedrooms, single bath, prison cells in the basement. The previous owner was a notorious sorceress. She lived here quietly with her undead lover. Did I mention the secret passageway? Olive froze in her tracks, literally, one foot poised over the ground in a step that never came down. She remained motionless, and even stranger for Olive, speechless. Dragonbait took a step toward the curiously immobile suspended halfling, but Alias caught him by the arm. She bent down, grabbed a handful of coins, and flung them down the corridor. The air about them seemed to ripple and surge for a moment. Then the coins hung in the air, just as did the halfling's foot. Realizing now what caused the walls to glisten, Alias rang forward. It's a gelatinous cube, she shouted. It swallowed Olive. We've got to cut her out before she suffocates. The scavenging monster had been practically invisible in the lantern light, but the adventurers could now see it rippling as the creature, alerted to their movements, slithered toward the secret door in an effort to engulf them. It had no intelligence, so its attack was purely instinctual, and it towered over them and blocked the passage completely. Alias struck first with a sweeping semicircular cut along one side of the cube, wide enough to miss the imprisoned halfling, but close enough to loosen the monster's grip. Dragonbait began slicing at the jelly-like creature with his flaming sword, creating great scorching gashes in its side. The smell of burning flesh permeated the air. With her free hand, Alias grabbed Olive's shirt collar and pulled hard. 
There was a soft sucking sound as the cube attempted to draw the halfling deeper into its digestive interior. Knowing that the gelatinous cube exuded a slime capable of paralyzing even the largest of prey, Ali shifted backward to avoid contact with the creature and nearly lost her grip on the halfling. The warrior woman stabbed the creature and released the hilt of her sword. With both hands clenched on the halfling's shirt, she yanked with all her might. There was a squishing noise, and the slime-encrusted halfling erupted from the side of the cube. Allie slipped on the carpet of coins and fell over backward, all of landing on top of her. A layer of clear ooze still covered the halfling, but separated from the host body, the goo could not survive and began to evaporate in a thin mist. The creature sent out a protrusion that crested over the heads of the two women like a wave. Before the wave could overwhelm them, the sariel slashed it from the body of the gelatinous cube. The wave, cut off from its parent, began to steam into nothingness before it hit the ground. Alias's sword clattered into the coins as the creature, damaged beyond its ability to hold its shape, slumped to the ground in a puddle of steaming goo. Alias rolled Olive on her back and pushed on her stomach. The halfling gagged and coughed up a slimy bubble, then took a gasp of air. Alias breathed a sigh of relief. Is she all right? The paladin asked, as the halfling stirred feebly while ooze steamed off her body. Alias nodded. She walked into it with her mouth open, she explained. Probably paralyzed her vocal cords. Maybe we'll get some quiet for a while, she said with a grin. That's not funny, Olive retorted in a hoarse whisper. They took the time to investigate the rest of the cellar. Dragonbait stood staring thoughtfully into the prison cell where he'd once been chained awaiting death, the cell where he'd sworn to the nameless bard that he would protect Alias. Except for the glistening slime left by the gelatinous cube, everything was just as he remembered it. Alias, who had no clear memory of the place, was busy investigating bits of litter on the floor mixed in with the gold coins and the remains of the jelly creature. Several old rat skeletons, the skull of a very large cat, fruit peelings, moldy cheese, some bloody bandages. The swordswoman studied the ceiling. There was a hole overhead. Melman must be using the cellar as a midden, Alias guessed. If it weren't for the gelatinous cube cleaning up down here, we might have had to wade through garbage. Melman probably threw the poor creature down here when it was just a bud. The door between the house upstairs and the cellar is secret too, Olive explained. Melman may not even realize that there's anything down here. He may think there's just an old well or sewer. I'll bet this treasure is all Cassana's original hoard. Prakis said she stored it down here, probably in there. The halfling pointed to a side room with a missing door. The hinges remained suspended from the door frame. The door must have been wood. After several years, the gelatinous cube dissolves it, slips into the treasury, drags the coins around beneath it, leaving them piled in front of the secret passageway. Dragonbait extinguished the flame of his sword, and Alias covered the lantern so that only the faintest light showed. Then the trio climbed the spiral staircase leading to the first floor of the house. At the top, they halted and listened for any sounds that might indicate they'd been heard. The house seemed preternaturally still. Alias wondered if perhaps Olive had been spotted tailing one eye to the house, causing Melman to bolt. Olive, her ear to the secret panel, looked suspicious. But she finally pushed on the section of wall that released the secret panel. The curved section of wall slid easily enough until it caught on something in the alcove on the other side. Olive was just able to slip through the crack in the secret entrance. There she discovered the obstruction immediately. In Cassana's time, there had been on display in the alcove a stone statue of a particularly voluptuous succubus. The new owner had replaced it with a brass sculpture of a masked warrior driving a spear through the heart of a maggot-ridden mastiff. The end of the spear was blocking the secret panel from sliding all the way open. Grunting and shoving with all her might, Olive found she could not shift the sculpture. She solved the problem by hanging on the end of the spear until it bent downward, out of the door's path. On the halfling signal, Alia shifted the panel open all the way, and she and Dragonbait stepped into the hallway beside Olive. The three adventurers moved down the hallway until they stood at the base of the staircase to the second floor. 
There was a light on in a room upstairs, and voices drifted down the stairs. It sounded like a man and a woman arguing, but Alias could not make out any distinct words. She frowned anxiously. If the shouts came from the master of the house and some female friend, it was likely there were also servants awake and about. As the shouting grew closer, Alias motioned Dragonbait into the hallway behind the stairs. Olive had already faded into some other shadowy recess of the house. And you call yourself a healer, the man above bellowed. There are limitations to every craft, the woman snarled back. You are lucky I could ease your pain. Perhaps after its scars I can help further, but not now. The wound's magic is still too strong. So you say, the man shot back. What good is a healer who will not heal? I think you're in league with him. Someone now stood on the first landing, casting a shadow down the stairs and into the hallway. If I were, the woman argued, why would I come here in the middle of the night? Let it scar, then I'll call again. Until that time, I recommend you keep a very low profile. Good night. Someone stomped very deliberately down the stairs and paused at the bottom. Alias peeked around the railing. It was a woman dressed in a tunic and leggings made from satin fabric printed with a harlequin diamond pattern. She wore a mask of black fabric that covered her face from her forehead to her nose. Around her neck was an iron necklace of a stylized mask, the unholy symbol of Mask, the god of thieves. The woman wrapped herself in a voluminous cape of wolf fur, nodded, and waved to someone down the hall, then let herself out the front door. Alias waited anxiously for several moments, expecting a servant to come down the hall, but only Olive appeared. Did you see who she waved to? The swordswoman asked the halfling. The sculpture we were pushing around. It's supposed to be of the god Mask, stabbing Kizef, the Chaos Hound, Olive explained. Her voice was still a hoarse whisper. Wishful thinking on the part of Mask worshippers. She's a priestess of Mask. She was just making an obeisance to the image of her master. Alias nodded as she wondered what was wrong with Melman that he required a healer in the middle of the night, and why couldn't the priestess heal him? Alias checked the door to what had once been Cassana's laboratory. The door was securely locked. Olive pulled out a tiny wire and began working at the lock as Alias and Dragonbait proceeded to investigate all the other first-floor rooms. It didn't take them long to ascertain that there was no one else in the other rooms. If there were servants in the house, Alias suspected they were quartered upstairs. Throughout their search, she could hear pacing upstairs, punctuated by a man cursing occasionally. Alias took the precaution of securing and locking the front door against any other evening visitors. Then she and Dragonbait returned to the entrance of the previously locked laboratory. The halfling stood within, her lantern propped up on an accounting table. A huge smile graced her face. With its window bricked up, the room had been converted to a treasure vault. All about the halfling were sacks, crates, and chests, each labeled with a tag. Alias read the nearest one. In a crabbed, tight handwriting was the notation, 500 gold, 100 platinum, duck statues stolen from family Erdo for later ransom. Quite a hoard for a simple vintner, Alias noted. Grapes must have been exceedingly good these last few years. Olive pointed to the last pages of a thin red leather-bound ledger lying on the accounting table. According to these figures, Melman's profits are minimal, not even enough to require payment of business taxes. So, all this is just spare change he's found lying in the street, Alias commented. Olive held up a finger for Alias to wait, then thumped deftly on the side of the accounting table, and a small secret drawer sprang out. From it, the halfling pulled out a second ledger. This, Olive said, cracking open the ledger and taking several moments to peer down the page, shows that our man Melman is a major player in Westgate. He's got his thumb in extortion, fencing, smuggling. It's all written down here. So we've caught ourselves a big night mask, Alias whispered with glee. Actually, Olive said, lifting a false bottom out of the secret drawer and pulling out yet a third ledger. We've caught ourselves a big night mask who cheats. First ledger for the law, second ledger for his criminal cohorts and bosses. Third ledger, 
Well, that will have the numbers closest to reality. Melman was not only skimming off the top, but he was collecting outside his own territory. Here's today's entry from one eye in the second ledger. 200 gold, gateside protection, it says. In the third ledger, it's entered as 300 gold, gateside, and the shore. Let's see if Melman is interested in talking about his books, Alias suggested. Just as the adventurers began climbing the stairs, they encountered their man turning on the landing, coming down toward them. He was dressed in a long nightshirt and slippers, and oddly enough, a full cloak with a very deep hood which concealed his features. For such a heavy man, Melman moved very quickly. The moment he spotted them, he grabbed from the landing a halfling-sized urn filled with dried flowers, tossed it down the stairs, and bolted back up to the second story. Dragonbait dodged aside, but longer-legged Alias leapt over the obstacle and charged after her prey. Olive caught the urn and fell back down the stairs with a curse and a crash. In the upstairs hallway, Alias caught sight of Melman disappearing into the only lit room in the house. He tried to slam the bedroom door closed, but he caught his cloak in the door frame and was forced to reopen it to pull the robe free. Alias threw herself against the door before the night mask could manage to lock it. The force of the swordswoman's entry flung the vintner into the center of the room. His hood fell back, revealing his face, and Alias felt her throat constrict in horror. This must be what Jamal had meant when she spoke of the branded ones, Alias realized. Melman's face was hideously burned all about his eyes, in the shape of a domino mask. The damaged flesh was covered with great white blisters and bright red all about the edges. Blisters even covered his eyelids, and in the brightly candlelit bedroom his eyes squinted as if the light pained them. Alias recovered quickly from her shock and leveled her sword at the man's chest. It's you, Alias the Sellsword, Melman gasped. When I saw you on the stairs, I thought you were a burglar, he explained. Meekly, he raised both hands, shaking back his sleeves to reveal there are no weapons concealed there. I'm glad to see you recognize me, Master Melman, the swordswoman said. We have a lot to talk about. I haven't got anything to say to you, the vintner insisted. Dragonbait and Olive entered the room. Olive whistled at the sight of Melman's brand. I can see why he needed a priestess, the halfling muttered. The rest of the house is empty, the paladin reported in Sariel. I can summon the watch, you know. You're all trespassing, Melman declared, his voice rising in pitch. It appears you've let all the servants have the night off, Alias noted. Didn't want them to catch sight of your face. No matter, I'm sure Olive will be glad to fetch the watch for you if you're serious. The watch will probably be fascinated with the trove of treasure you've got downstairs, especially those pieces that are undeniably stolen property. Then too, there are the ledgers. So many different accounting books. Olive made for the door, suppressing a grin, but she halted when Melman called out, No need for that. What do you want? As you already saw, I can offer you a great deal. Alias motioned for Melman to have a seat. What I want from you, Master Melman, is information. Let's start with the faceless. Melman sat down on the bed. Who? the vintner asked. But there was a quiver in his voice that belied his ignorance. Alias leaned forward. The faceless, Master Melman. You remember him. He is the man who burnt your face. This, Melman said, pointing to his face, an accident. Walked into a torch. Very funny, Alias said. We'll see if the watch finds you so amusing. You should get along with his reverence, Durgar. He doesn't know anything about the Faceless either. The Faceless, however, knows something about you. He probably knows you'd be dangerous in Durgar's custody. I understand night masks do not always survive once they are taken by the authorities. Melman flinched, and he licked his lips nervously. Try to understand, the man pleaded. If this is my punishment for arguing, the vintner pointed to his face again. Imagine what will happen if I betray them. At a nod from Alias, Dragonbait stepped forward. He spread his clawed fingers to touch the perimeters of Melman's shocking wound. At first, the vintner shrunk back. But when it became clear that the Sariel was not attacking him, he relaxed considerably. The paladin's whispered prayer invoked the same healing blue aura over his hands as ever, but the blue light seemed to spark and dissolve as it formed. Melman's face remained as damaged as before. The Sariel looked at Alias and growled and clicked. 
There is some evil force preventing the healing. I've never encountered anything like it. Is that what happened when the priestess of Mask tried to heal you? Alias asked Melman. The man nodded. He said it wouldn't heal until it scabbed over. He who? The faceless? Melman nodded. Alias felt her stomach twist with excitement. An admission of the faceless's existence was a major concession from the man. Now, if she could just press her advantage. So, basically, the faceless has made it impossible for you to leave your home for the next several days, Alias pointed out. In the meantime, you're a sitting duck. Melman did not reply. You didn't think we were burglars when you spotted us, did you? You thought we might be night mask assassins, the swordswoman guessed. That's ridiculous, Melman retorted, but without much conviction. Is it? I don't think so. This is the deal, Master Melman. You tell us all you know about the Faceless and the Nightmasters, and if you're telling the truth, I'll help you escape from Westgate. Dragonbait radiated the scent of his displeasure with this idea, but he said nothing, instead shifting toward the window. You hold out on us, though, Melman, and I'm going to have to leave your fate to Durgar's discretion. Melman shuddered. I'll... I'll tell you what I can, he said. Good. Let's start with you. Are you one of the Nightmasters? the swordswoman asked. Melman nodded wordlessly. Why did the Faceless brand you? I argued with him in council. I wanted you killed, but he insists he has some other plan to take care of you. He's playing some bizarre power game that's liable to ruin business for good. None of us have any idea who or what he might be. At Alias's prodding, Melman described the last several meetings of the Nightmasters highlighting the parts of the discussion that dwelt on her and Jamal. As he began covering the details, Melman began to relax, until finally it was as if he were sitting with other merchants in the bar, chatting about business. The Nightmasters report to the Faceless every other evening, Melman explained, always at low tide. The entrance to the hideout is on the western bank of the Thun, beneath the river bridge. It's covered at high tide. It's hidden by magic. But if you have the key, you can see through the illusion. Melman reached into his shirt. Alias raised her sword just an inch. The Nightmaster gave her an uneasy smile and pulled out a chain around his neck. Hanging from the chain was an iron key with a circular grip. He held out the key and Olive took it from him. You look through the grip, the Nightmask explained, and you can see the door. The tide is just turning now. You won't be able to see the door until tomorrow afternoon. The next meeting of the Nightmasters won't be until tomorrow night. Alias, Dragonbait interrupted in Sariel. There's trouble coming this way. Nightmasks. Assassins. Olive, check outside, the swordswoman ordered. The halfling moved toward the window and peered out from the side. I don't see... Wait. Hmm. Nightmasks. Nine that I can count. Probably more around the side of the house, hanging in the shadows across the street, surrounding us. Melman's face went white from shock, making the red markings of his burned mask stand out all the more. He's found me out already. Those are assassins. I shouldn't have talked to you. The vintner stood up, looking as if he might try to run past Alias. But Dragonbait pushed him back onto the bed. Don't be foolish, Alias snapped, keeping her voice calm and even. No one knows we're here, and we can't be detected magically. More likely, the Faceless had already decided to bring your career to an end. You're lucky we're here to get you out of this. Looks like they've gathered for a quorum, Olive quipped. They're starting to cross the street. They'll soon regret gathering here, Dragonbait said, drawing out his sword. Alias put a hand on the paladin's arm. It's better they don't discover we've been here. Faceless won't suspect we've learned anything from Melman. We'll sneak out through the basement. Let's go, she said. Picking up the lantern, she headed for the staircase. Dragonbait prodded Melman to his feet and out of the bedroom. He knows everything, the vintner insisted, his voice climbing an hysterical octave. Look, you've been cheating with your phony ledgers for over a year, Olive pointed out, falling from behind. If he knew everything, he'd have killed you sooner. If you just keep your mouth shut and keep moving, we'll get out of this. No sweat. They were just coming down the lower flight of stairs when someone began pounding on the front door with a mailed fist and shouting Melman's name. 
Dragonbait halted in the front hall and hissed at the door. Alias pushed Melman toward the secret passage and pulled on the Sariel's tunic. Remember how they burned Jamal's home? she whispered. We've got to keep moving. The paladin growled with displeasure, but he followed Melman down the hall and guided him to the passage behind the statue. As Alias followed behind them, the pounding on the door stopped, replaced by the sound of someone or several someones throwing their shoulders against it. Alias set down the lantern and turned about to usher Olive down the stairs, but the halfling was nowhere in sight. Olive, the swordswoman shouted. Outside, the night masks began smashing windows all around the house, including the transom window over the front door. Something thumped in the dark hall, and Alias could see a tiny flame glowing on the floor. It was the same explosive device the night masks had used in the Thalavar warehouse. The halfling appeared in the doorway of Melman's treasure room, loaded down with two sacks. Olive, get down! Alias throwing herself at the halfling, knocking her halfway into the treasure room. The explosion rocked the house, and the noise was deafening. The swordswoman was just rising unsteadily to her knees when a second, third, and fourth bomb went off. We've got to get out of here, Olive! Alias shouted. But the halfling did not reply. She was still breathing, but her leg was oozing blood where a piece of twisted metal had cut a gash through the flesh to the bone. There was no time to bind the wound. Alias slung the woman over her shoulder and stumbled to her feet. She cursed under the weight, realizing a good deal of it was gold coin. Out in the main hall, the wall hangings were ablaze and the house was filling with smoke. Alias took a breath of the still untainted air of the treasure room and dashed down the hall to the secret panel. Dragonbait stood at the top of the stairs, anxiously looking for the swordswoman. Pull the panel closed behind us, Alias ordered, as she half ran, half tumbled down the secret stair with her halfling load. Dragonbait tugged on the panel, but the statue of Mask had toppled into it, wedging it into place. Sheathing his sword, the Sariel moved into the corridor to shove the statue over. The front door burst open, and a large wooden keg rolled into the front hall. The paladin wasted no more time on the secret panel. He slipped into the stairwell and flew down the steps. Overhead, an even bigger explosion rocked not only the house, but its foundation as well. Brick, mortar, and wood began pouring down on the paladin's head. And the spiral staircase, which Dragonbait had just stepped off of, fell over into the basement. No one was going to notice that the secret panel was out of place, the paladin realized. In the dark, he could sense the heat coming off Alias, Olive, and Melman, and he hurried down the passage to where they waited in the dark. He pulled his sword and whispered the command for it to ignite. By the light of the flame, he could see Alias holding her hands over Olive's leg, trying to staunch the blood that oozed from a great wound. Melman stood pressed against a wall, breathing heavily, his eyes wide with terror. Thinking they would be safe enough in the basement for at least a few minutes, Dragonbait handed the flaming sword to Alias and bent over the halfling to heal her wound. Alias stood up and was instantly aware of how much warmer the air near the ceiling was than the air at the floor. The flames from Dragonbait's sword flickered toward the ruined secret staircase. Air coming in from the secret passage to the outside was feeding the fire above. Something overhead spattered to the floor and spread out with a gleam. Alias looked up in astonishment. One of the heavy floorboards beneath Melman's treasure room had cracked in the last explosion, and molten gold was now dripping into the basement. I've stopped the bleeding, but she's still unconscious, the paladin said. His mouth dropped when he caught sight of the shower of gold. Pity she'll miss this, he added. Alias thrust the flaming sword back in the paladin's hand. Get Melman out, she ordered. She scooped the halfling over her shoulders again and ran after the paladin and the nightmaster. At the secret door, she hesitated. She could leave it open, feeding the fire so that there would be nothing but ash left, making certain the night masks wouldn't expect to find Melman's bones. Concerned that smoke might drift out and reveal the passage's existence, though, she decided against it. With a quick tug, she pulled the door closed and hurried down the passage. It was quiet in the passage, but Alias hustled them through it, fearful that it might collapse. When they finally reached the dry wash, she set down the halfling and took a rest. Melman collapsed on the ground. 
Dragonbait stood over the Nightmaster, assuring himself that Melman didn't try to escape before Alias was through with him. "'What are we going to do with this one?' he asked the swordswoman. "'Well, I thought we might lock him up in one of the cells below his own house,' Alias said. She peered over the edge of the dry wash and watched the flames dancing along the roof of Melman's former abode. "'I don't think we should bring Lord Victor into this, considering the deal we've made with Melman.' You're going to have to impose on Mentassin again, the paladin noted. I know, Alias sighed. In the south of Westgate, a false dawn blossomed as the roof of Melman's house collapsed and the flame shot higher into the air. He's not going to be happy about my turning his house into a home for retired night masks. But he will oblige you, I think. Alias nodded, realizing uncomfortably that, while House Dostar was paying her to take out the night masks, other people were shouldering even greater shares of the burden to get the job done. Chapter 15 The Lair of the Faceless The fog that had drifted through Westgate's streets the night before now climbed as high as the city's wall and poured into the outlying countryside. The midday sun, covered with layer after layer of clouds, was powerless to burn off the mists. From the top floor of the tower Alias surveyed the few islands of solid matter high enough to poke above the gray shroud. The towers of the merchant noble's castles, the heaven aim spire of the temple to Ilmater, the west light, and the tower where she stood. She'd come to the tower to see Durgar, but he'd gone out to investigate the remains of last night's mysterious fire. Taking one last look at the covered city, Alias hurried back downstairs to meet Dragonbait and Olive, who had waited for her in the reception hall below. The halfling, who had regained consciousness soon after they'd left the secret tunnel, now paced up and down the hall, unable to hide her eagerness to hunt for the faceless's lair. She bore a long, jagged scar on her leg, but Dragonbait had healed her wound sufficiently so that it gave her no pain. Dragonbait stood very still beside the gate, but from the twitch in his tail, Alias could see that he too was anxious to be going. He had even grown less annoyed by Alias's promise to Melman that she would free him later, an attitude that would hold only as long as it appeared Melman had been truthful with them. Looks like we go alone, Alias said, after explaining Durgar's absence. The watch captain on duty says he doesn't have the authority to send a patrol out to investigate unless the peace is being disturbed. The three adventurers donned their heavy cloaks, and Olive lit the lantern she carried before they went outside. Westgate was like a ghost city, for the fog shrouded commerce as well. There were no booths or carts set up in the market. Very few shops appeared open, and those that were had no customers. Even those people hardy enough to venture the streets at night remained indoors in the fog. Alias wondered if even the night masks avoided working in the fog. The sound of their footsteps was muffled by the water in the air, so that the adventurers appeared to be three wraiths gliding along the streets. Dragonbait squinted, concentrating on using his Shen sight so that they wouldn't be surprised by anything coming out of the fog. They strode due east on Silver Peace Way to the bridge that crossed the River Thun. Five stone arches supported the river bridge and the road across it was wide enough for two large wagons and several extra pedestrians to use at once. The bridge was not only a masterful feat of engineering, but a dumping ground for stone carvings looted from King Verovan's castle when he had died. Brooding gargoyles held out stone braziers flickering with oil lamps, which pushed ineffectually at the foggy darkness. Curling sea serpents made up the bridge's railings. The statues of ancient historical figures line the center, dividing it into two distinct lanes. At high tide, the river below would slam into the rising waters of the sea, creating a surging wave that ran the width of the river just downstream from the bridge. Now, at low tide, the two bodies of water collided near the mouth of the bay, no more than a mere rill on the water's surface. The river level also dropped down a few feet, uncovering a wide expanse of muddy sandbank beneath the bridge. The adventurers veered from the bridge and made their way down to the sandbank. This must be a good place to dig for clams, Alias noted. Olive shook her head. According to the halflings in the Thalavar household, there is some sea serpent called the Quelzarn that lurks in these waters. People who come down here tend to disappear. 
Disappearances no doubt arranged by the faceless to conceal his lair, Alias guessed. She pulled Melman's key from her pocket and, holding the key loop up to her eye, scanned the stone embankment. She pointed to a featureless spot a little ways downstream at the foot of the embankment. There, she said, handing the key to the halfling. Olive peered through the key loop. It was like looking through a soap bubble. Rainbows of color swirled before her eye. But when she looked toward the spot where Alias pointed, a hot white light shone before her eye. She offered the key to Dragonbait, but the Sariel declined to use the magic item, disdainful of handling any night mask magic unless absolutely necessary. Out of habit, Olive ran her finger down the teeth of the key, registering its shape before returning it to the swordswoman. Once more, Alias held the key up to her eye. She strode purposefully toward the stone embankment. Olive could detect only slight irregular frost cracks in the rock. Alias reached out with her hand and touched a spot on the rock. There's some sort of keyhole here, she said. Then she guided the key to the hand she held on the wall like a woman trying to unlock a door in the dark. The key slid smoothly into the rock. Alias twisted it, and from behind the ground came the sound of a huge bolt being thrown. The erratic pattern of cracks joined in the shape of a rough-hewn door some three feet across by five feet high. The door popped a few inches out of the wall. Dragonbait grasped its edge and muscled it open. Behind the entrance lay a tunnel several feet wider and higher than the door. Alias looked around. An outcropping of rock in the muddy bank blocked any view from the bridge. The river bank widened considerably just below the bridge, so no one standing on the opposite shore at night would be able to see more than the light of their lantern. It was a location well hidden in plain sight. Olive thrust her lantern into the inky black tunnel. Brickwork lined the walls, floors, and arched ceiling as far back as they could see. All three adventurers drew their blades and slipped through the door. Dragonbait growled the command for his blade to ignite. There was a ring attached to the back of the door. Alias gave it a tug pulling the door nearly closed so that it did not attract visitors behind them, but leaving enough of a gap that they could flee the tunnels easily should the need arise. Then the trio plunged into the darkness. Thirty feet down, the passage emptied into a larger tunnel with an uneven floor and a canted ceiling cut directly into bedrock. This tunnel appeared to be far older. Along its length were several side passages, all of which were bricked up. The older tunnel went on for some distance straight ahead. Finally, the passage widened slightly. On one side were ten empty sconces, and on the other, ten empty pegs. At last, we found the cloakroom of the faceless, Olive joked. Another ten feet ahead, the passage spilled out into a large vault cut out of the solid stone. The walls were bare, and the furnishing was sparse but impressive. A massive obsidian table, streaked with veins of gold, polished to a liquid-like luster. Ten large wooden chairs, five to a side, stood about the table, and at the head, on a raised dais, stood a throne of the same black and gold material as the table. On the table sat a brass brazier, unlit but stoked with fresh charcoal. Beside the brazier lay a black cloth covering a small object. Alias lifted the black cloth. Beneath it was a white porcelain mask, a domino mask painted about the eyes and a glyph on the forehead. The mark for Gateside, Alice noted, Melman's district. Olive proceeded around the room, tapping the walls and looking for secret access ways. Is the Faceless simply letting the others know of Melman's death or informing them that he himself was responsible? The paladin mused. Alias shrugged and laid the black cloth back over the mask. Yes, Olive whispered from the wall behind the obsidian throne. She knocked again, and they all heard the distinct hollow sound. Olive could just make out with her fingertips the hair-thin crack that betrayed the edges of a secret passageway. After several minutes of searching, though, she was still at a loss for a handhold, button, or switch to open it. Alias pushed on the edges of the door in case it pivoted, but without result. Try Melman's key, the halfling suggested. 
Alias peered at the closed passage through the handle of the iron key. Nothing, she reported. Guess it was too much to hope that Melman would have access to the Faceless's inner sanctum, the halfling muttered. We may need a mage for this, Alias said with a sigh, wondering just how many times she was going to have to go to Mintassin for help. Boogers, Olive cursed. There was a sharp crack, and the entire wall panel swung slightly outward and upward, revealing another stone passage. Alias looked at the halfling, stunned. I guess the secret word, Olive cried out excitedly. From behind them came the clicking sound of the Sariel's laughter. Dragonbait was standing behind the obsidian throne with a clawed finger resting on a panel in the back of the throne. As they watched, the Sariel pushed the panel, and the door swung closed. I would have thought of that next, Olive said with a sniff. Dragonbait reopened the door. Just inside was another empty sconce. Most notable about this passage, though, was the damp, pungent smell. Not of the sea, but of sewerage. Wrinkling their noses, the adventurers proceeded through this new tunnel, Olive in the lead, with Alice and Dragonbait just behind her. Despite the lantern she carried, Olive did not see the chasm that abruptly crossed the passage until she was right on top of it. Fortunately, the stench and the sound of running water had warned her to slow down, and she was able to back away from the edge before she stepped into the yawning void. Alias and Dragonbait halted beside her, and they all peered downward. Across their path lay a circular sewage tunnel lined with brick. They stood near the top of the tunnel. On the other side, nearly twenty feet away, the passageway to the Faceless's lair continued on. Ten feet below them, the sewage of Westgate churned and surged past. You'd think the Faceless would be concerned that a sewer inspector might stumble upon this place, Olive quipped. Cities the size of Westgate have enough underground sewers, pipes, and cisterns to confuse a dwarf. They probably built this tunnel before King Verovin's time and promptly forgot it, Alias retorted. How are we going to cross it? the halfling asked. Alias shrugged. The Faceless must have some way across, she said. Dragonbait picked up a handful of pebbles from the floor and tossed them into the chasm. They skittered horizontally in midair, some finally tumbling into the dark water below but others remained suspended, resting on an invisible surface. Aren't you clever, Alias said, smiling at the Sariel. The paladin shrugged. He could detect the bridge from the way it masked the heat flowing up from the sewage below. Alias stumbled out into the void. Assured that the bridge was sturdy beneath her feet, she continued across, using her sword as a cane to tap out the edges of the bridge. It was only two feet wide, but flat and smooth. Nonetheless, when she reached the opening in the sewer wall at the opposite end and stepped off the bridge, she breathed a sigh of relief. She turned and waved for the others to follow. Olive began crossing next, using her own sword as a guide. The halfling moved more quickly than the swordswoman had, but when she was halfway across the bridge, she froze. Alias furrowed her brow in puzzlement. Olive had never been afraid of heights, Yet now she stood motionless, looking down into the water. Come on, Olive, the swordswoman whispered urgently. I can't, Olive retorted through clenched teeth. I want to move, but I can't. Feels like magic. Maybe some kind of trap. Alias had just set one foot back on the bridge when something erupted from the water below. By the light of Olive's lantern, the swordswoman could make out a great serpentine beast, its body stretching out far longer than the lantern light could make out. Its back was covered in a diamond pattern of green and brown scales, and a green fin ran the full length of its eel-like body. It reared its head, revealing a yellow belly, and filthy water dripped from the slimy moss coating its scales. Thrusting upward toward Olive, it roared with a mouth large enough to swallow the halfling in a single gulp. Needle teeth glistened by the light of the halfling's lantern. In the beast's eyes, Alias imagined she could detect intelligence and cunning. It's the Quelzarn, Alias shouted. Olive, you have to move. Olive, unable to comply, looked into the maw, wondering if she could cut her way out from the inside. She realized with a sickening dread that her chances of doing so were not good, even if the magic that now held her disappeared once she was swallowed. 
Just as the sea serpent's head arched over Olive, the Sariel scooped the halfling up in his arms and dashed across the bridge to the other side. The Quelzarn snapped its jaws on empty air, squealed with annoyance, and slid back into the water. Dragonbait set Olive down gently. The halfling was breathing so heavily that Alias was afraid she might pass out before she regained control. Why do these things always happen to me? the halfling moaned. Why didn't it use magic to hold you in place? Maybe it just wanted a light snack, Alias teased. It probably noticed your lantern. I went across without one. Or you're more resistant to its magic. The enchantment holding Olive dissolved suddenly, and she started like a sleeper in a dream. Boy, I really hate magic sometimes. Now I'm all pins and needles, she complained, rubbing her limbs. They finally got Olive back on her feet again and continued onward. The passageway on this side of the sewer sloped upward, ending in a short staircase. Alias wondered if they might be climbing into the basement of a building by the river, but she realized they must be somewhere beneath a hill when they reached the top of the stair and they stood in one more underground cavern carved out of solid bedrock. Magical lanterns bathed the cavern in a bright yellow glow, leaving them no doubt that they had discovered what they'd been seeking. Jackpot! Olive whispered in awe. Alias nodded in agreement. The faceless's treasury made Melman's hoard look like the collection plate at a dead god's church. Great sea chests, closed and locked, were stacked against one wall. A multitude of weapons from swords and pole arms to wands and staves hung from another. Dozens of open amphoras stood in an alcove, stuffed to overflowing in the southern fashion with jewelry and gems. On a workbench in the center of the room stood a rack like a tree, with twelve long pegs branching out from its central pole, each with a different glyph painted over the domino mask markings about the eye slits. A twelfth branch was empty, no doubt the one that had once held Melman's mask. A large mirror was mounted on the wall to the right of the workbench. To the other side stood two rows of statues. Behind the workbench, a fountain pool gushed water in a burbling rhythm. I always say there's nothing like the sound of a fountain for relaxing at the end of a hard day's extortion and murder, the halfling joked. Alias held up a hand to silence the halfling. She thought she saw movement near the statues. She motioned for Dragonbait and Olive to take up positions on either side of the workbench as she moved around it. The statues were iron, covered with a thin film of oil to ward off rust. They were about twice Alias's height, molded in a humanoid form but with dragon heads. Alias was sure they were some sort of golem, automatons capable of serving as deadly guards. Those constructed of iron often breathe poisonous gas, and Alias found herself holding her breath as she approached them. She reached out and touched the nearest statue. It was cool and remained immobile. If the statues were iron golems, they did not appear to be activated. They were set in a military formation two rows deep. It was in the back line where she thought she saw a movement. The warrior woman slid between the two ranks, moving as silently as a cat. She saw a flash of light on metal behind the second rank. Swinging around the line, Alias raised her sword, prepared to skewer whatever skulk back there. Fortunately, her mind analyzed what she saw before her instincts took over. She recognized the man in fine silk vestments who stood before her, gripping with white knuckles a sword held out in an awkward defensive position. Victor! Alias gasped. Victor Dostar lowered his sword and held his other hand over his heart as if to keep it from leaping out of his chest. His eyes were wide with both fear and astonishment. Alias, he exclaimed, breathing a sigh of relief. Am I glad to see you? Come on out, Alias ordered, holding her sword level, still ready to strike. Magical creatures sometimes use the face of a friend as a ploy to get adventurers to lower their guard. Victor stumbled forward sheepishly, nodding at the Sariel and the halfling as they approached him warily. Dragonbait, Mistress Ruskettle, how do you do? I was afraid you were the faceless. Alias looked at the paladin for some confirmation of Victor's identity. Dragonbait concentrated his Shen sight on the man before him. 
there was nothing but the sky blue of grace in his soul. If he was not Victor Dostar, he was his twin in all respects. The Sariel nodded. Alias exhaled and sheathed her sword. Then she leaned in toward Victor and snapped angrily, What are you doing down here? Her voice rang through the chamber like a bell clapper. Victor sighed. Being a damn fool, he answered. I thought I could help you find the faceless's lair. I followed up a few clues and found this place. I was investigating it when I heard a voice down the hall. I hid because I thought it might be the faceless. How did you get past the Quelzarn? Olive asked suspiciously. Victor blinked twice. There was a Quelzarn? I mean, there really is one? he asked. Perhaps it didn't attack because it failed to hold him magically, just as it let me across, Alias suggested. Olive was not mollified. So how did you get in? she demanded of the merchant noble. This, Victor said, pulling out from his vest pocket a key on a pink ribbon. He handed the key to Olive. It appeared identical to the one Alias had from Melman. There is a secret door on the banks of the Thun. You look through that hole in the grip to see it, then the key opens the door. How did you find the secret passage beyond the meeting room? Olive demanded, running her fingers along the teeth of the key before handing it back. The latch behind the throne. King Verovan had something like that over a hundred years ago. Now it's a fairly standard release for the merchant houses to use in their treasuries. Where did you get the key? Olive demanded. Victor looked down at his hands as if examining them for dirt. I'm afraid I can't tell you that, he said coolly. Can't or won't, Olive pressed. Olive, Alias said in a cautioning tone. Victor met Olive's intense gaze. Won't, he retorted. Certainly not to an employee of a rival house. He looked at Alias. I will explain all to you later, he said, when we are alone. Alias accepted the noble's terms with a nod, but she had to ask, Lord Victor, if you had some clues, why didn't you contact me? Victor sheathed his sword. There was some indication that another noble house was involved, so I thought I had better check it out first, to spare you another incident like yesterday's with the Erdos, the young man explained. You shouldn't have come down here alone. You could have been killed, the swordswoman exclaimed. I realize you think of me only as a merchant, but I am capable with a sword, and I can take care of myself, Victor replied. There was a chill in the nobleman's tone that stung Alias like an icy rain. I've offended his pride, she realized, and although she couldn't help think of the awkward way he'd held his sword up only a moment ago, she knew she couldn't bring herself to challenge him. Victor, this isn't about your being able to take care of yourself, she began carefully. This is about your life being too important to risk on such a reckless excursion. Your father, the Cromark, needs you. Westgate needs you. The swordswoman held his eyes with her own and, in a whisper, added, I need you. How absolutely precious! A harsh whisper echoed through the cavern. I'd nearly forgotten how amusing Mamma Love is. Alias and Dragonbait held their swords up at the alert and wheeled back to back in a long practice maneuver. Without discussion, they kept Lord Victor between them. Olive ducked quickly into the shadow of the iron statues. The pool at the far end of the room began to bubble and hiss, and from it rose a great dragon skull. Hello, children. The word seemed to come from the dragon's skull. Its tone was mock cheerfulness. It's good to see you again, even in my reduced circumstances. It took only moments for all three adventurers to place the voice, but it was Olive who replied first. Misty, the halfling chirped sheathing her sword and stepping out from the shadows. Long time! So nice to be remembered, the dragon skull said, as the water finished dripping from its sides. I have not forgotten you either, Mistress Ruskettle, or you, Champion, or you, Alias, you red-headed witch. Alias moved cautiously toward the skull. Mistinar Paradnocles, you're an ally of the Faceless, aren't you? No, witch, I'm merely a pawn. The dragon skull answered, just as is everyone in this city, yourselves included. Victor stepped forward. I am no man's pawn, dead thing, the young lord declared. Miss Laughter rang all about them. You are one of the biggest pawns of all, Dostar pup. 
pawn to your father, pawn to your ambitions, pawn to your desires. As for you, alias of the inner sea, you are a pawn of the facelesses. He has plans for you. He will make himself your master. An evil sorceress, a lich, a fiend from Tartarus, a mad god, and an assassin's guild all tried to master me. All are now dead, alias retorted. True, Mist replied. If your luck is still as it was, you may defeat the Faceless. I will aid you in exchange for a boon. What boon, Worm? the swordswoman demanded. Swear that you will free me from this bondage of my spirit, so that I may rest in peace, and I will tell you three of the Faceless's secrets. I so swear, Alias agreed. First, the device that shields the Faceless and the Night Masters from detection. Tell me all you know of it. It sits there on that table, Mist answered, turning so that one eye socket seemed to look at the tree rack hung with the white porcelain masks. It was crafted by the priests of the Temple of Lyra, the deceased goddess of illusions, and stolen by the priests of Mask, god of thieves. A doppelganger imitating the Shadow Lord of Mask Temple stole it and used it to build the Night Mask Guild. The mask must hang there on that rack for a day to recharge their magical powers. Anyone wearing one of the masks for one hour is protected from all magical detection and divination for four days. The Faceless sets them out for the Night Masters to wear just before the meeting they attend every other night, so there is no chance of their being discovered. Even the Faceless dons one beneath the coin mask he wears to conceal his features from his own servants, including myself. So you don't know who old Faceless is. Too bad, Olive sighed. She didn't say that, Olive, Alias replied. She said the Faceless concealed his features from her. But an old worm like you can see with more than her eyes. Can't you, Mr. Narparadnocles? So true, the dragon said. Is that the second secret you wish me to reveal? Alias hesitated, sensing a trick on the dragon's part. Mist had no love for her. Vengeance might still override her desire for a peaceful death. We don't need her to answer that, Victor declared. All we need to do is destroy these masks. The young lord yanked a mask from the tree rack. Victor, no, Alice shouted. It could be a trap. Oh, yes, Miss said. Did I fail to mention the masks must be removed from the rack in a particular order? With a shocked look, Victor set the mask back on the tree rack but it was too late. The floor began to shake as all around the cavern, hidden gears and levers of massive proportions began to turn and move. A panel in the workbench slid open, and the tree rack containing the masks dropped down into it. An iron gate dropped down over the alcove where the gem-laden amphoras were kept. Larger grates dropped over the walls with the sea chests and weaponry. Miss laughed. Oh dear, it does not look like we shall be able to complete our little transaction after all. Ah, well, I have no regrets, knowing this will be your end. Die well, Alias of the Inner Sea. And fond goodbyes to you, Mistress Ruskettle, Champion Lord Victor. It was a pleasure dealing with you. The dragon skull sank back into the pool. The level of water in the pool began to rise until it poured over the edge, splashing to the floor. This doesn't sound good, Olive whispered. The sound of the gears grinding stopped, and there was a moment of relative silence. Then they all heard it, the sound of rushing water as loud as the ocean itself. Vast amounts of water began pouring down on the adventurers from the ceiling, extinguishing Olive's lantern. The force of the flow was enough to knock Olive off her feet. Dragonbait grabbed the halfling by her cloak and helped her stand upright. We've got to get across the bridge, Alias shouted. She sheathed her sword and snagged Victor's arm, pulling him toward the stairs to the bridge. Dragonbait splashed behind her with the halfling in tow. The stairs had become a rushing cascade of water, and Dragonbait's flaming sword was their only light now. The swordswoman was forced to press her hands against both sides of the narrow corridor in order to keep herself upright. She could feel Victor, Dragonbait, and Olive bumping into her from behind. As Alias touched down on the last step, she felt it shift beneath her feet. 
With a sickening dread, the swordswoman tried planting her feet more firmly on the slick stone, but to no avail. A wave of water crashed down from the ceiling above the stair, knocking all the adventurers off their feet and carrying them at a breakneck speed down the corridor toward the bridge and the sewer. First, Alias could hear the water plunging down into the sewer. Then there was a sense of weightlessness as the current shot her out across the chasm of the sewer. Just as she took a great gulp of air, she had a glimpse of light, Dragonbait's flaming sword. Finally, there came the flesh-bruising impact of her body against the fetid sewer water below. Alias's lungs were screaming for air before she managed to break the surface and take a gulp of the foul air. The water was flowing faster, fed by the stream from the Faceless's water trap, carrying her with it. Dragon bait! Alias screamed. Victor! Olive! She spotted the paladin first, still clutching his flaming sword. Olive bobbed alongside him. Where's Victor? she shouted. Here! the nobleman called from just behind her. Alias strained to face the young lord's direction, relieved to see that he seemed to know how to stay afloat. Her chain mail shirt made treading water tiring enough. She didn't think she could manage helping a fully grown man as well. Try to stay close to the near wall, the swordswoman shouted to the others. There have to be some side passages we can... Alias gasped. Something large had pushed against her, and she knew what it had to be. The Quelzarn's head broke the water just beside Dragonbait, attracted perhaps by the light from the paladin's sword. The sea serpent's teeth gleamed in the flaming light. Alias screamed the paladin's name in his own tongue. The Quelzarn dived down, taking the Sariel with it. The sewer darkened, but a dim light shone beneath the water's surface. The female warrior took a deep breath and plunged beneath the surface, heading for the light. As long as it shone, she knew Dragonbait had not yet been swallowed. The foul water stung her eyes, and visibility below the surface wasn't more than a few feet, but that was enough to detect a great shadow looming before her. Alias grabbed the monster's fin and hung on with all her might as it wriggled and writhed beneath her. With her arms aching from the strain, the swordswoman pulled herself along the length of the fin, making for the Quelzarn's head. Just when the fire in her lungs grew too intense to bear, the creature broke the surface of the water again, and Alias was able to gasp for air. A dark stain seemed to be flowing from the light beneath the surface. Alias was sure it was blood, but whether the sarials or the sea serpents, she could not tell. The creature looped backward on itself, and Alias had a clear glimpse of dragon bait. The Sariel had one clawed foot jammed against the beast's lower gum and one hand thrust between two needle-like teeth of the upper jaw so that the monster could not snap its jaw shut and swallow its prey. Blood poured from the paladin's foot and hand as well as from a gash in his thigh. With his flaming sword, the paladin was lacerating the monster's upper palate. Alias pulled her dagger from her boot and launched herself at the Quelzarn's head. She managed to catch the fin beside its gill. She could still not reach the beast's eyes, so she tore a V-shaped gash into the flesh behind the gill. Then she began pulling back on the flesh, stripping it away like whale blubber. The beast breached from the water with a shriek and slammed itself and the swordswoman against the sewer wall, dislodging the sariel in its mouth and the human woman at its gill. Alias wasn't sure what happened in the moment she was stunned, but when she next opened her eyes, Dragonbait, his hands clenched in her hair, was holding her head out of the water. The Sariel was a powerful swimmer, and he was towing the swordswoman toward a side sewer, where Olive and Victor stood shouting. The side sewer was eight feet in diameter. The water level in it was only two feet high, so the adventurers could work their way against the current. The halfling and the nobleman helped pull the warriors inside. They moved down the tunnel about ten feet, but had to stop to catch their breath and tend to their wounds. Dragonbait, after first assuring himself that Alias had suffered no life-threatening injury, handed his weapon to the swordswoman and turned his attention to the wounds the Quelzarn had given him. As the scent of the paladin's prayer filled the air, a great roar blasted down the tunnel. The Quelzarn thrust its head a few feet into the side passage. Victor, who stood directly in its path, fumbled in the tangles of his cloak, trying, Olive thought, to reach his sword in its scabbard. 
The halfling was sure the young lord was about to become the last of the Dostar line when the Quelzarn slid back out of the tunnel and disappeared. Victor gulped and backed farther from the tunnel exit. That was too close for comfort, the nobleman said. If the tide were in and the water higher, it would have come in after us for sure, he said. Olive nodded, her eyes wide with amazement at the young man's close call. She followed him down the corridor, wondering with suspicion what he seemed to be holding in his hand, which remained buried in his cloak pocket. I believe we should be able to follow this sewer to an opening near a street, the nobleman said. Yes, Alias added, and if we're lucky, the fog will still be thick and no one will notice us. They'll smell us before they see us, Olive predicted. Chapter 16 Suspicions The sewer passage surfaced in a storm drain. After taking a moment to get his bearings, Victor pointed them in the direction of an outdoor ale garden called the Rosebud. There the merchant noble sent a runner for his carriage and tipped the proprietor generously for the use of his well in the back. Pouring buckets of fresh water over each other, the four managed to scrape all of the sewer muck and most of the smell off their skin and clothes. Olive, gathering up her sopping cloak, excused herself, declaring she had a previous engagement. Alias didn't argue. She was anxious to grill Victor about the source of his key, and she knew the merchant lord would say nothing in Olive's presence. Shortly after the halfling had gone, a young serving boy brought them three mugs of mulled wine. Alias allowed herself a few minutes to enjoy the sensation of warmth creeping back into her bones. Then she forced herself to return to the business at hand. Victor, you have to tell me where you found the key, Alias insisted. Victor stared hard into his mulled wine as if an answer might appear in the mug. I began thinking about what you said last night, that maybe father was paying the night masks on the side but was too proud to admit it. I started searching through his desk in secret. I couldn't find anything about payoffs, but I found this key. It was in an envelope with instructions on how to use it. And the instructions, Alias asked, were they written in your father's hand? Yes, Victor admitted. I thought I should check it out by myself in case it wasn't anything important. Or in case it was, Alias commented. It doesn't prove anything, Victor insisted. There could be a perfectly good reason why he had the key. You have a key too, Alias nodded. How did you get it, the noble asked. I took it from Melman shortly before the night masks blew up his home with him in it, the swordswoman explained. Dragonbait looked at Alias with surprise. She was deliberately misleading the noble to believe that Melman was dead. Victor... Did you tell your father I was checking up on Melman? When I got home last night, we had this stupid argument. He said I was distracting you from your duties. I told him what you told me at the party about Melman. The young man's eyes widened in surprise. You don't think... He couldn't. It's just a coincidence. My father is not involved with the Nightmasters. Now it was Alias's turn to look down into her mulled wine for a reply. You said yourself last night that you didn't think Father was the Faceless. That he had no reason to be involved with them. He hired you to get rid of them, Victor argued. Wait, he could have gotten the key from Kimball after Kimball tried to assassinate him. Then why didn't he turn the key over to Durgar? Alias asked. Unable to come up with a ready excuse, Victor shifted tactics. What would you do if you found the key in the possession of someone you loved? If it were, say, in Dragonbait's purse. Alias exchanged a look with the paladin. I would ask him about it, the swordswoman replied. You wouldn't just take it to Durgar first, would you? Victor retorted. Alias sighed. Victor, Dragonbait is like a brother to me. I've known him all my life. I've known my father all my life, too, the merchant noble countered. Very well, Alias said. I'll ask your father about the key before I mention it to Durgar. I will give him a chance to explain. No, Victor exclaimed. That is, I'm asking you to give me a chance to ask him. He's my father and, well, I think I should be the one to ask. Alias couldn't imagine Victor getting a straight answer from his verbally abusive father. And if Lord Dostar should actually be involved with the night masks, there was a chance Victor could be in danger. I know what you're thinking, Victor said. But you're wrong. My father would never hurt me. 
He has a good reason for having this key. You'll see. Let me handle this. Alias nodded reluctantly. All right, she said. I have to report to Durgar about the lair today, so he can send the watch in at the next low tide. I will tell him you accompanied us there. I will not mention you had a key just yet. But Victor, I can't keep that from him for long. I must have some explanation from your father by tomorrow. Tomorrow then, the young merchant agreed. I have all sorts of tasks to finish for the ball. We can discuss it then. Ball? Alias asked. Yes. Oh, I almost forgot, Victor replied with a sheepish grin. I'm afraid your invitation is just a little damp. He reached into his cloak pocket and drew out a soggy sheet of parchment folded in thirds. The sealing wax was marked with the crow mark's insignia. Victor held it out to her. Alias held up a hand as if to ward the invitation away like an evil spirit. Victor, I'm supposed to be uncovering the identity of the Nightmasters and the Faceless. I can't be rushing off to every party in Westgate. This isn't just a party. This is the Regatta Masquerade Ball, Victor argued. It's the major social event of the season. In King Verovin's day, it was called the Naval Ball, but since the King's demise, we celebrate it as a commemoration of his folly. Everyone will be there. With a sigh, the swordswoman took the folded document from the merchant and turned it over. It was addressed to her and Dragonbait. Besides, we have a reason to celebrate. You found the Faceless's lair. I know I ruined our chances trying to capture him by setting off that water trap, but once you get Durgar's men down there at the next low tide to clear out his treasury and that mask thing that protects him and his lieutenants, well, it will really only be a matter of sweeping up, won't it? Please say you'll come. Victor reached out and took her hand. You'll need to come anyway to hear what my father has to say about the key. Besides, I've really been looking forward to dancing with you. I'll come to hear your father explain the key to me and Durgar, Alias said. She tucked the invitation into the vest beneath her chain mail. Maybe I'll dance, she added, if I think then that I have something to celebrate. The young serving boy came out to announce that Lord Victor's carriage was waiting at the front gate. Alias declined the merchant noble's offer for a lift back to Blaze House. Between feeling shy in front of both the carriage driver and Dragon Bade and feeling less than attractive with her hair plastered against her head and the scent of sewage lingering about her, Alias was prepared to see Victor off with no more than a friendly squeeze of his hand. The young merchant apparently did not feel similarly inhibited. He pulled the swordswoman close and stole a quick kiss from her before he climbed up beside his carriage driver. Until tomorrow, he said. Alias nodded. As the nobleman's carriage pulled away, Alias turned and looked toward the river Thun. I wonder how quickly the tide comes in. Dragonbait did not reply. He was staring at the back of Victor's carriage, which seemed to have picked up a small, wet, halfling-sized bundle on the rear boot. Maybe, Alias said, if we can get Durgar to hurry, we'll be able to clean out this lair before nightfall. One of the few joys of being half the size of the dominant race of Farron, Olive reflected as she hung on to the low-slung storage area at the rear of Victor's carriage, is that unless someone is on the lookout for you, it's easy to hide just beside them. Even if the day were not ridden with fog, it was unlikely that she would be detected. She looked just like an old horse blanket someone had thrown in the back, and she was too light a stowaway for the horses to seem burdened. She kept her ears pricked during the ride throughout the city, out the west gate, and through the countryside to Castle Dostar. But Victor and his driver did not even attempt a conversation with one another. The halfling was not surprised. According to her mates at the Thalavar household, the Dostars were very strong believers in the separation of stations. Things might have been dicier for the halfling had their destination been a real castle with a curtain wall and guards at the portcullis. But Castle Dostar was really just a very large manor house. Victor hopped down from the carriage, and as the driver pulled away, Olive rolled out of the boot and slipped into the shadow of a yew tree by the drive. There were no guards at the front door, but as Victor let himself in, he called for someone named Kane, and a butler appeared to take the merchant lord's sewer-drenched cloak. 
Olive sneaked into the front hall as the butler was pulling off Victor's muck-encrusted boots. She slipped into the shadow beneath a table against the wall. As the servant handed nobleman a pair of comfortable house slippers, Olive caught the words, Your father, the library, soon as you arrive. The halfling listened for the sound of Victor's retreating steps. And, as soon as the butler disappeared with Victor's wet things, she slipped down the hallway after the merchant lord. Fortunately, Castle Dostar was an easy place to sneak around in. Apparently, Lord Dostar did not believe in wasting money on candles to light the halls. The servants all carried their own lights, so Olive could see as well as hear them coming and take cover in a shadow as they passed. There were plenty of shadows cast by the usual bric-a-brac of the wealthy. Outdated armor, stuffed animal trophies, stone statuary, ancient urns on pedestals. Olive pressed her ear against several doors without hearing Victor's or Lure's voice. Then, from a room just ahead, she heard the Cromark shouting. Victor had left the door open, so Olive peered inside. Lure Dostar sat at a desk. His son stood before him, receiving a paternal dressing down. In the sewers, Gon's gears, what were you thinking? You could have been killed. You are a dose star, not some cheap hero from the street plays. You hire people to take risks for you. Then you stay away from those people. That way, when they make mistakes, you don't suffer directly. When they make mistakes, Olive wondered, what mistakes? Anyone could have set off that trap, Victor replied. You can't blame Alias because a halfling couldn't resist handling things. He's blaming me for picking up that mask, Olive thought with a huff. What a little rat. Just inside the open door was a large stuffed displacer beast mounted rampant, its forepaws and tentacles batting the air. Lord Lure or one of his ancestors was quite the accomplished hunter. Olive slipped into the library, positioning herself behind the trophy beast. I hired this woman to take care of the night masks, not drag you on dangerous jaunts into the underworld. It's bad enough you've been neglecting your duties. I have not been neglecting my duties. There isn't a single obligation to you, the family business, or a Westgate that I have not fulfilled. Lord Dostar drummed his fingers on his desktop. First, you champion her acting friends in front of the rabble, he accused his son. Then, you spend last night's cruise almost exclusively in her company, time you might have spent with your peers, men and women of your own rank. Now I find you've been diving into sewers with her. That is not the life of a Dostar. No, the life of a Dostar is all cold figures and hard cash. There's no room in it for honor or courage, Victor taunted, stepping forward and wringing his shirt sleeve out on the accounting book spread out before his father, leaving puddles in the blue ink. Lord Lure turned several shades of red, though Olive couldn't be sure whether he was more angered by his son's words or his reckless disregard for bookkeeping. For a moment it seemed as if Victor, faced with his father's apoplectic wrath, showed a moment of fear, a recognition that he had gone too far, for he backed away suddenly from his father. In the next moment, however, the young man's back stiffened and he stood his ground. Several moments of icy silence followed. Then Victor said, I've issued Alias and her companion an invitation to the masquerade ball. And you expect the other noble families to accept her because you keep dragging her into their presence? Lure said with a laugh. I don't care about the other families. I expect you to honor her for the service she's done us. She's discovered the Faceless's lair for you. Within a few days, she may have his identity. That's what I've paid her for. I'm not required to reward her success with invitations to socialize with her betters, Lure growled. Since you have so injudiciously invited her, I suppose there is nothing I can do. Welcome her to the ball, introduce her as your guest, dance with her. I will not be there. I will not watch my son cavorting with a common adventuress or seem to give my approval with my presence. Father, you cannot mean that. You are blowing this all out of proportion. I haven't forgotten my rank or hers. I am simply extending a courtesy to a very useful employee. I assure you, I have no intentions of forming an alliance beneath my station. Funny, you forgot to mention that to Alias, Olive thought. Your lack of propriety is not my concern, Lura replied to his son. It is the appearance of impropriety I cannot tolerate. 
If that girl is there, I will not attend the ball. Someone rapped at the doorframe and Lore barked, Enter! Kimball stepped into the room. Excuse me, Lord Lure, the assassin-turned-servant begged. Lord Orgule has sent his son with a message. He awaits your reply in the hall. Kimball proffered a scrap of parchment. Lure read the message and cursed softly. Orgule could foul up a one-horse parade, he muttered, pushing himself out of his chair. I'll speak with the boy myself, he said, as he stalked over to the door. Just before he stepped out of the room, he whirled about to address Victor once more. Get into some dry things, he ordered, before you ruin the carpets. When the crow mark had gone, Kimball closed the door softly behind him. Victor flopped into his father's chair and propped his feet up on the desk. He is a fool, you know, the young lord said. So you have informed me, Kimball replied without a trace of irony or humor. He refuses to see how useful Alias is, Victor steamed. Useful, Olive thought angrily. Is that all you have to say about a girl who's welcomed you with her arms and lips and given you a token of her regard? You Westgate nobles are so romantic. The rabble is rather taken with her, thanks to Jamal, Kimball noted. But, aside from House Thalavar, the noble families are cool. Short-sighted fools, Victor muttered. Olive could see his jaw clenched in irritation. It's hardly surprising, Kimball pointed out. Every one of them has some involvement with the night masks, which they wish to remain hidden. They do not perceive this alias as an ally. You do not want to offend them. After all, it is still the noble families who choose the crow mark. Ha! Victor laughed. And there was a bully-like tone to his amusement. Imagine how they'll all look when they discover that their very own crow mark is the leader of the night masks. Olive almost gasped with surprise. It should leave them in a decided quandary, sir, Kimball replied as calmly as if he and the merchant lord were discussing the price increase of Selgant marble. Victor laughed the same unpleasant laugh again. They'll be no better off than the rabble they consider their inferiors. The only way they'll manage to hold on to their power is by choosing a popular candidate, the one wearing the token of alias of the inner sea the woman who freed them from the yoke of the night masks. Victor took a small case from his tunic, opened it, and displayed the braid of hair that Alias had cut off and given him. It was now fastened to a pin. If the nobles are frightened enough by the faceless's plot to destroy them all, they may even be convinced that it is time to restore a monarchy, return Westgate to the status of a kingdom. Is it certain, then, that the Kromark will be revealed as the faceless? Kimball asked. Alias and her companion stumbled upon me investigating the faceless's lair. I got in with this key, Victor said, holding up the key he'd shown all of earlier. Unfortunately, like a fool, I touched off a water trap and we were all washed out to the sewer, where we barely escaped the Quelzarn. I had to admit to Alias that I found the key in my father's desk. She has given me time to ask him to explain the key. I do not think he will do so. No, Kimball agreed. Alice should be with Durgar now, planning to check out this lair at the next low tide. In the meantime, you and I both have lots to do, the noble said, rising to his feet. Come along. Victor strode to the door. He passed so close to the mounted displacer beast Olive hid behind that the halfling could feel the breeze of his passing. Olive held her breath as the nobleman exited the room. Kimball paused for a moment by the doorway, and the former assassin's eyes narrowed much the same way, Olive thought, as Dragonbaits did when the paladin was using his Shen sight. Kimball stared directly at the displacer beast. Olive knew he could not possibly see into the dark shadows of the ill-lit room, but she grew acutely aware of the sound of her heart pounding in her chest, and if she could have stopped it from beating at that moment she would have. Her fingers tightened about the hilt of her sword, prepared to draw it in a hurry. Kimball, Victor called from down the hall. We haven't got time to waste. The geest servant's head snapped back at an unnatural angle as if against his will. He turned to the door and exited the room without looking back. Olive breathed as silently as she could. She did not move from her hiding place until the sound of Kimball's footsteps had faded into nothingness. When Alias and Dragonbait returned to the tower, Durgar was still out sifting through the ashes of Melman's home, no doubt making sure the treasure found in the basement was thoroughly catalogued before it could be looted. 
the two adventurers left a message for the priest and hurried to Mintassin's. There they found Jamal in the middle of a lesson with Kel. The boy seemed much more subdued. Apparently the young night mask had gotten a look at Melman's branded face when he had brought the former night master his lunch, and now he was seriously rethinking his original career choice. Mintassin sent Kel off to study on his own. Once the boy was gone, Alias told the actress and the sage of the afternoon's adventure, just as she intended to relate it to Durgar, not mentioning Victor's second key. She felt just a hint of guilt deceiving Jamal, but the alternative she knew was to have the key and the Cromark's reputation called into question in Jamal's very next street performance. Mintassin, eager to get a glimpse of the Quelzarn, asked if he could join the next party down to the lair. You're on, Alias agreed. She'd been secretly hoping the sage might be enticed into lending his expertise to the expedition. I was hoping we might make it down there again before high tide. Then we'd better not waste any time, the sage replied. Jamal, you game? We'll take a shortcut. He took up Jamal's hand in his right hand and Alias's in his left hand. Jamal snagged Dragonbait's arm. Silver path, thun bridge, the sage intoned. Alias felt a buzz in her ears, and a moment later, she, Jamal, Dragonbait, and Mintassin all stood in the center of the bridge over the River Thun. Although she realized Mintassin must possess far more powerful spells than teleportation, the swordswoman was a little taken aback by how casually he used it. A little showy, aren't you? she teased the sage. Just lazy, Mintassin retorted with a grin. He moved over to the edge of the bridge and peered at the riverbank through the fog. Where's this door? the sage asked. It's hidden from the view of the bridge by some rocks, Alias explained. The fog was no thicker than it had been this morning, but Alias was unsuccessful in locating the rocks. The rocks, along with the sandbank, were already underwater. It could be tricky getting back in. We'll have to do some wading. In the thun's current, with a sea serpent in the water, Jamal exclaimed. Better count me out. Which way does the door open, Mintassin asked. Out, Alias explained, realizing with disappointment that the water would make the door very difficult, if not impossible, to budge. I could pass us through the door with a dimensional portal, the sage suggested. Most unwise, a voice said from behind them, and out from the mist stepped Durgar flanked by a large contingent of the watch. But then, you were always a bit reckless, weren't you, Mintassin? Not everyone wants to live to be as old as you, Durgar, Mintassin taunted. Durgar smiled coolly at the sage. He held up the note Alias had left for him at the tower. This door's the entrance to the alleged Faceless's lair? he asked Alias. The swordswoman nodded. I obtained this key from a night mask, she explained, handing over the magical key that Melman had given her. Briefly, she described how she, Dragonbait, Olive, and Victor had explored and then been expelled from the Faceless's lair. Just as she had before, she omitted any mention that Victor had also had a key and had been in the Faceless's lair before she had arrived. This site is now under the jurisdiction of the Watch, the priest declared. As such, you may not explore it without an official escort. And since I neither expect nor will allow any of my own people to attempt any magical entry that might endanger their health. We will wait until low tide, when the door can again be opened. That won't be until hours after midnight, Mintassin growled. We can't get in, they can't get in, Durgar pointed out. I plan to station men in hiding about the bridge and the shore. Perhaps we will catch some night masks attempting to enter. I don't think that's likely, Alias argued. As elaborate as the water trap was, I can't imagine that it didn't also include an alarm to warn the Faceless, wherever he might have been at the time. Well, we shall see, Durgar said. If, a half hour after low ebb, no one has appeared, then I shall go in with my men. I'd appreciate your presence at that time as guides, he said, addressing both Alias and Dragonbait. And can I come too? Mintassin asked, imitating a schoolboy begging a favor of an adult. If you choose to bring another advisor, the priest said to Alias, eyeing Mintassin somewhat disapprovingly, that's your business. You, though, woman, he addressed Jamal, have no business here. Jamal's advice, your reverence, has been crucial in helping me locate this lair, Alias argued. That may be, 
Durgar replied. But, as she is not known for her discretion, she is not welcome. As you will recall from your discussion yesterday with the Crowmark, your employer, there are more serious aspects to these investigations than feeding the curiosity of theatrical vagrants. Theatrical vagrant? I like the sound of that, Jamal said with mock indignation. Certainly a step up from being a lackey to the likes of Hastor Erdo, she sneered. Durgar's eyes narrowed, but he did not reply to the actress's implied insult. We'll be back at low tide, Alias said. Mintassin reached for her hand, no doubt prepared to whisk the two women and the sorrel away with magic, but Alias said, I'd like to walk. She proceeded down the bridge with Jamal at her side. Very well, the sage sighed, and took a position alongside Dragonbait, following the two women. As they strode through the streets, Mintassin began expounding on the varying legends about Quelzarns. Dragonbait listened intently, eager to learn all he could about a creature he might battle again. But Alias drifted back a few paces to apologize to Jamal for Durgar's insistence that she be left out. Don't give it a second thought. I certainly haven't, the actress reassured her. Besides, I'll squeeze the story of your expedition out of you later. Alias felt another twinge of guilt, reminded of how she'd kept secret the Cromark's key. The loyalty she felt she owed Lord Dostar as an employer remained intact only because she hoped, for Victor's sake, that the Cromark had a good reason for possessing the key to the Nightmaster's lair. She felt a stronger loyalty, though, to Jamal, and not just for all the advice the woman had given her. She was still haunted by the phantom memories of a mother who looked just like the actress. In addition, the connection Jamal had to find her wyvern spur made Alias feel a certain warmth for her. She wanted something to make up for the key that stood between them. Lord Victor's invited me to a masquerade ball tomorrow night, she confided. Dragonbait and I. My goodness, how egalitarian, Jamal said with a grin. I wonder what he's playing at. Alias shook her head. He's not playing at anything. He just likes my company. A likely story, Jamal retorted, her tone laced with dramatic suspicion. I suspect I'll need a fancier gown from all Victor said about this event. Definitely, Jamal agreed. Fortunately, I know a dressmaker who owes me several favors. Why don't we just pop into her shop now? The two women excused themselves from the company of the sage and the sorrel and made their way down a side street. Jamal's dressmaker was an elven woman called Dawn, who greeted Jamal with a suspicious look. She broke into a string of expletives when the actress explained Alias's needs and time constraints. Jamal insisted that a designer of her talents was surely up to the challenge. The elf eyed Alias critically for several moments. Finally, she said, The shoulders. None of these Westgate witches can compete there. Lady Nettle forty years ago, but... None of the wilting lilies of this generation. We'll leave the shoulders bare. How will the dress stay up? Alias asked. Elven magic, Jamal chuckled. For the next half hour, the swordswoman fidgeted through measurements, pinnings, and some rather rude appraisals of her features. At last, Don announced that Alias was free to go. Providing the swordswoman came by tomorrow for a final fitting before noon, the gown would be ready an hour before the ball. Her scabbard belt will spoil the gown's lines. She'll need a baldric for her sword, Jamal informed the elf. You were planning to wear your sword, weren't you? In this city, I wear it everywhere, Alias confirmed, as she studied the dozens of masks that lined the walls of the shop. For Dragonbait, she picked out a half-mask covered in feathers, and for herself, a simple full face done in glazed porcelain. The mask's arched eyebrows seemed to express exactly how she was beginning to feel about all the twists and turns her visit to the city had taken. This is actually getting exciting, Jamal laughed, as she and Alias left the shop and made their way through Westgate's fog-bound streets. It reminds me of a song Nameless sang about the Westgate knobs, something about battles at the balls. Their battles are fought at the ball, Alias corrected in measured rhythm. She knew the song perfectly well though she had never known before that Finder had sung it about Westgate. She turned to Jamal and spoke as openly as she dared. I'm so glad we've met. I'm glad Finder knew you. Glad that I got to know you too. I'm going to bring down the faceless for you, Jamal. 
I promise. The actress looked taken aback for a moment, but then she smiled and draped her arm around the swordswoman's shoulders. I appreciate that, she said, giving Alias's shoulders a friendly squeeze. I think, though, that you look exhausted. You should get some rest before you throw yourself back into the fray. Back at Blaze House, Alias found she could hardly keep her eyes open as she took her leave of the actress. Leaving Mercy with instructions to wake her at midnight, the swordswoman retired to her room to nap. Dragonbait was already there sleeping. By the time the sandbar was uncovered again, the fog had cleared. The crescent moon shone brightly on the untrampled approach to the Nightmaster's lair. It was the perfect secret entrance, Alias thought. The tide washed away all signs of the Nightmaster's passing after every meeting. There had been no sign of any Nightmasters approaching the site, despite the fact that, according to Melman, this would be the night of their regular meeting. The Faceless had learned of their trespass, Alias realized, and had warned his followers. The Nightmasters and their lord would elude Durgar this night, but soon much of their wealth and the magical source of their obscurement would be in the hands of the Watch. With a keen sense of satisfaction, Ali showed Durgar how to use the key to the lair, and she, Dragonbait, Mintassin, and twelve armed members of the Watch followed the priest into the dark tunnel by the River Thun. Half the Watch carried hooded lanterns, and Mintassin produced a small silver wand which glowed with a magical light. As the party moved into the conference room, Dragonbait tapped on the table. Melman's mask is missing, he said in Sariel. Damn! Alias whispered. A leaden feeling of failure settled over her. The Faceless must have some other way in, she said to Durgar, and she explained about the missing mask. He might have come in the way we left, through the sewer, Alias suggested. Or use magic, Mintassin pointed out. Dragonbait pressed the panel that operated the secret door. Alias nearly ran through the secret passage. She hesitated only a moment at the chasm over the sewer to check with her sword that the bridge was still intact and crossed over the sluggish water below. Dragonbait clucked with annoyance at her impatience. He remained behind to present the invisible bridge to Durgar, Mintassin, and the Watch. Dragonbait and the Sage stood guard as the Watch crossed, but the Quelzarn did not appear. As the others trooped up the next passage, the sage stood looking over the chasm's edge with disappointment. Dragonbait had to tug on his sleeve to get him to follow the others. I guess a watch Quelzar never surfaces, the sage said as he continued on. They found Alias in the empty treasure room, leaning dejectedly against one wall, staring at the shards of the mirror that had been mounted on the wall. Save for the broken mirror, the room was stripped of all trace of the night mask's treasure. The chests, the weaponry, the wands and staves, the iron golems, the table holding the tree of masks, all were gone. The mirror, Alias muttered. I never thought about the mirror. As if the Faceless would need a mirror to check how his hair looked before his meetings. I'm such an idiot. Mintassin bent over and picked up a large sliver of the broken silverback glass. Nice workmanship, the sage commented. He held it out to Durgar. Late monarchical period. Legend has it that there were several of these magical portal mirrors in Verovan's castle. They disappeared in the looting that followed his death. So all the Faceless had to do was pop through the mirror and carry the stuff back to wherever he has another mirror, Alias noted. No, Mintassin corrected. All he had to do is order the iron golems to carry the stuff through, much easier. Alias glared for a moment at the sage. Then, unable to carry the mirror through itself, the sage continued, the Faceless had to smash it so no one could walk through it and discover where he'd gone. Well, Durgar said, while I'm willing to concede this might have been a meeting place of night masks and even a hoarding place for their ill-gotten goods, I can see no evidence before me of any creature known as the Faceless. There is a Faceless, Alias snapped. Mist confirmed it when we spoke with her. Mist? Ah, yes, the dead dragon. She might have been lying to you. Dragons will do that, you know, Durgar pointed out. Miss Skull is gone, Dragonbait noted, peering into the pool, which had lately held the earthly remains of their former foe. I think, to be on the safe side, the priest murmured, 
we should leave before the tide turns and traps us down here. Durgar ushered the watch back down the stairs toward the sewer, but Alias remained behind, pacing the cavern floor with a barely concealed fury. There would be no end to the evil the night masks brought into Westgate unless she captured the faceless. She thought of the ragman who had died when the night masks burned Jamal's home, and the halfling who'd been killed in the explosion in the warehouse, and all the other people who were dead because of the thieves' guild. With his minions and his smoke powder, the faceless would continue to terrorize the whole city. No doubt he considered himself master of Westgate. Now he was somewhere safe, with all his power still intact, laughing at her failure. Alias let loose with a tremendous shout, a battle cry from the north, a call for vengeance. Durgar, who just looked back to ask the adventuress if she were leaving with them, took a step back in surprise, nearly tripping down the stairs. Mentassin felt his blood run cold from the emotion he sensed emanating from the swordswoman. The Sariel touched Alias's tattoo, kindling the link they shared, trying to infuse some of his inner calm into her wild spirit. The warrior woman shook herself out of her rage. I will find him again, she declared. He cannot hide from me much longer. Chapter 17 Accusations The Faceless looked over his nine surviving minions, and from behind his two masks, one of porcelain, the other of coins, he smiled. They had responded well and promptly to his summons. Each had received from a messenger they'd never seen nor would ever see again, a single scrap of paper with the code word KUDZU. They all knew what this meant. It had happened on rare occasions before, when some local activity near the bridge prevented them from using the entrance to their lair in secret. They were to meet at a different site, but at the same time as usual. So the Nightmaster's business continued uninterrupted while Durgar and his watch were occupied examining a lair that had since been pillaged and abandoned. Two Nightmasters who lived near the bridge had apparently detected the watch's interests in the sandbank and were now informing the others in hushed whispers. They were like nervous cattle milling in the path of an approaching storm, the Faceless reflected. They needed only that sharp crack of lightning to turn them into a stampede. The Faceless was preparing to be that lightning. The Nightmaster's Lord sat at the head of a wooden table in a tavern that had closed for business two hours earlier. Behind him stood two rows of dragon-headed iron golems, arranged like obedient troops to remind the others of the power he commanded. He drummed his fingers impatiently on the tabletop. First the stick, the Nightmaster's Lord thought. He began the meeting by tossing Melman's mask on the table. The glyph that labeled it as Gatesides had been scratched off the porcelain. Gateside is dead, he announced. The effect on the assemblage was immediate. To the faceless, their fear and uneasiness was palpable and exquisite. Now the carrot, the faceless prompted himself. I have at this time no plans to turn the management of his district over to anyone else. It might be better, I think, to divide his duties and his income among those of you who remain. A tingle of excitement passed through the Nightmasters. It was a great risk being a Nightmaster, but the rewards were what made the risk worthwhile. And finally, the challenge. Before Gateside died, the Faceless declared, he betrayed us to Alias the Sellsword. Before his betrayal, this Alias was nothing more than a mercenary, a trumped-up member of the Watch. In betraying us, though, Gateside made her into exactly what he feared her to be an enemy capable of destroying our organization. The Faceless paused, letting his words sink in. It took his minions a few moments to shift their thoughts from their own greed to their own self-preservation. He ignored their impassive masks, but studied instead the pursed lips, the clenched jaws, the trickle of sweat along the cheek of finance management. Aside from fearing the loss of their wealth and freedom, some of them, he knew, had a childlike terror of being killed by this red-headed witch. After a few moments, the Faceless continued. I had not expected Gateside to betray us. It was an admission that he was, after all, only human, but one that also laid the blame squarely on the deceased. 
Once I was made aware of his betrayal, I did everything in my power to keep the damage to a minimum. Our secret identities remain unthreatened. It was important to make them aware that he alone had preserved them from their enemies. The loss of a secure meeting place is a minor loss. Our treasury and our armory remain in our possession. Now, to give them blood, the Nightmaster's Lord thought. This swordswoman has lunged at us with all she had, the Faceless growled. But we have parried her attack. Now it is time for our repost. Around the table, heads bobbed up and down in agreement. It is time to show this mercenary witch and all the people of Westgate that we are the true commanders of this city. It is time to let the merchant nobles know they cannot simply hire someone to free them from our rule. Smiles of satisfaction beamed from the Night Masters. Finally, the Faceless thought, it's time to reveal my plan. I propose, he declared, that we use our long-hoarded troop of magical warriors in a single strike that will end the career of Alias the Sellsword and at the same time break the power of the merchant nobles once and for all. In light of Melman's betrayal, I will not go into the details of my plan for security reasons. Are there any questions at this point? There should have been questions. Seven years ago, when the current Faceless had managed to wrest the title and power from the doppelganger who'd created this guild, there would have been questions. There had been at least three Nightmasters then whose ability to reason, and consequently their power, had been strong enough to argue with him. Over the years, though, the current Faceless had skillfully eliminated these challengers. Melman had been the last. With his demise, there was no one left who would voice what the others hardly dared think. No piece of grit around which a pearl of wisdom might form. Last of all, the Faceless thought with a cynical grin, display for them an illusion of their power and choice. I call then for a vote, allowing me the use of these resources, he motioned to the golems, to use at my discretion. He pulled a short dagger from his belt and held it out. The blade glistened with a drop of greenish ichor. There was a sharp collective intake of breath from the Nightmasters. All wondered if another compatriot would perish at this meeting. How say ye to my proposal? the Faceless asked. Yea or nay? Nine resounding yeas echoed around the table. Each Nightmaster eager to prove his or her loyalty by the zeal with which he or she replied. Visual aids, the Faceless reflected, never failed to smooth the course of democracy. He smiled with pleasure at the wisdom of his minions. Dragon Bait awakened instantly at the knocking on the door. Alias was gone already. He vaguely recalled her prodding him earlier to tell him she was going with Jamal back to the dressmakers. He considered rolling over and ignoring the knock. After the late hour, he had finally retired. He felt he was owed more sleep, even if it was nearly noon. If it was Mercy at the door with a breakfast tray, the half-elf girl would let herself in and leave it on the table. There was the sound of a key rattling in the lock, and the sound of another key, then another. Then a wire slid through the keyhole. Dragonbait swung out of bed warily and grabbed his sword. The door swung open, and Olive Ruskettle slipped into the room and shut the door behind her. It's such a pleasure to find a challenging lock for a change, the halfling said in place of a greeting. She pushed her lock-picking wire into her hair. The Sariel lowered his sword and set it back against the wall. Good morning to you too, he signed, sitting down on the edge of the bed. Alias has gone out with Jamal, he explained. Olive hopped up into a chair by the table. I know. I waited until I saw her leave. I wanted to talk with you in private. The Sariel yawned toothily. Impatiently, he signed. What is it now, Olive? It's about Victor Dostar. What about him? He can't be trusted. You've got to convince Alias somehow to drop him like the slimy toad he is, and fast. The paladin glared at the halfling for her effrontery. I told you I've already studied him with my Shensite. There is nothing evil in him. I trust him completely. Well, I think the old Shensite's going, pal, the halfling retorted. The paladin bristled. To say his Shensite was wrong was the equivalent of suggesting he had slipped from the grace of his god. Smelling the fresh-baked bread scent of the Sariel's fury, 
the halfling hurried to put a different tone to her words. It's like Elminster always says good and evil aren't always. You've been tricked somehow. Instead of relying on this paladin magic all the time, you should use the evidence of your other senses. Like my mom used to say, handsome is as handsome does. And Lord Victor doesn't at all, at least not handsomely. What evidence? The paladin signed, barely in control of his temper. Well, the key he had for starters, Olive said. He explained the key to Alice and me. Yeah, I know. He told you he got it from his father. I heard him admit it when I followed him home. Yes, I saw you stow away on his carriage. He is only trying to protect his father the way you used to cover for Finder Wyvernspur's crimes. It proves only that his judgment is poor, not that he cannot be trusted. The key he had wasn't the same as the one Alias had. The Sariel cocked his head in confusion. What do you mean? It wasn't the same cut. It was nothing like it. The paladin shrugged. Different kinds of keys can open the same door, he signed, and pointed to the door to the room, as you so aptly demonstrated. Yes, if they have certain similarities, Melman's key and the key Victor said he got from his father, they're as different as night and day, and I know my keys, as I so aptly demonstrated. There might be magic on the key that opened the door, Dragonbait argued, and magic is not your forte. Then there's the question of footprints, Olive continued undaunted. There weren't any on the sandbar as we approached the door. If Victor had entered by the same door, we would have seen his footprints. Dragonbait struggled to remember the sandbar the afternoon before, anxious to dispute the halfling, but, truth to tell, he had not noted the condition of the sandbar one way or the other. He could have waded in earlier before the tide was at complete ebb, and the water carried away his prints, he signed. His boots weren't wet, and there were no wet footprints in the sand on the other side of the door, Olive argued. He not only failed to mention there was another way in, which he must have used, but he also lied to us to cover that fact. Dragonbait thought of the smashed magical portal mirror they'd found in the lair last night. He scratched his head, trying to think of some excuse for the young noble. Covering for his father was one thing, but neglecting to mention a second entrance indicated something far more serious. Then there's the Quelzarn, the halfling continued. Those things aren't dumb animals. They cast magic. There were four tasty morsels in the water, one with a sword and scales, you, one with chain mail, alias, one in leather, me, and one with no shell on him at all, Lord Victor. It was attracted to the light of my sword, Dragonbait argued. A Quelzarn hunts by scent first. They say one can smell blood in the water a mile away, Olive commented. If you hadn't smelled juicier, it would have taken me. More importantly, it was upstream from all of us. It had to pass Lord Victor before it surfaced beside you and me. Then there's the moment in the side tunnel when it lunged at Lord Victor. He had his hand in his pocket, fingering something. I'm willing to bet he has some charm against the creature. They sell such charms on the docks, Dragonbait pointed out, to anyone willing to pay two silvers. But I'll bet his works better than those, Olive replied. It does not prove your point, the paladin insisted. Not alone. You have to study the whole body of evidence, the halfling retorted. Allow me to continue. The paladin remained silent. There's the question of Victor's only known confidant, the person with whom he discusses his day-to-day -day problems. His father? Dragonbait queried by hand. Hardly, Olive replied. Oh, to be sure, he kept the Crowmark informed of Alias's discovery and our expedition into the sewers. He also assured the old man that, where Alias is concerned, he has no intention, and I quote, of forming an alliance beneath his station. But the most sinister point of all, guess who it is that Victor Dostar has chosen as a confidant, who he trusts with all his schemes. Go on, guess. The Sariel shrugged. Kimball. Dragonbait shook his head in disbelief. Yes, Olive insisted. Kimball, the geese assassin, the man whose idea of an amusing afternoon is torturing halflings. He and Victor both know that the Crowmark is the faceless. They were talking about it. 
If Victor knew for sure, he would have told Alias, the paladin insisted. Oh, he'll tell her, Olive said, but not until the time is right. What time is that? When he's certain he's properly positioned to be installed as Crowmark. The halflings at House Thalivar think he's had his eye on the position for eight years, ever since his father cheated him out of it by running for his third term. Lord Victor's an ambitious little viper, but he can't just squeal on his father. He has an image to uphold as the dutiful loyal son. If Alias accuses Lur, she'll be the one to take the brunt of the nobles' anger for insulting one of their own. Victor will get the credit for helping her fight the Night Masks, but won't be blamed for turning on his father. He's using her, using the way everyone feels about her. You are speculating, the paladin signed. Olive hopped down from the chair and strode up to the paladin with her hands on her hips. I am not speculating, she growled, stomping her foot soundlessly in the plush carpeting. I heard him plotting to overthrow his father, plotting to take over his crawl mark, plotting to use Alias. Now, you have to decide who you're going to believe. There's me, who you've known for eleven years, who helped free you and Alias and find her from the clutches of Kassana and Zri and Falsi, and who helped you free your people from Moander's slavery. Then there is this silver-tongued green grocer who you don't know a thing about, except that he looks good to your Shen sight. Dragonbait folded his hands together. He did not reply immediately, but Olive could tell from the ham-like scent of worry wafting from his neck glands that she'd gotten through to him. Finally he signed, I must think more about this. You do that, the halfling answered, and while you're at it, think about how you're going to break it to Alias. She's likely to be upset, but she can't be kept in the dark. She's up to her neck in all this, and Westgate politics are even deadlier than the Westgate sewers. I'm going back to House Thalivar. I've managed to wrangle myself into duty as one of Lady Nettle's personal attendants for the ball, so I'll see you both there. The halfling let herself out leaving the paladin to brood over her words. It wasn't until Mercy came in with a tray of fruit and bread an hour later that the paladin even moved. He returned the girl's smile and curtsy with a brusque nod, then returned to his thoughts. The young half-elf shook her head at the stuffy smell in the room and opened a window before taking her leave. She couldn't think why the room smelled so of smoke, but then she was unaware that that was the scent of the Sariel's fervent prayers. Lord Victor surveyed the robe and sash he'd had made especially to match Alias's gown. The swordswoman's elven dressmaker had been obnoxiously discreet about what the swordswoman was wearing. Victor had had to visit her personally to talk her out of the information. It was worth his trouble, though, since it was important that people associate him with Alias tonight. Costuming was only one of several subtle but effective methods to achieve that end. Almost everything was in place for tonight. Before he dressed for the ball, though, he had one last piece of business with his father. The crow mark was where he'd been yesterday afternoon at the same time, indeed, where he could be found every afternoon, in his library balancing the business accounts personally, double-checking the figures of his accountants, ship captains, customs agents, and warehouse guards. Any discrepancy resulted in angry bellowing to send for the person responsible for the error, even if the error was in the Dostar clan's favor. Victor entered the library and stood before his father's desk. Father, he said. Victor, Lord Dostar replied curtly, looking up with irritation at the disturbance. His pen paused in mid-stroke. There was a trace of concern in his eyes. He never knew these days what his son might tell him next. Victor remained standing silently in just the right spot to cast a shadow over the account book. Finally, the elder Dostar asked, Is there something you need? Many things, Victor replied smoothly inwardly pleased that he had managed to make his father ask him. But first and foremost, he said, I need to know if you have changed your mind about attending the mass ball this evening. You know I have not, Lura retorted, snapping off the last word like a dry twig. You are consorting with the help. It's no different than being caught in a compromising position with a chambermaid. 
I will not be seen appearing to endorse such a relationship. I think you should reconsider, Victor stated. This evening, Alias is going to unmask the faceless. The Cromark's forehead creased deeply with concern. He set down his quill pen and closed his account book. She knows who the faceless is? She is very close, said Victor, and she'll have the proof she needs by tonight. Why hasn't she come to me with this information? Lord demanded. That's what I hired her for. Why hasn't she? Victor parroted. He shrugged. Perhaps consorting with Jamal and her little troupe has given her a flair for street theater dramatics. Will you reconsider coming tonight? Lure shifted uncomfortably in his seat, remaining silent as he considered his options. After a few moments, he shook his head. Send for her. She must tell me first. I can't have half the nobles up in arms if she is wrong. Victor frowned down at his father. She can tell you in private at the ball, he argued. Lure's face clouded with anger. He rose to his feet and shouted, I will not attend this cursed ball. Send for Alias now. A look of rage spasmed across Victor's face. But the Cromark was not unaccustomed to his son's temper. Lure held his ground. In a moment, the younger Dostar mastered his emotions and his face transformed back to a mask of civility. Victor lowered his eyes to the table and whispered, I'm sorry, father. It's over now. I should think so, Lure snapped. These tantrums are beneath you. Now do as I ask, please. Victor shook his head sadly. I mean, it's over for you. We know that you're the faceless. Lure's face turned scarlet, and for several moments, though his mouth moved, he seemed unable to reply. Finally, the words exploded from him. That's preposterous! If that's what this cheap sellsword thinks, I want her here now before she does any more damage. That's what she will think, and she has proof, Victor produced the key he'd shown to Alias and explained. I found this among your possessions. It's the key to the former lair of the Nightmasters and the Faceless. I never saw that key before, Lure declared. So you say, but I do not think that Alias will believe you. We'll see about that, Lure growled. He reached out and yanked on the bell pull. Almost immediately, Kimball appeared in the doorway. I want you personally to fetch Alias and bring her here immediately, the Cromark commanded the servant. Kimball looked at Victor. The younger Doe star shook his head. Kimball entered the room, closed the door behind him, and stood before it, silent and still. The veins in Lure's face throbbed visibly. What is the meaning of this? he demanded. Tonight, Victor explained, Alias, under my direction, will identify you as the Faceless, leader of the Night Masks. Enough evidence will be found among your possessions to offer proof of this accusation. The young noble slid around the desk and put a hand on his father's shoulder. There is still a way out for you. A ship to Mullerand is putting out to sea tonight just before the ball. You can take passage on that ship, leaving a document behind that will abdicate leadership of House Dostar to me and recommend me for the post of Cromark. I, in turn, will ensure that these awful revelations are never made public. If you believe me guilty... Why would you do that? Lord Dostar asked with a laugh. To preserve the power of the nobles and the power of this family, Victor retorted. There will be talk, naturally, but nothing will come of it. Then, in a few years, when the night masks are under control and all of the rumors have died, I will send for you. You can return as an elder statesman. He gave his father's shoulder a reassuring squeeze. You think I will leave this house, this city, in your hands, knowing you have allied yourself with these criminals? Victor's brow knit in confusion. While he hadn't expected his father to accede readily to his demands, he was not prepared to meet with a counter-accusation. It is not I who have aligned myself with the night masks, but you, he insisted, throwing his hands up in the air. I know about the smoke powder, Lure said. Smoke powder? What about it? It occurred to me when Alias noted how much more common smoke powder is. She thought perhaps we weren't able to stop it from being smuggled in. 
She didn't know how efficient the sniffer dogs at the customs check are or just how much we've confiscated. It's all been recorded in the customs records. There should be quite a stockpile. The Cromark poked a hard finger in his son's chest. A stockpile I entrusted to you, he growled. A stockpile I have since discovered has been seriously depleted. You've been selling it to them, haven't you? You've been supplying the faceless with the smoke powder he uses in his evil schemes. You've made yourself his pawn. Victor snorted derisively. I am no one's pawn, old man. I control this game, and when it's through, Westgate will no longer be a squabbling collection of petty nobles, but a powerful kingdom. Something I might have already accomplished if you had supported me as Crowmark. We might have avoided this whole ugly mess if only you had given me a chance to prove myself. Lure's features softened for a moment, and he put his hands on his son's shoulders. Whatever you've done, he said, whatever hooks the faceless has in you, I can put things right again. Escape yourself on that ship to Mollerand, and I'll sort matters out on this end. God knows, you're not the first noble scion I've had to pull from the m uh, Lure's voice faltered and he gasped and looked down at his chest. A dagger jutted from between his ribs, and Victor, who held the blade's handle, thrust it deeper. The green ichor in the blade's groove sizzled as it came into contact with the Cromark's blood, and a black stain spread across the Cromark's tunic. Father looked at son with an unbelieving stare. His lips tried to issue the word, Why? But the sound was blocked by a bloody foam pouring from his mouth. A moment later, Lord Lord Dostar, Patriarch of Clan Dostar, and Crowmark of Westgate crumpled to the floor in a heap. I'll pull myself out of the mud, Father, Victor replied coldly. It's too bad you wouldn't do as I asked. It would have been so much more convenient for both of us. He looked up at Kimball. The servant was grinning. I fail to see any humor in the situation, Victor snapped. It's the irony, Kimball retorted where the warrioress has been led astray, an accountant comes to the truth. Victor sniffed in recognition of Kimball's point, then offered, Get the body to the new hideout. When you finish that, begin to search and mark all the books with references to smoke powder, so I have evidence of the former Cromark's pilfering. And may I inquire as to your plans, your lordship? The former assassin queried as he opened the library door. I have to get ready for the masquerade ball, Victor said with a laugh as he strolled from the room. You know us merchants, banes of the dance floor and dessert tables. Chapter 18 The Masquerade Alias returned to Blaze House in the late afternoon, lugging a red velvet gown made from so much fabric it weighed nearly as much as the adventurer's sword. Jamal accompanied her carrying the baldric and the masks Alias had chosen for herself and Dragonbait. The Sariel had gone out, but he returned just as Jamal was buttoning up the side of Alias's gown. To Alias's questioning look, the paladin explained in Sariel, I've been to see Mintassin about a few matters. Anything in particular? Alias asked as she slipped the diamond pattern baldric over her head. Dragonbait shot a glance at Jamal. The actress was beginning to fuss with Alias's hair. It would be better in private, he answered. On the pretext that Dragonbait was too modest to change with the actress about, Alias asked Jamal to excuse herself. The actress agreed, promising Alias she'd be waiting in the hotel lobby to see them off. Well, Alias prompted, once she'd closed the door behind Jamal. Olive was here earlier, the paladin explained. And? Dragonbait shifted uncomfortably. He didn't really know that he credited Olive's story, which made it very difficult for him to present it at all. Of course, if he actually believed the halfling, the truth would be even harder for him to reveal. She doesn't trust Victor Dostar, the Sariel said. Alias chuckled as she worked her way into the white slippers Jamal had loaned her. Neither does Jamal. It seems to be a way of life in Westgate, mistrusting all the noble merchants. According to Jamal, it should be a crime for people to make that much money for so little labor or talent. What do you think? Dragonbait asked. Alias tied her scabbard to the baldric she wore. Well, 
I'm sure there's more than a few has to Erdos among them. I meant about Victor, the paladin explained. Alia smiled. Victor's different, she said. Dragonbait said nothing, but continued to stare at Alias until she felt obliged to elaborate. He's wonderful, charming, clever, thoughtful, and, to use a phrase Jamal's fond of, he's a fine figure of a man. Olive thinks he lied to us about the key, that he did not enter the Faceless's lair the way he claimed, that he knows his father is the Faceless, that he is using you to depose him. Alias glared at her companion. That's ridiculous, she snapped. You do not think he suspects his father? Of course he suspects his father. He's just loyal to him, the way I was to find her, like you said. Remember? The day you told me how sky blue virtuous he appeared? Dragonbait nodded. Suppose I hadn't told you that. Would you think the same of him? Of course I would, Alias said in an exasperated tone. Because he is. It's not his fault his father might be a criminal. Olive thinks Victor must have used a different entrance to the lair and lied to us about using the key. Oh, and Olive has never been one to jump to conclusions, Alias said with sarcasm. I'll find out about the key from Victor tonight. We'll get this settled then. You should be getting dressed. Victor will be here soon. She turned to the window and began vigorously yanking a brush through her hair. Dragonbait changed into his best tunic and strapped on his sword. As he peace-bonded his weapon with a cord of silk, he said, I spoke with Mintassin about the magic that makes the Faceless and the Nightmasters undetectable. Alias turned about. Probably something like what makes me undetectable. Kassana could have bought or stole the skill from the priests of Lyra. Durgar won't believe in the Faceless because he can't be detected by magic. I wonder... If he tried to detect me, would he conclude I don't exist, do you think? No, the paladin replied, not if it contradicted the evidence of his eyes. Mentassin suspects that the Faceless's Helmet of Disguise was not the only piece of magic looted from the Temple of Lyra before it was burned. There might have been objects that could misdirect other sorts of magical detection, perhaps even something that could blind my Shen Sight. From the street outside came the sound of carriage wheels rumbling on the cobblestones. That could explain why you read the crow mark as completely neutral, if he is the faceless, Alias noted as she turned to look out the window. Dragonbait nodded, but did not add his worst suspicion. He was unwilling to admit there was any magic that could thwart his Shen sight, which was, to his mind, a gift from his god. Without proof, he could not bring himself to slander Lord Victor. That's Lord Victor's carriage, Elias announced, snatching up her porcelain mask. Her gown rustled as she swept toward the door in a most unladylike dash. It was too late to say anything more, the paladin realized, picking up his own feathery mask. The timing was all wrong. She would not hear it anyway. Although she had made no admission, it was clear to him that she loved Victor Dostar. Come on! Alias chided from the hallway. I don't want to keep him waiting. Dragonbait followed his companion from the room. Victor stood at the bottom of the stairs, looking up at Alias with delight written all over his face. Was it possible, the Sorrel wondered, that the merchant's pleasure could be a ruse? With his shen sight, the paladin studied the man as he bowed low before Alias. Once more, he saw nothing but the cool blue flame that symbolized virtue. Dragonbait shook himself. It was entirely possible that Olive was wrong and that Victor was everything he appeared. The paladin descended the stairs, determined to make no more judgments until he'd heard what the merchant noble had to say about the key and his father. Victor made a polite, although less dramatic, bow to greet Dragonbait. From the corner of his eye, the paladin caught sight of Jamal in the shadow of a pillar. She winked conspiratorially at the paladin as Victor ushered his guests out of the hotel. From the anteroom behind the actress, a small voice noted, They've dressed alike. Jamal turned to face the little half-elven servant girl Mercy. Pardon? the woman asked. Lord Victor and Mistress Alias, the girl explained. The fabric of the sash about his waist is the same as her baldric, the same diamond design, 
and his tunic is dark red velvet too, a darker shade than Mistress Alice's gown, but close. He has her favor on his tunic too. Her favor? She gave him a lock of her hair the other night. I saw her cut it off. I was watching from my window. Mercy admitted it was so romantic. Jamal frowned. It looked romantic. That's not always the same as being romantic. She muttered. No, ma'am. The girl replied, too well trained to argue. She scurried off to avoid any further disagreeable comments. The aging actress leaned back against the pillar, realizing she must sound like an ill-tempered old maid. It was a curse knowing so much. It made it impossible for her to suspend her disbelief and accept a fairy tale romance as fact. Westgate nobles did not court for love, and they certainly did not court commoners. What was Victor Dostar up to? She wondered. The ride to the tower, where the ball was to be held, was brief but lively. Victor steered the carriage skillfully through the streets full of people, apparently gathered to watch the pageantry of the nobles in their splendor. The crowds recognized not only Lord Victor but Alias as well, and cheers and shouts greeted them all the way to the market. Still, Alias felt compelled by Dragonbait's dour look to lean over and ask the merchant noble, "Have you spoken with your father?" Victor nodded and returned a wave to a gathering in an outdoor cafe. I'll tell you about it later in private. The watch was posted around the perimeter of the market, allowing only those who had an invitation to the ball to approach. Victor pulled his carriage up to the edge of the green. A member of the watch, in buffed leather armor and a white caplet with a white plume jutting from his helmet, helped Alias down from the carriage. Victor's elderly driver stepped up from the green to take the horse's reins from his master and move the carriage out of the way of newer arrivals. Lord Victor donned his mask, a mere strip of red velvet with eye holes bordered with gold stitching. Alias and Dragonbait did likewise. Then their host led them up a path covered with ornate carpets. The market had been cleared of its mercantile trappings, leaving the crowds about the green a clear view of the nobles as they climbed the path to the tower. The tower was alight with magical fairy fire, which formed the symbols of all the noble houses of Westgate, from Athigdal to Vamos. Alias shuddered to think about all the nobles' homes guarded only by sleepy servants. The night masks must make quite a haul on nights like these. She realized. There was a small queue of glittering nobles inside the tower's entrance. "What are we waiting for?" Alias whispered. "This is a formal ball," he explained. "We must be announced so the others present know we are here, and can give us the once over." Alias mused. "Don't worry," Victor said. "You look radiant." When they reached the front of the queue, Victor leaned over to give their names to the acting seneschal, another member of the watch with a white caplet and white plume. Lord Victor of House Dostar, the seneschal announced, alias foe of the faceless, and Dragonbait, companion of Alias. Foe of the faceless, Alias repeated with disbelief. Her laughter muffled behind her mask. It's the thought on everyone's mind here," said Victor. "You might as well admit it." Dragonbait pushed on his mask, which kept slipping up on his reptilian muzzle. He wished irritably that the foe of the faceless had not chosen him a mask with feathers. They kept tickling his eyes. The interior of the tower was awash with light. Hundreds of candles burned from a large central chandelier of cast iron, and all about the perimeter hung magical globes of light enchanted to appear as if salamanders and Ephrati were dancing inside the orbs. Two great mirrors hung opposite one another, reflecting back into the room all the light they caught, and creating the illusion of two infinite corridors filled with revelers. The watch officers' desks had become buffet tables, and a ten-piece orchestra was playing a rondo. A dozen couples occupied the center of the floor, spinning in their own little orbits around an imaginary central point. The stairs to the upper levels were blocked by more of the watch, decked in white plumage. The guest clothing was rich and varied, but it was the masks that impressed Alias the most. They ranged from simple domino masks and silk veils to full face sculptures of papier mâché and enamel.
There were silvered globes of the sort worn by priests of Lyra, the goddess of illusion, and more than a few veils of strung coins or beads. Most amusing were the masks that were common to street theaters everywhere. The merchant, the gossip, the red wizard, the cat burglar, the twins. Alia spotted Durgar dressed in his silvered armor but wearing the mask of the doctor, a pompous character in street plays who always offered bad advice. With its high forehead, bulbous nose, and thick handlebar mustache, the mask looked like a parody of Durgar's own face. The swordswoman would never have credited the priest with such a sense of humor. Catching sight of Hastor Erdo's black, puffed-out hair, Alias paused to watch him. The night-masked noble was wearing the mask of another theater staple, Captain Crocodile, the foolish, brash young warrior who blusters, but at heart seeks only love. Hastor was flirting with a woman dressed in an extremely low-cut gown made of fabric covered in mirrored facets and a silvered globe mask. Alias watched them just long enough to see the woman slap the young man and stalk off. Alias chuckled. Their battles are fought at the ball, she quoted. Pardon? Victor asked. A song that my... She hesitated a moment. That Finder Wyvernspur wrote about nobility in general, she explained. In a low voice, audible only to Victor and Dragonbait, adjusting to the rhythm of the orchestra, Alias sang softly. For all of their dancing, posturing, prancing, they'll fight with their backs to the wall. Till then they're eating and drinking and meeting. Their battles are fought at the ball. Victor smiled. That sounds like Westgate, he agreed. Good evening, Lady Nettle, he said. Alias turned to greet the elderly Thalavar matriarch. The noble woman was dressed as before, in a black velvet gown and her vertigris feather brooch. Her only concession to the masquerade, a bit of white silk tied about her eyes with eye holes cut into it. In her wake, she pulled her niece Thistle and Olive Ruskettle. Olive cut a dashing figure in the green and white Thalavar livery, which included a huge floppy hat bedecked with a great green plume. She wore a mask of silver glittering with fake emeralds. Alias could see other halflings in the crowd similarly costumed. Thistle wore a veil of fine white lace over her face and was bedecked in a pink gown with a very high collar and short ballooning sleeves. Long pink gloves covered her lower arms. As she approached Alias, her eyes were glittering with excitement. See what I have, the young woman exclaimed, holding out her right arm for Alias to see. Thistle's right glove was embroidered with a blue stitchwork very similar to Alias's own tattoo. Waves and thorns crested from wrist to elbow, but where Alias's pattern displayed a rose, the young noblewoman's featured a thistle. Alias nodded politely, grateful that her face was masked and her amusement hidden. It is a compromise, Lady Nettle explained with a smile, one that might keep her from attempting any major transformations in her appearance for a few months. Victor, I do not see your father here. My father was detained, Victor replied, avoiding Alias's look. He asked me to stand in his stead until his arrival. Alias was about to pull Victor aside and demand that he elaborate on his last statement, but Olive was tugging on the swordswoman's bodice to get her attention. Did you and Dragon Bay talk? she whispered anxiously. Alias frowned down at the halfling, wishing now that the mask she wore did not hide her displeasure. This is not a good time, Olive, she growled. Olive lowered her eyes suspiciously. But with Lord Victor so near, she did not dare elaborate. Fine. I guess I'll go check out the buffet table. Alias turned back to Victor, who was making excuses to Lady Nettle that he needed to circulate. This'll ask Dragonbait to escort her and her grandmother about the room. The paladin nodded his assent. As he let each Thalavar woman take an arm and draw him off, he tilted his head in Victor's direction. His meaning was perfectly clear to the swordswoman. You said your father was going to be here, Alias declared heatedly. He is, Victor replied, nodding at a passing Thorsar dignitary. We talked this afternoon. When I showed him the key, he looked surprised, but he wouldn't speak about it. 
He promised that he would come later to talk to you and Durgar before the end of the ball. Victor, Alias stressed, you have to go to Durgar with this right now. Your father could be using this time to flee the city. Victor shook his head. My father isn't going to flee. This is his city. I think maybe the key belonged to another noble and father is covering for him. He just needs time to decide how to handle this gracefully. Alia shook her head at Victor's stubborn loyalty to the Crowmark. Part of her wanted to bolt the party immediately and track down Lord Dostar, while the other part was willing to wait for Victor's sake, even though it probably meant losing the Faceless. She sighed and nodded. I'll wait, she said. Good. Then, since you're waiting, we may as well dance. Would you do me the honor? Victor asked, extending his arm. He froze for a moment as an uncomfortable thought occurred to him. You can dance, can't you? he asked. I can manage, Alias replied with a laugh. Victor called the dance a Westgate procession, but Alias knew it as a Shadowdale reel. It was simple and repetitive, but Alias found herself enjoying it nonetheless. The orchestra was skilled and lively, and the nobles on the dance floor at least showed her no animosity. She looked into Victor's blue eyes, and her heart soared. Along the sidelines, Dragonbait stood listening politely to Thistle as the young woman explained the origins of all the different food on the buffet table. All the while, he stared at Victor Dostar, wondering whether Olive could be right. The halfling popped up beside him, munching on a sticky roll. Shen's sight still out of focus, eh? she taunted, noting the look with which he fixed the Cromark's son. You could stand on your head. Maybe that would turn everything right side up. She wandered off to another table for some liquid refreshment. The Sariel glared after her for a moment, then smiled. Only Olive could suggest something so ridiculous that might actually have merit. Not upside down, but backward, the paladin thought. He turned about to face the buffet. As Thistle clattered on about the longer growing season required for melons, the paladin closed his eyes and reached out with his Shen sight. He let the myriad colors slide along his consciousness. He stopped, focusing on a very dark purple to his right. He peeked out one eye. Kimball, the former assassin, stood on a staircase, watching the guests from behind the guards. Dragonbait closed his eye again. In a moment, he could sense a deep red hatred speckled with green jealousy. The paladin confirmed his guess. Hastor Erdo, hating Alias, jealous of Victor's pleasure in her company. With his eyes squeezed tightly shut, the paladin let the colors wash over him longer, until he could sense their pattern as they moved about the blue that he knew must be Alias. As they stepped back from her, circled around her, pulled her close blackness like a shroud covered the blue flame of Alias's spirit. Blackness so dark, it devoured the light from her, giving up none of it. Blackness was the lust for power, the voracious appetite for control over all others, the desire that swallowed its tail and devoured the being's own universe. Dragonbait whirled and glared at the man holding Alias in his arms. Once again, where Victor stood, the paladin saw the blue flame so like Alias's. Now he concentrated on what lay beneath the blue. As if Victor's soul were a canvas, he stared at it for the pentimento that lay beneath the illusion of virtue painted on the surface. Then he could see it, the image that lay beneath what Victor had seemed. There were pits of blackness filled with black serpents, all poised to devour whatever came their way. As Victor reached a hand out to the swordswoman, Dragonbait saw a serpent wind about the flame of Alias's spirit, prepared to crush the life from it before making it a meal. Despite himself, Dragonbait let out a mewling cry and nearly toppled forward. It was a moment before he could gather his Shen sight back into whatever spot it rested when not in use. He saw a flame of blue tinged with a little green jealousy just before his vision cleared. Thistle stood before him, her hands resting gently on his shoulders. "'Are you all right?' she asked slowly, in a manner that presumed that because he did not speak her tongue, he could not hear or easily understand it. The paladin nodded, tapping his chest to indicate he'd only swallowed something the wrong way. 
As Thistle turned to get a glass of water for the Sauriel, Dragonbait watched Victor with new insight. He remembered how Mist had claimed the noble was a pawn to his ambition and desires. The worm always did have a talent for understatement, the paladin thought, with a wry sense of amusement. The dance ended, and Alias strode from the dance floor, hand in hand, with Victor. Dragonbait excused himself from Thistle and moved toward the couple. I must speak with you, the paladin said to Alias and Sariel. Alone. Can't it wait? Alias asked, eager to reach the refreshment table and ease her parched throat. The paladin shook his head to indicate it could not. With a sigh, the swordswoman excused herself from Lord Victor's company. She followed the sorriel to a less crowded section of the room. What is it? Alias asked. She removed her mask and spoke in sorriel so that she would not be overheard. Night masks? No, it is Victor, Dragonbait replied. Olive is right. We cannot trust him. Would you forget about Olive? She doesn't know what she's talking about. It's not just Olive. I have seen it with my Shen sight. He is corrupted. He is an evil man. Four days ago your Shen sight saw he was virtuous, Alias argued heatedly. I was deceived somehow. Some illusion covered the truth. How do you know you aren't being deceived now? Alias demanded. Olive convinced me that I was wrong. I think Olive talked you into seeing something that isn't there, Alias snapped. She burst into a tirade, which consisted of several growls and clicks audible to the other party-goers around them, and a few of them glanced nervously in her direction. I'm tired of hearing about your Shen sight, of the way you judge everyone with it. There's more to people than your palate and visions. What they say and what they do is what really matters. That's how I know Victor is good, she declared. She spun around and bolted off. While the swordswoman and the paladin argued, Kimball slipped up behind Lord Victor. Is everything in place? the merchant asked. Yes, but there may be a problem, the servant whispered. The lizard was studying you and seemed to have an attack of some kind. I suspect he has seen past the illusion projected by your amulet of misdirection. Bloody hell, Victor muttered. He's talking with Alias now. I suggest you continue with the plan, Kimball said. If there is a problem, you can deal with her once you are alone. I can deal with the lizard. Remove him, but do not kill him yet, Victor ordered. She might be able to sense that somehow. Make it appear innocent. As if he left town in a fit of paladin snobbery, Kimball suggested. Yes, nice touch, Victor agreed. Go. The former assassin slipped away. Victor looked in Alias and Dragonbait's direction. Alias appeared to be arguing with the paladin, which was certainly a good sign. The merchant lord watched the Sulthalivar standing beside her imposing grandmother. The girl was as good a pawn as any, Lord Victor thought. He hurried over to ask her to dance. Alias returned to the spot where she'd left Victor, only to discover he had escorted Thistle Thalivar out to the dance floor. She slipped her mask back on, grateful for the way it hid her fury. She watched as Thistle seemed to hang on Victor's every word. The merchant lord may think of her as a child, but it was obvious the young girl thought of him as a hero. Alias felt miserable standing alone in the room full of people, but she could hardly blame Victor for abandoning her. After all, he was supposed to mix with the guests. The swordswoman was just toying with the idea of finding herself another dance partner when Victor and Thistle parted company. Thistle moved in Dragonbait's direction and Victor came toward Alias. The young noblewoman soon cornered her quarry and dragged the sorrel onto the dance floor for a quadrille. I thought your friend could use a little coaxing onto the dance floor, the nobleman explained as he rejoined the swordswoman. He looks far too dour for a celebration. Thistle said she'd see what she could. Alias, what's wrong? Nothing, Alias retorted hurriedly. What makes you think something's wrong? Well, you're shaking for one thing, Victor replied as he placed his warm hands on her shoulders. And, well, with your complexion, you do tend to color when you're angry. Even your shoulders are red. Perhaps we should talk in private. Come upstairs with me. The white-caped guards on the stairs parted for the son of Lord Dostar and his guest. 
Halfway up the stairs, Alia shot a glance down at the dance floor. Dragonbait was acquitting himself admirably, keeping up with thistle steps, but the swordswoman could tell his heart was not in the motions. Victor hesitated before opening the door to the conference suite. I need to explain something. I was planning on asking you up here to... to talk. I realize maybe this is a bad time for it, so please don't misunderstand. He swung open the door and Alias felt her heart melting despite her anger. The drab conference room had been transformed into a romantic fairy realm. The large table was glittering from lit tapers of perfumed wax. Bolts of silk fabric and oversized pillows covered the floor between the table and the hearth, where a fire blazed and crackled. A bottle of Evermead, two glasses, and a platter of fruits and cheeses sat on a tray beside the hearth. We can just sit at the table if it will make you more comfortable, Victor said. Alia stepped into the room and Victor followed, pushing the door closed behind them. Feeling a little foolish, she walked past the table and sat down on one of the pillows. She inspected the bottle of Evermead. It was more than a hundred years old. Now, tell me what's wrong, Victor insisted, sinking onto a cushion beside her. Alia shook her head. It's nothing, Victor. Really. Dragonbait and I just had an argument. He can be so... so... oh, it just doesn't make any sense. Victor... Have you been telling me the truth about your father? she demanded. Victor looked into the flames of the fire. No, he admitted softly. Alias removed her mask, then reached up and untied the strings of the fabric covering Victor's eyes and pushed it away. She laid both masks down on the pillow beside her. Then she said, Victor, you have to tell me everything you know. You have to understand, Victor said, looking her in the eye. I love my father. I'm sure he thinks somehow what he's doing is right. He's not an evil man, Alias. He's just, well, he's just so certain that he's always right. You know he's involved with the night masks? I've suspected it for some time. There hasn't been any money missing, but I guess he's been making some other kind of payments. He's in charge of all the smoke powder the city confiscates. There's a lot of it. It isn't all in the warehouse where the books say it should be. When I told him I'd found the key, I also told him I'd discovered about the smoke powder. He seemed pretty shaken. He asked me to cover for him, to give him time to take care of some personal matters. He promised me, though, that he would come here tonight and explain things to you and Durgar. The young man looked away, and Alias could see there were tears in his eyes. It doesn't look good, does it? he asked. No, it doesn't, Alias agreed. You'd better go back downstairs, Victor said. It would be better for you if you weren't seen with me, I think. Why not? Alias demanded. My father is going to be the center of a scandal, Alias. He could be involved with the night masks. Gods, he might even be the faceless. I have to stand beside him, but there's no reason for you to be involved. Victor, no, Alias said, feeling her heart breaking for the young man's pain. Look, I can't approve of your father, but I love you. I'm not going to abandon you because of something your father did. I love you, Victor replied, which is why I can't allow you to stay. I don't want your name dragged down with ours. If you love me, Alias whispered vehemently, you'll let me stay. Victor smiled sadly. He ran his finger across her cheek, then down her neck and along her shoulder. You are so very beautiful, he whispered. You made me feel so lucky. Alias put her hand behind the nobleman's neck and pulled his face closer to her own. I am not leaving you. You say you love me. Prove it, she demanded, and she threw her arms around his neck and pressed her lips against his own. Lord Victor slid one hand about the swordswoman's waist to pull her closer as his other hand rested over Alias's porcelain mask, covering its eyes completely. Below, in the main room of the tower, the interminably long quadrille had ended, and Dragonbait excused himself from Thistle Thalivar's company as quickly as good manners allowed. Now he scanned the crowded room for either Alias or Victor. In the end, it was Olive who found him. She tugged anxiously on the hem of his tunic. Where is she? he signed surreptitiously. The halfling jerked her finger in the direction of the stairway. With Lord Victor, she growled. Didn't you talk to her? Dragonbait cursed and Sariel and began pushing his way through the crowd toward the stairs. 
He managed to climb four steps before his way was blocked by a wall of leather armor and white plumes. Dragonbait hesitated, considering whether he should fetch Olive to translate his need to the guard or whether he should just shove his way past them. He had just decided on the more forceful option when the screaming began. The paladin wheeled just in time to see a huge figure leap down from one of the mirrors mounted on the wall and land with a great thoom on the stone floor. The creature was twice the size of a human, kettle black with a head shaped like a dragon's. An identical creature had already landed on a young noble who screamed as his legs were crushed beneath the monster's weight. The Sariel recognized the figures as iron golems from the lair of the faceless. A third appeared in the mirror, pausing only for the first two to move out of the way before it too leaped down onto the floor. The crowd was already panicking, driving like a herd of cattle for the entrance, only to find that the portcullis to the entrance had been lowered. Those in the rear were being decapitated by blows from the iron golem's fists, while those in front were being crushed by their fellow guests. A fourth and fifth golem emerged from the mirror before the guardsmen poured off the stairs to meet the assault. Dragonbait hovered uncertainly. He could search upstairs for Alias or battle the creatures. As a sixth golem appeared in the mirror, he knew he must act. With a sharpened claw, he cut the peace-bonded cord from his weapon and drew his blade. Then he launched himself at the magical mirror, swinging his sword. The mirror shattered in a burst of light. Glass rained on the guests, but if there were any other golems, they would not be entering the tower as easily as the first six had. The paladin crunched broken glass beneath his feet as he landed. He turned in time to witness Hastor Erdo, with his sword drawn, run toward the sixth golem. The nobleman fainted to the right, then struck the creature on the opposite leg, but his blade broke on the monster's iron surface. The golem grabbed the youth by the arm, slammed him hard against the wall, then released him. Hastor's body slid down the wall, leaving a long bloody smear, his Captain Crocodile mask still smiling. With a snarl, the paladin leaped onto the shoulder of one of the creatures. He knew heat helped such creatures repair themselves, so he did not ignite his sword. Fortunately, the weapon carried other powerful enchantments, so the blade bit deep into the side of the creature's face, parting it like butter. The golem reached up to grab the sariel, but the ornate dragon head prevented it from reaching its assailant. Dragonbait struck again and again with his sword, reducing the golem to spinning around in place while swatting ineffectually at the sariel. The other five golems were not so distracted. The swords of the watch did not carry the necessary enchantment to slice through magically enlivened iron, and the monsters carved a wide swath through watchmen and party-goers alike. The frightened noble's only hope was to dodge between the beasts. Durgar's voice rose above the din, and Dragonbait caught a glimpse of the old priest, his mace glowing with its own eldritch power, smashing huge dents into one of the iron creatures. The golem was swift enough to grab Durgar by the arm, however, and it tossed the old man aside easily and moved back into the crowd, punching and crushing anyone in its path. The priest of Tyre landed heavily, but he rose, albeit unsteadily, and returned to the fray. A smattering of magic missiles plinked without effect on a golem's surface, indicating a few nobles were not above learning the art. At least one mage must have some advanced training, for he sent a lightning bolt arcing across the room. The bolt struck two golems and a handful of nobles. The humans collapsed to the ground, but the golems were slowed. The situation was deteriorating quickly. With the golem beneath him cracking along its entire length and breadth, Dragonbait leaped clear and vaulted up the stairs three at a time. Alias could help turn the tide of the battle if he could only find her. Kimball stood waiting at the first landing, with a double-loaded drow crossbow aimed at the paladin. Dragonbait could smell, as well as see, the resinous putty smeared on the bolt's tips, but he wasn't quick enough to dodge the missiles. The first caught the sariel in the shoulder, the second in the chest. Dragonbait hissed and lunged in an attempt to skewer the assassin, but he fell short and crumpled into a heap on the stairs. "'Looking for your mistress?' Kimball taunted, lowering the crossbow. I am sorry, but she's occupied right now. He motioned for two men in guardsman uniforms to collect the Sariel's body. 
On the main floor, a tight knot of halflings surrounded Lady Nettle as Olive Ruskettle tried with limited success to keep any approaching golems from turning their attention on the matriarch. Lady Nettle was leaning heavily on a spear, which she had plucked from a fallen guardsman. Just when it seemed as if Olive had managed to send one golem off to seek easier prey, Lady Nettle shrieked, Thistle! Olive spotted the young noblewoman collapsed on the floor with a golem hovering uncertainly over her. Olive dashed forward, but Lady Nettle was faster. The head of House Thalivar barged through her ring of bodyguards and stepped right between the Iron Colossus and her granddaughter. The old lady swung her spear to ward off the monster, but the shaft snapped like a twig against the creature's iron arms. As Olive dragged Thistle back to the uncertain safety of the ring of halfling bodyguards, the golem lifted Lady Nettle in both arms and squeezed. Even above the din, Olive swore she could hear the sound of the old woman's back breaking. Then the monster, disinterested in the dead, dropped Nettle Thalivar's crushed, mangled body and wandered off. Olive dashed over to Lady Nettle's broken form. Thistle followed directly behind her, ignoring the bodyguards who tried to hold her back by tugging on the skirt of her gown. Astonishingly, the old woman still breathed, but she was twisted in an odd, inhuman fashion and Olive could tell she was fading before their eyes. The dying woman called for Thistle. Thistle bent close to her grandmother's face. You are my heir, Nettle Thalivar wheezed. Take the feather pin. Thistle began to cry, but Lady Nettle pushed her aside and grabbed Olive by the tabard. She gasped once, then whispered vehemently, Protect my granddaughter. The noblewoman never drew another breath. Her face spasmed into a contortion that looked anything but peaceful and froze. Thistle Thalivar, new leader of House Thalivar, gently unpinned her grandmother's copper brooch. As her tears splashed on her grandmother's corpse, she fastened the brooch to her own gown. Then she and Olive fled to the halfling's last defensive position, under a buffet table. Chapter 19. The Unmasking Ultimately, it was a mild-mannered gatecrasher who managed to turn the tide. Yielding to Dragonbait's request, Mintassin had been keeping an eye on the proceedings at the ball. Cloaked in an invisibility spell, he had slipped past the Seneschal and stood quietly in the corner, wearing the mask of a bearded graying wizard with pipe clenched between his teeth. The paladin had not been able to even guess what might go wrong at the ball. But once the golems had arrived, the sage knew exactly how to bring the situation under control. Magic being nearly useless against such monsters, Mintassin teleported back to his home. There, on his desk, tucked in a box full of straw, was the remedy for iron golems. He had prepared it this morning after realizing the faceless still controlled a troop of the creatures. Arriving in the back of his workroom, the sage dashed to his desk, prepared to scoop up his secret weapons and teleport back immediately. He halted before the desk and nearly froze in panic. The objects he sought were missing. Fortunately, Mintassin was far more level-headed than his reputation credited him. He was also not so old that he could not remember being a boy and the sorts of things boys enjoyed doing. Kel, he hollered, dashing up the stairs two at a time. He threw open the door to the boys' room and gave a great sigh of relief. The box lay on the bed, three glass globes packed within. Kel sat on the floor, waving a nail in front of the fourth glass globe. Within the globe, a tiny insect-like creature pawed frantically at the glass ball, causing it to roll after the nail almost as if the ball were magnetically attracted to the iron. I was just playing, the boy insisted. Mintassin snatched up the box and the fourth globe and hissed, Silver Path, Tower Stair. Before Kel's astonished eyes, the sage vanished. Mintassin reappeared in the tower on one of the staircases. Grimly, he assessed the battlefield. Only one golem had actually been felled, lying in two twitching halves on the floor. Durgar was hammering on a second golem's legs with such determination that the creature was limping noticeably but then so was the old priest. With an uncanny aim, Mintassin threw one ball each at the remaining four unscathed golems. The glass smashed against the iron monsters, releasing the tiny creatures within. 
They grew as they fell, so that by the time they hit the floor, they were five feet in length, each sporting four insect-like legs, an armor-plated back, a long bony tail with a paddle-shaped tip, and most importantly, long mobile antennae. They were easily recognizable by the few experienced adventurers present as rust monsters, normally docile animals with a voracious appetite for all things iron. The first freed rust monster struck its antenna against the legs of the iron golem looming over it. The golem's legs turned brown and crumbled beneath it, so that it toppled to the floor, crippled. The second rust monster took a moment longer to get its bearings, giving the golem beside it time to reach down and grab it. A serious error on the golem's part. The rust monster's antenna wrapped around both arms like whips. The golem's arms crumbled to rust, freeing the rust monster it had just grasped. The golem stumbled off as the rust monster chomped on the rusted remains of its arms. Though able to move, the golem was now unable to continue grappling or punching at the guests, though it continued to chase them. One rust monster was slain by a powerful strike of a golem's fist. But as the iron behemoth pulled away, it lost its hand at the wrist, struck by one of the dying animal's antennae. The fourth and final rust monster scrambled on top of its golem, rusting it from the head down to the shoulders and arms, through the torso, and down to the knees. The ferris-loving animal rolled about in the huge pile of rust as it chomped on it like a cat in a field of catnip. Having thrown all his weapons, Mintassin looked about for dragon bait. Just before he'd teleported to his workshop to fetch the rust monsters, the sage had seen the paladin slashing at one of the golems. Now, however, the Sariel was nowhere to be seen. There had to be nearly fifty people dead and dying on the tower floor, but the Sariel was not among them. As the watch, under Durgar's direction, dragged a rust monster in the direction of one of the remaining mobile golems, some other members of Durgar's forces had managed to raise the portcullis to the outside. Nobles streamed out of the tower like ants from a flooded nest. The sage was just about to teleport to the Temple of Ilmater to fetch some priests to heal the wounded, when he spied Kimball exiting through the portcullis. The Dostar manservant looked not only uninjured but completely unruffled, as did the two guards in Dostar livery who followed him carrying a lumpy rolled-up tapestry. With a suspicious frown, the sage reached in his pocket for a spell component and whispered, Light pass! His large form went translucent, then transparent, then invisible. Once transformed, the mage hurried after the former assassin, his minions, and whatever it was they found necessary to cart off. Upstairs, isolated from the noise of the attack by the massiveness of the tower's construction, Alias lay with Victor Dostar before the fireplace of the conference room. Shaking off the elegant torpor that enthralled her, she raised her head from Victor's chest and looked up at him. I love you, she whispered. I love you too, the nobleman replied. But now that you have your proof of that, we really should be getting back to the ball. Alias nodded. She rose to her feet and shook out the wrinkles in the skirt of her gown. Victor handed her her baldric and sword. She slipped the decorative belt over her head. As soon as Victor opened the heavy oaken door, Alias heard disturbing sounds coming from the hall below. The thunderous crash of something heavy falling to the floor echoed up the tower. When she reached the stairs, Alias could hear people screaming and moaning. She raced down the stairs. Halfway down, she spied Mintassin in front of her, but he vanished before her eyes. When she reached the spot where the sage had stood, she was aghast at the destruction she witnessed. Members of the watch were pulling on a rope wrapped about the legs of an armless iron golem in an effort to topple the monster. Several other bits of iron golem lay strewn about the floor, surrounded by dead and wounded nobles. One last golem, missing only a hand, was hovering over a desk that was serving as a buffet. The monster looked as if it were trying to decide what to eat. But Ali espied something rustling beneath the tablecloth and realized the golem was deciding how to get it whomever hid below. Just before the golem struck at the desk with his remaining hand crushing it to splinters, all of Ruskettle and Thistle Thalivar dashed out from beneath the tenuous cover. They ran toward another desk with the creature plodding after them. 
When it had them against the wall, all of Ruskettle whirled about, her sword raised, in a hopeless effort to ward off the creature's blow. Alias released the peace knot tying her sword to her scabbard and drew her weapon. The swordswoman leaped from the stairs onto the golem just as it raised its remaining fist. Her sword connected with the golem's dragon-shaped head, sending sparks flying as the steel of her magical blade cleaved through the iron skull. The beast spun about and seemed to examine Alias for a moment. Then it turned again, pivoting slowly, stopping when it finally faced Olive and Thistle. Alias realized she was being ignored for a target of higher priority, either Olive or Thistle. Yanking free the tablecloth from the smashed desk, Alias whirled it like a net over the golem's head. Olive! Thistle! Quick! Hide! The swordswoman shouted as she slashed at the creature's leg with her sword. Then stay very still! Olive dragged Thistle down behind the remains of a deceased noble, pulling the dead man's cloak over their bodies. Thistle started to argue, but the halfling stifled her protest with a quick elbow in the ribs. Alias slashed into the golem's leg, and the monster turned toward her as it tugged the tablecloth off its head. Upon spying the swordswoman, however, the golem once again ignored her in favor of scanning the room for its previous prey. From the staircase, Victor looked on the carnage in shock and muttered, Sweet Maestra, an oath to the goddess of magic. Hearing the nobleman, the golem turned toward the stair. Victor, get back up the stairs and stay there. Alias ordered, shifting so that she stood between the monster and the staircase. It seems to be interested only in the nobles. Alias couldn't tell if the nobleman obeyed her, but the golem spun about, once more checking for targets. Then it turned again. Finding no more nobility to smite, it made its way for the exit. A rust monster, bloated from gorging on more iron than it usually ate in a year, made a half-hearted wave at the retreating golem with its antenna. But did not bother to pursue the iron creature. The golem passed beneath the portcullis and trundled from the tower. Durgar, who knelt beside a bloodied but still breathing member of House Athigdal, looked up at Alias. Follow the golem, he ordered her. I will follow when I can. Go with Alias, he instructed three of his watchmen, who stood by uncertainly. Alias dashed from the tower with the watch behind her. The injured golem was halfway down the tower hill, moving northwest. Alias had no trouble keeping up with the monster, which even at top speed was ponderously slow. The swordswoman remained behind it and instructed the watch to do likewise. With mounting excitement, she realized the golem may actually lead her back to its point of origin, the Faceless's new lair. Alias was just wondering what had happened to Dragonbait when Victor ran up beside her sword in hand. You shouldn't be here, she said vehemently. I have to see where the golem goes. As long as I don't let myself get cornered, I can always outrun it, the nobleman argued. Alias nodded, unable to counter Victor's logic or his desire to see this through to the end. The golem moved through the streets without incident. Any nobles that were left in the city were no doubt at home piling furniture in front of the doors. And no one else in the streets was so foolish as to challenge the monster. Finally, the golem halted before a ramshackle warehouse near the House Erdo docks. It banged once on the door, which swung open, bathing the golem in a yellow glow. The monster disappeared inside. Alias ordered Victor and the watchman to remain at the warehouse gate as she crept up to the door. The golem stood just inside, unmoving, as if awaiting instructions. Alias slipped past the creature, turned about, and tapped on its chest with the tip of her sword. The creature loomed over her but remained perfectly still. The swordswoman waved for the others to join her. Alias kept an eye on the golem as Victor entered the room, but the noble's appearance did not reactivate the monster. Its killing spree was over for the time being. The room was a cavernous vault. In the center stood a great table of ebony stone glittering with veins of gold, a twin to the one in the Nightmaster's last conference room. Most of the ten chairs surrounding it were pushed out, a few overturned, but the tenth chair remained against the table. What appeared to be a man was slumped in the chair. The man's face was obscured by some strange magic which blurred its features like rain damages a chalk portrait. A bloodstain clotted his robes. He was as immobile as the golem. On the table before the figure lay a sheet of paper. Scrawled in blood was the message, 
death to all who betray and defy our will, noble or common, nightmask or outsider. So say the nightmasters. As Alias was examining the sheet of paper, Durgar entered. He had battled the golems until they were no longer a threat, then spent his last remaining energies casting magical curative spells on the wounded. The old priest looked drained, but he would not, Alias realized, forsake what he perceived to be his duty. Durgar stepped forward and took the paper from Alias's hand. He scowled angrily at the words. Without ceremony, his face as emotionless as the golems, the priest ran his hand down the dead figure's face. A jingling mask of threaded coins came away in his hand. The illusory blur of the faceless became the features of Cromark Lure Dostar. Alias reached out to steady Victor, who swayed in shock and gasped, Sweet Maestra! It can't really be true! Durgar collapsed into the nearest empty chair, dropping the mask onto the table and cradling his head in his hands. The crow mark in league with the night masks. I can't believe it, the old priest whispered. It's true, your reverence, Alias said. We have other evidence linking him to them. No doubt they turned on him for some perceived betrayal. Perhaps they decided to turn their golems loose against the nobles, but Lord Lure fought against them. Perhaps the golems perceived that he was a noble and turned on him first. Perhaps, perhaps once I have recovered my powers, I should cast a spell to speak with Lure's dead spirit, the priest said gravely. Then we will get to the heart of the matter. There will be no... Look out! Durgar shouted suddenly. Alia spun about, her sword at the ready, just in time to see the golem bat away at the watchman who stood guard over its form. The swordswoman threw herself in front of Victor before the monster could harm the nobleman, but instead the creature strode toward the dead body of the crow mark. Durgar rose, drawing his mace, but with its remaining hand, the golem flipped the table onto the priest. Then the creature hefted Lord Dostar's body over its shoulder like a sack of potatoes and began plodding toward the door. Alias was prepared to follow, to battle the golem for the crow mark's corpse, but Victor held her back. Durgar will be crushed, he exclaimed. We have to get this table off him. Alias nodded. Victor was right. The priest's life had to take priority. She laid down her weapon and helped Victor heft the table from Durgar's pale form. Durgar groaned, but he still breathed. The golem had left the warehouse. Alias could hear members of the watch shouting and banging on the monster with their useless weapons. She retrieved her sword and rose to leave, but Victor grabbed her gown. Where's Dragonbait, he asked. We need him to heal Durgar. I don't know, Alias said. Victor, I have to go after the golem. Why, he demanded, why risk your life for my father's body? Without it, Durgar can't speak with his dead spirit. We might never learn the truth, she replied. I've seen enough. I don't think I want to learn any more, the merchant lord declared. There's no guarantee my father will answer in death any questions he would not answer in life. Gently, Alias took Victor's hand from her gown and gave it a sympathetic squeeze. We still have to try, she said, then raced off after the iron monster. By the time Alias caught up with the fleeing golem, it stood at the edge of the harbor, teetering on the thick wooden pylons that protected the shore. The watch soldiers had the monster cornered. Alias shouted for them to get a rope on it, but she was too late. Ponderously, the creature rocked back, then forward, pitching headlong into the water with a tremendous splash. The ripples spread outward until they hit the pier and bounced back. The moon was nearly full, but Alias could detect no bubbles or turbulence in the dark water below. She returned to the ramshackle warehouse. Victor was ordering one of the watchmen to fetch a priest for Durgar. The old man lay on the floor of the warehouse, his breathing strained and shallow, his complexion turning gray. It's just cracked ribs, Durgar assured Alias. After years of combat wounds, I can tell. He added with a grim smile. Alias reported on the fate of the Iron Golem and Lord Dostar's body. Damnation, Durgar growled with annoyance. It could walk across the bottom of the bay and be halfway to the Pirate Isles before it corrodes. We'll never get Lure's body back now. The watchman Victor had sent out returned with a stern-faced young man in white robes, a follower of Ilmater, god of suffering. The others maintained a respectful silence as he knelt beside the elderly priest and began intoning a curative chant, his hands hovering over Durgar's chest. 
When the young man had finished, Durgar took a deep breath, then another, and his complexion began to grow rosier. I just can't believe it, Durgar said, as Victor helped him to sit up. I've known Lur for years. I can't believe he was... He was... Victor, I'm so sorry, he concluded, patting the merchant lord's hand. It's all right, Victor said softly. He hit it well. I couldn't believe it either at first. But your father lived for this city and for his business, the old priest insisted. He picked up the faceless's coin mask and sighed. Lure's greatest pleasure was going over his books, he said, still unable to grasp his friend's treachery. We used to work together in the tower for company's sake. Me with my arrest records, he with his account books. Not two nights ago, no, three, he spent the whole evening tracking down an error in bookkeeping that proved one of his ship captains was skimming off his shipments. He used to say it was easier to catch a thief with an accounting ledger and an abacus than it was with a sword. It was nearly dawn before he found what he was looking for, but when he did, he was elated. Of course, it didn't last. Centaur Erdo came in to holler about Hazder's arrest. Still, for those few moments, he was so happy. You can't imagine a man's a scheming criminal when he's that happy doing his work. Durgar got wearily to his feet. I'd best be getting back to the tower to see what assistance I can give the survivors. His shoulders were bowed. The weight not of his responsibilities, Alias knew, but of his grief. Magical spells could cure broken ribs, but not spirits. Victor walked the priest to the door, speaking to him in a hushed whisper. The noble returned to the swordswoman's side as all the watchmen followed behind their leader. I should return to the tower too, Alias said to Victor. I have to find Dragonbait. I haven't seen him since we left the ball. I did just after you left to chase the golem. He was behind the stair, healing an injured member of the watch. Then he was all right? Looked all right to me, though I'm no expert on how Sorials are supposed to look, Victor said. I guess there's really nothing more I can do until morning. All the nobles who were still able ran off to bolt their castle doors, Durgar seeing to the injured. The young man looked back down at the chair where his father's corpse had been. I don't know if I want to be alone right now. Would you come back to Castle Dostar with me? Alias hesitated. It was hardly an invitation Victor could have made were his father still alive. She knew. It was bound to cause talk. Victor could use her support, though, especially after all he'd been through. There was really nothing else she could do tonight either, and she was beginning to feel weary. She nodded her consent. They walked back to the Market Green, where Victor found his carriage, attended by his driver. He dismissed the driver and took up the reins himself. The drive from the city was quiet and uneventful. They leaned on each other, but neither spoke much. No one greeted them at the door and Victor explained that, save for Kimball and his carriage driver, the servants had all been given the evening off in honor of the ball. Victor ushered Alias down the hallways and into the library, where Kimball was tending a blazing fire in the hearth. After all the violence and the chill of the night air, the room seemed blissfully warm and peaceful, in spite of the malignant servant. Kimball bowed and left the room without a word. Alias noticed that there was another bottle of Evermead on the table with two glasses. Were you expecting me to return with you? Alias asked. Victor shook his head. The other glass would be for my father. I just realized Kimball probably doesn't know that father is... is dead. He sighed. Ah, I suppose I can wait until morning to tell him, if he hasn't picked it up in the servant hall by then. The nobleman poured them each a glass of Evermead as Alias wondered if the Doe Stars ever drank less expensive wines. You look lovely, he said as he handed her a glass. Alias laughed. My hair's a rat's nest. I've torn my gown and I'm covered with iron golem rust. You look lovely to me. He sat down at the desk, but Alias stood warming herself before the fire. I spoke with Durgar before he left us, Victor said. He agreed to call a meeting for tomorrow morning of all the surviving heads of the noble merchant families. It doesn't look good, I'm afraid. From what I could see of the casualties, most of the noble merchant houses are going to end up in the hands of third children or second cousins. Do you think it's possible what you said? 
that the Night Masters killed my father for opposing the use of the golems on the nobles? It makes a certain amount of sense. But then, so do a lot of other scenarios, Alias said, as she laid another log on the fire. Your father might have wanted to use the golems on the nobles to consolidate his grip as Kroemark. The Night Masters might have realized he was using them and, fearing he would betray them, destroyed him. What I can't figure out is why the Night Masters went to so much trouble to be sure we found your father's body, but then made sure the golem took it away from us. I'm surprised they left his coin mass, too. A piece of magic that powerful? Why didn't they take it from him after they killed him? Victor reached calmly into one of the desk drawers and pulled out an ornate ring, set with a huge black opal. Pushing a tiny nub forced the opal to slide aside, revealing a needle tip with poison. Alias, staring thoughtfully into the fire, did not notice the merchant lord's actions. It was as if they wanted us to discover that your father was the faceless. Did they think I would stop hunting for them if they slew their leader? Unless... Unless what? Victor prompted as he leaned back in his chair. Unless he really wasn't the faceless, and the real faceless wanted to pin it on him, Alias said excitedly. Surely the real faceless couldn't have been killed so easily. He could have them all on the floor in agony with just a spell word. It was one of the faceless's powers. He used it just two, no, three nights ago. But, Victor, that's it. Your father is innocent. They did set him up. They probably planted the key as well. Alias turned suddenly from the fire and looked down at the young nobleman. Victor stood suddenly. You can't be serious, he said. Alias paced before the fire. Durgar said three nights ago he and your father sat up all night balancing their accounts and going over records, right? Victor nodded. Until dawn, when Centaur Erdo came by, Alias continued as she swung about. But, according to Melman, the Faceless was attending a meeting that night with all the Night Masters. Victor seemed to be scowling, unable to understand what she was saying. Don't you see? Your father could not be the Faceless or even a Night Master, Alias explained, because he was not at that meeting. He was with Durgar. Are you sure of the night of the meeting? Victor said with an anxious tone. Melman could have lied about the night or you might have misheard him. No problem, Alias said. We'll get Durgar to do a detect lie spell and ask him again. Ask, Victor gasped. Ask him? He's alive? You've captured one of the Night Masters alive? Yes, Alias said. I told you I got the key to the Faceless's last lair from him. Victor looked aghast. I thought you'd stolen it. I mean, that that halfling Ruskettle acquired it for you. Why didn't you tell me, he demanded. Alias sighed. When we talked about it before, she explained, I was afraid your father was a night master, maybe even the faceless, and I thought you might be passing information on to him, innocently, of course. Then, too, I knew you might not approve of the arrangement I'd made with Melman. I agreed to let him go, providing he told me everything he could, and providing he wasn't lying. Victor looked stricken. So where is Melman now? Alias looked slightly guilty. He told me all he knew, and it checked out. By now, he's on a boat bound for Cormier. But we could have Mintassin meet him in Cormier and bring him back for something as important as clearing your father's name. Victor nodded thoughtfully. It shouldn't be too hard to find a branded Nightmaster, he mused aloud. Alice nodded in agreement, then paused. How did you know Melman was branded? Victor opened his mouth and closed it. Didn't you mention it? he asked, perplexed. Alias frowned, reviewing in her perfect memory every conversation she'd had with Victor concerning Melman. She'd said the Faceless had branded someone, but not who. No, I'm certain I didn't, she said. Victor crossed to where Alias stood and laid a warm hand on her shoulder. My love, I have my own sources. What sources? Alias demanded. Victor, I have to know. You can't keep hiding things from me. Alias, I have other friends besides you who have been investigating the Night Masters for me, but I can't reveal their names. You have to trust me. You do trust me, don't you? Alias was about to assure him that she did when she looked up into his eyes. There was something calculating there, and the words died in her throat. Dragonbait's warnings came back to her immediately. 
She thought, too, of Kimball. The former assassin had been at the ball, but had avoided the Gollum rampages, then returned to the castle and sat quietly at the fireside, prepared for Victor's return, unruffled by the affairs of the evening. She was suddenly overly conscious of Westgate's reputation for intrigue and betrayal. "'Of course I trust you,' she managed to say, but she knew her voice sounded hollow. Victor took her glass of Evermead from her hands and sipped at it. "'We need to be careful in the next few days,' the noble said, his eyes pinning her in place. "'After all that has happened, the city is going to be full of rumors and unrest. I think we should tell the people that we've found the faceless, that he's dead. It will help settle things down more quickly.' There was something hypnotic about Victor's voice, and Alias had to shake herself to throw off its influence. She raised a hand to touch Victor's cheek, trying to reassure him of her loyalty, even as she argued with herself. Victor, a lie like that is a two-edged sword. It can help you at first, but in the end, it can cut you in half. We have to tell the truth, that we found your father murdered wearing the Faceless's regalia, but that the Faceless may still be at large. As you wish, Victor purred. He bent his face down and pressed his lips against her own, but there was nothing gentle or warm in his kiss. It was indifferent and brief. A farewell kiss to a dismissed lover. Alias grabbed at the nobleman's sleeve. Now is the time to pursue the faceless even harder, she said, still anxiously trying to convince him she was right. He must think he's safe, having framed someone else. He's likely to get careless. Victor slashed the back of his hand across her face, tearing at her flesh with a spiked ring much like the one sported by the extortionist little boy. Alias gasped as a searing pain streaked down her left cheek. The adventuress jerked away from the nobleman and tried to draw her sword from its scabbard, but her muscles failed her. The sword felt as heavy as lead, and her hand spasmed uncontrollably, so she could not grip the hilt. The poison on the ring was quick acting. Her face her throat, and her arm burned with an inner fire. The room seemed to sway like the deck of a tempest-tossed ship. Alias tried to focus on Victor, who stood there sipping the Evermead from her glass. Despite her swollen tongue, she managed to slur out the words, Victor, why? Victor laughed harshly as he set down her emptied glass. I gave you the chance to lie for me, but you could not do so, could you, my darling? It's just as well. You make a better legend than lover. Besides, I really don't feel like sharing my city with anyone. Victor chuckled some more, amused by her feeble jerking steps in his direction. When her knees gave out beneath her, the nobleman stepped forward to catch her, his eyes sparkling with a sick delight. You poor dear, he said, looking into her wildly dilated eyes. You serve me so well, but I'm going to have to let you go. Still, I ought to thank you properly for all your help. He kissed her with a cruel passion, ignoring the way her body twitched and spasmed from the poison running through her veins. He was possessed with a feeling of absolute power, like a vampire in a bloodlust. He didn't pull away from her until he felt sated, sated on the control he'd taken of her emotions, of her actions, of her very life. By then, although the swordswoman was still twitching slightly, her breathing was shallow and irregular. It was only a matter of time before the poison reached her heart and stilled it in an icy grip. Victor lifted the swordswoman, a little surprised at how heavy her dead weight was. He carried her from the library, through the main hall, then down a narrow spiral stairs to the wine cellar. He pushed on a bottle of wine and a section of wall slid away, revealing a hidden passage. At the other end of the passage was a secret room. Kimball was waiting there, in the company of two prisoners shackled at the neck, wrists, and ankles to a thick iron post in the center of the room, Dragonbait and Mintassin. The Sariel had been muzzled. The sage wore a disjointed, idiot's expression on his face, and his tongue lolled out of the side of his mouth. The lizard paladin lunged toward Victor, hissing through his iron muzzle but he was halted by the iron collar around his throat. The sage fixed Victor with a desperate look and gibbered in a high voice. Kimball lifted an eyebrow at the appearance of the noble's burden. Is she dead? he asked curious. Not yet, Victor replied as he laid the swordswoman down on a work table. 
He smiled gleefully as Alias shuddered. To what do we owe the honor of Mintassin's company, he asked. He spotted me carrying off the Sario, the assassin explained, but he fumbled his ambush attempt. I had someone from the Temple of Mask place him under a feeble mind spell until you decide what to do with him. The sage gibbered hysterically, beseeching the nobleman with his clouded eyes. Victor turned from the figure in cold disgust. You'll have to kill him. You can destroy the lizard too, now that we are finished using his mistress. Make sure none of the bodies are found. No one is going to believe all three just left town, Kimball pointed out. Victor peered down at Alias. He stroked the tattoo on her sword arm. Have her lovely arm wash ashore at low tide, clutching a domino mask. Nice and ambiguous. The Faceless can reassure the Nightmasters that he was responsible for the death of their foe, and Lord Victor can tell his people that a victory has been struck against the Nightmasks, albeit at a great cost, the death of his love, the hero Alias. I won't need to keep up the worried lover act. I can go straight to being the morning lover. So much more sympathetic. See to the details. Yes, my lord, Kimball replied. This one may last a while yet, he noted, staring down at Alias, who still drew gasping breaths. Well, I've dismissed her. She's no longer in House Dostar's employ, so she's yours to play with, Victor said. Just not here. Be a good flunky and make sure she expires someplace where her vengeful spirit can't haunt me. When you're finished taking care of the bodies, loot the sage's workshop. Do it legally. Kick Jamal out on the street. With Mintassin gone, we can take care of her at our leisure. And what will you be doing, my lord? I'll be sleeping. I'm worn out from my battles at the ball, Victor said with an evil chuckle. He left Kimball alone in the workshop with the prisoners. The assassin could hear his master's voice drift down the spiral staircase. The merchant lord was singing the jaunty tune he'd learned from Alias. For all of their dancing, posturing, prancing, they'll fight with their backs to the wall. Till then they are eating and drinking and meeting, their battles are fought at the ball. Chapter 20 Stirring the Ashes The next afternoon found Olive Ruskettle slipping through the alleys of Westgate, her spirit deeply troubled. The light of day and the official proclamations from the tower had done little to clear her confusion. She needed to speak with Jamal. The actress often helped her get her thoughts straight, even as she was plying the halfling for information. Olive was about to step out on the main road and cross the street to Mintassin's house when she spotted the symbols on the cobblestone. There were two of them, scrawled in charcoal. In a most inexpert manner, but there was no doubt about their meaning. The first symbol was used by harpers to mean danger. The second symbol was used by thieves to mean danger. Both were aligned to indicate Mintassens. Olive stood in the shadow of the alley, studying all the approaches to the sage's house. In a few moments, she spotted Kel lurking in a doorway down the street. The halfling moved out into the main street, striding in the boy's direction without looking at him. She stopped by the door, pretending to study a slip of paper for an address. You put out those symbols, Kel? She asked without looking at the boy. Yeah, Jamal taught me to write them. Did it right, didn't I? Did it fine, the halfling assured him. What's up? Supposed to warn Jamal's friends not to come by. Dostar's spider Kimball's taken over the house. Tossed Jamal and me out. Jamal's up at Blaze House. Thanks. Keep up the good work, the halfling said. She kept going, then slipped down the next alley to make her way to Blaze House. At the hostel, Mercy escorted her two flights up to a guest room far smaller than Alias's and Dragonbait suite. The room was cluttered with Jamal's costume wardrobe, puppets, and theater props. Jamal was seated at a table, scribbling furiously in a small black book. I was hoping you'd come by, the actress said. What's going on? Olive demanded. I thought you could tell me, the actress said in exasperation. She blotted the ink in her book and slipped it back into the bottom of her jewelry box. 
That worm Kimball came by Mintassens this morning with an officious-looking scroll claiming House Dostar is supposed to oversee Mintassens' estate in the sage's absence. It had Mintassens' seal on it, and Kimball had seven large Dostar guards with him, so I wasn't in a position to keep myself from being thrown out on the street. I left Kel to warn off my friends. I don't want all my contacts running into Kimball or vice versa. The manager of Blaze House is willing to let me stay here for a while. Where are Alias and Dragonbait? Olive asked. Jamal shrugged. No one saw Alias and Dragonbait return last night. But Mercy says Alias's armor is missing. I guess Alias came back for it before going back out to hunt more night masks. I'm used to Mintassin disappearing into the night for weeks on end, but I'll confess I'm getting a little nervous that Alias and Dragonbait haven't returned. What happened at the meeting of the merchant nobles this morning? Durgar recapped the events of last evening, giving us the final tally of the dead, Olive reported. The heads of houses Goldar, Sem, Thalavar, Erdo, and Vamos were killed by the Night Mask's iron golems. Houses Sem, Erdo, and Vamos also lost their recognized heirs. The Crowmark wasn't at the ball, but Durgar claims that a golem got him anyway and carried his body into the sea. Then Lord Victor says that his hireling Alias, with her companions Dragonbait and Mintassin, found a clue last night that led them into the sewers to search for the Faceless. Finally, at Durgar's suggestion, the heads of the merchant houses, mostly inexperienced cousins and youths, unanimously voted Victor Dostar in as interim Crowmark. They're supposed to make an official proclamation tomorrow, after the funerals. Durgar said a golem killed Lord Dostar? Jamal asked. Olive nodded. Yes. Why? I think it's time we throw all our cards on the table and see if we come up with a full deck, Jamal suggested. I've got a source in the watch who says they found the faceless dead, stabbed in the ribs. Durgar unmasked him, and it was Lord Dostar. But Durgar has ordered the watch to keep mum about it. Olive laughed. Making all Lord Victor's hard work in vain, Victor Dostar knew his father was the faceless. He's been feeding Alias clues, hoping she'd unmask Lure for him. Then the nobles would be disgraced by the knowledge that the faceless turned out to be their own elected Crowmark, and they'd have to pick a candidate popular with the people. Alias? Jamal asked in astonishment. No, Olive corrected. The noble responsible for hiring her. The noble who's wearing her token, Victor Dostar. Well, that's how it ended up anyway, the actress said. Not exactly, the halfling replied. The nobles haven't been disgraced, and they've only made Lord Victor interim Crowmark. If anything, the Night Mask's attack last night has made people feel more sympathy for the nobles. No kidding, Jamal said. I tried a puppet show this morning portraying the nobles as sheep running from the wolf. It was not well received. You should have known better than to kick a dog when it's down, Olive retorted. Even I make mistakes, the actress replied with a shrug. So Lord Victor was planning to turn on his own kind and reveal all, but Durgar stopped him. If we could get him out from under Durgar's influence, he might prove useful. A noble who cares what the people think. The only one Victor Dostar cares about is Victor Dostar, Olive snapped. He was manipulating Alias into uncovering the faceless. He manipulated Durgar into proposing him as the new Crowmark, and, given half a chance, he'll manipulate you and anyone else in Westgate fool enough to support him. He doesn't just want to be Crowmark, he wants to be king. Jamal raised an eyebrow in surprise. Never happened, she replied. Not in Westgate, not after Verovan. No one will ever go for it, not the merchant lords and certainly not the people. Wrong, Olive retorted. If the people start clamoring for it and the merchant lords are weakened, they might have no choice. The people don't want a king. They want to rule themselves, Jamal argued. Jamal, I've studied you humans for years. Humans don't want to rule themselves. Only a few humans want to bother with the mess it takes to rule themselves. The rest want to be left alone. Your average Westgate citizen wants the night mass taken care of, but for over 15 years, they've been waiting for the merchant nobles to handle it. 
Some of them look at a nation like Kormeyer, with a king who's managed to purge the land of assassins and who exiles convicted thieves, and they think maybe the gods favor monarchies. Should a popular candidate come along, some of them might start dusting off Rovan's regalia, the halfling concluded. Jamal looked for a moment as if she might explode. Olive knew she'd just called into question a basic tenet of the actress's beliefs. A moment later, though, Jamal sighed. Just because people won't take charge of their own lives doesn't mean they can't, she argued. I'm not saying that, Olive replied. Well, you may be right about the king thing, the actress conceded. I have heard people talking about a Zune of Kormeyer as if he were the god's gift to the people. Are you sure about Victor Dostar, though? Alias seemed to think he was all right. Even Alias makes mistakes, something I intend to correct just as soon as she and Dragonbait get back from the sewers, Olive said. In the meantime, Lady Nettle's dying request was that I protect her granddaughter. House Thalavar lost three halfling bodyguards to the golems last night. So I've spent the last twelve hours not letting Thistle Thalavar out of my sight. I think the girl was getting tired of me. After making all the arrangements for her grandmother's funeral, she locked herself in the study to go over House Thalavar's account books and Lady Nettle's personal journal. I should be getting back to Castle Thalavar to keep an eye on visitors offering their condolences. When Alias gets back, you'll hear from me, Jamal promised. It was nightfall before the actress sent Kel around with a message for the halfling. But all the notes said was that Alias had not returned, and neither had Dragonbait nor Mintassin. Olive penned a reply that Jamal should sit tight. The sewers were vast. It might take a little more time to explore them. The halfling did her best to keep from sounding worried when she handed the message to Kel. Thistle finally came out of her grandmother's study for supper. Olive pressed her for permission to hire more bodyguards. The young girl fingered her grandmother's brooch like an amulet, then nodded her agreement. The next morning brought a similar note from Jamal. Alias had not returned, but a fisherman had relayed a rumor that Alias was seen battling a fire elemental in the plaza around the west light. Jamal had checked with the watch stationed around the lighthouse, only to learn that some itinerant wanderer had started a trash fire by the water to keep herself company. That afternoon, after Lady Nettle's funeral, one of the Thalavar halflings returned to the castle with the rumor that the Faceless was holding court in a tavern in Gateside. With Thistle again locked in the study with her account books, Olive hurried down to the tavern in question, but discovered only an outlander in a heavy cloak. He was not holding court, only recruiting bodyguards for a caravan going south and he kept his face covered with the hood of his cloak to hide a particularly ugly scar received from brigands. Olive spent the afternoon interviewing halflings to serve as guards for the castle, for the warehouses, and, most especially, for Thistle. While she found several sturdy, sensible recruits worth training, no one with any real combat experience came forward. By evening, Jamal sent another negative note. The adventurers had not returned. A beachcomber down by the river claimed to have seen Dragonbait battling the Quelzarn in the water below the bridge. After interviewing the witness, Jamal had concluded he was into his third tankard of ale and was seeing anything the actress could suggest to his vivid imagination and besotted brain. The third morning after the ball brought a new rumor to the servants' quarters of Castle Thalavar. The Faceless was dead. Nightmask activity was so low for the past two days, people had begun to believe that perhaps the Nightmasks were in mourning for their leader. Speculation was rife that perhaps one of the deceased nobles had been the lord of the Nightmasters. Olive wondered if Victor had had a hand in spreading the rumor. Kel appeared at the Thalavar Castle Gate right after breakfast. Olive realized he brought something more than rumor. The boy had been crying. This time he hadn't brought a note. Jamal's at the old beard, he reported. She says, come now. Still crying, Kel ran off. Olive arrived at the tavern near the river, just as House Dostar's massive carriage was pulling away. People were pouring out of the tavern. Olive hurried inside. Jamal was sitting at a table looking pale and shaken. What is it? the halfling asked. A fisherman found it near the Athigdal docks, Jamal explained. 
where the thun runs into the harbor. Found what? Olive demanded. Alias. Alias, her... Oh, gods! The actress broke into sobs. Olive looked up at the tavern's host. It was an arm, the man explained, covered with a tattoo of thorns and waves, with a rose at the wrist. I found it floating in the water, a young fisherman said. It weren't chewed up or anything. Someone had hacked it off at the shoulder. It had a domino mask clutched in its hand in a death grip. Where is it? Olive demanded through clenched teeth. Cromark Victor took it, the tavern owner said, wept over it like it were the lady herself, wrapped it up in a piece of velvet and said it would be laid to rest in the Dostar family crypt in honor of her service to the Cromark. Olive nudged Jamal to her feet, anxious to get her away from the somewhat crowded tavern. As they walked down the street, Jamal explained, I sent Kel as soon as I heard. I thought you might be able to tell for sure. Tell if it were hers. You said it was a magic arm. You could tell if it were a fake, couldn't you? Maybe, Olive said. Why'd you let Dostar take it? He was weeping. He asked the fishermen and the people in the tavern if they would let him take it. No one could turn him down. If he's really as bad as you say, he's the best actor in Westgate, the actress said. I don't think I could show more grief than he did. If you're not careful, he'll make your troop obsolete, the halfling snarled. If rumors flew before, now they teleported from place to place. Some said that the severed arm meant that Alias had battled the night masks and lost. Others insisted that the fact that the arm's fist clutched a domino mask meant she had won, even though it had cost her her life. A third faction held that she, her companions, and all the night masters, including the faceless, had never fought at all, but had just been eaten by the Quelzarn. Olive told herself Alias could have survived losing her arm. Dragonbait and Mintassin might be with her even now. It was impossible, though, to come up with a reason why they didn't return, why Mintassin didn't just teleport them back to his home to reassure their friends that they were safe. Olive's hope began slipping away. Five days after the ball, Olive Ruskettle, captain of the House Thalavar Guard, self-declared bard and self-declared harper, was making a half-hearted attempt to drink herself to death. She sat on the open patio of the Black Eye Tavern, with its excellent view of the market and the tower. Three days had passed since the funerals of the Cromark and the other felled merchant lords. The official period of mourning completed, the market was once again blanketed by a tapestry of motley, the wares of both minor and noble merchants being offered for sale. That, if no other reason, was enough to keep all of ordering round after round of a highly potent southern drink known as Dragon's Bite. She was disgusted by the way this city shrugged off its losses and returned diligently to the task of making money. There had been no funeral for Alias, Dragonbait, or Mentassin, no official period of mourning for the heroes who had so selflessly risked their lives for this town of money-grubbing greengrocers. Not that three days of mourning could be enough to honor adventurers of their caliber, adventurers who'd been her friends. She wanted to blow this fest hall of a city, to leave it to fester in its own greed, to head north where adventurers weren't treated like carpets for merchants to wipe their feet on. Still, Westgate held her in its thrall. She had business here still. First, of course, she felt obligated to honor Lady Nettle's dying request to protect Thistle. Lady Nettle had been really decent. She would have made a good halfling. As for Thistle, Olive had actually grown to like the human child. She was a serious, hard-working girl, something Olive admired without actually emulating, of course. Three days of interviewing the halfling population of Westgate and even some of the humans had left Olive with the certainty that there was really no one else as qualified as she was to be the girl's bodyguard. Yet Thistle had walled herself up with her books, and there wasn't much challenge in guarding a hermit. Olive had whiled away hours outside the door of Thistle's study, reorganizing every aspect of security for House Thalavar, its castle, its warehouses, its stockyards, and its docks. The halfling was distracted to the point of madness, waiting for the night masks to renew their vengeful attacks. But the thieves' guild really did seem to be on hiatus. Thistle Thalavar, 
her castle, and all her property remained undisturbed. The tension was enough to drive a halfling to drink. Olive drained her glass and thumped it on the tabletop, demanding a refill. House Thalivar would pick up the tab, making it possible to order drink after drink without plunking any money down or keeping track of how much one spent on liquor. Olive wasn't sure that was a good thing, but it was certainly a comforting one. Her second order of business in Westgate was what to do about the new Croamark, Victor Dostar. When the evil mage Flattery had disintegrated her friend Jade, Olive had wasted no time avenging Jade's death. Of course, then she'd had some formidable allies. G.O.G. Wyvern Spur, who could shape change into a wyvern. The mage, Cat. And the wizard, Drone. Here, her only allies were an aging actress, a boy who had only just retired from his career as a night mask, and a castle full of pampered halflings. Then there was a question of popularity. No one had liked flattery. All agreed he was a sick menace to society. Victor Dostar, though, was a slick piece of work, friendly, smiling, concerned. Whatever emotion or reaction was appropriate to the situation, he could summon it to the surface. Even Alias had been fooled. Malil's mouth, he even had meat charm that first day, Oliver called. On top of all that charm, he was Cromark. While he was not quite a king, Plotting his destruction certainly smacked of regicide, a serious crime, even in a place like Westgate. More importantly, without more information, she couldn't really assess the extent of Victor's guilt. He might not have anything to do with Alias's death. The swordswoman was, after all, always taking risks. The Nightmasters might have destroyed her whether or not Victor Dostar was a nice guy. Victor could just be a selfish, power-hungry jerk who used Alias. The world was full of them. Olive fumed whenever she thought of the way he'd carried off the swordswoman's arm, as if he owned it. Victor Dostar was definitely one more reason to drink. A pottery mug of dragon's bite hovered at eye level, carried by a slim female halfling about half Olive's age. The younger woman was dressed like a Lauren schoolteacher, in a long black divided skirt and a starched white blouse buttoned tight at the wrists and to the top of its high collar. Her reddish blonde hair was twisted into a severe bun at the back of her head. She wore a bitter, no-nonsense expression on her severely angular face, which Olive thought might actually stop a beholder in its tracks, if beholders could leave tracks. You're drinking too much, the younger halfling said, setting the mug down none too gently. She sat down at the table across from Olive. Never would have guessed, Olive snarled, taking a long pull on the fresh mug. She glared across the table at the new arrival until it became clear that her guest was not going to politely evaporate. Was there a shift change? Are you my new waitress? she asked. I'm not a waitress, the newcomer informed her. You're Olive Ruskettle, she said, not really questioning, but not quite certain either. Maybe, Olive muttered. And you're employed by House Thalivar. Maybe, Olive said with a sigh. She took another gulp of her drink. And you were a friend of Alias of the Inner Sea, said the other halfling. Olive slammed her mug down hard. What in the abyss do you want, child? The other halfling blinked for a moment, as if shocked by Olive's outburst. Finally, she replied, My name is Winterheart. I met Alias last summer in the Dale Lands. I understand she is dead and you were her friend. Please accept my condolences. I am also seeking employment. I have spent most of my days as an adventuress, so I have little experience as a servant. But Alias said I could use her as a reference. Does House Thalivar have use for a capable halfling? Olive seethed silently. The friend of the dead trick was an old halfling con. She was insulted that someone thought she was good enough to play it using Alias's name, and insulted that anyone thought her fool enough to fall for it. You were a friend of Alias, too, hmm? We met and talked, Winterheart responded calmly. I was impressed by her. I am truly sorry she is dead. Well, Olive thought, at least she's smart enough not to claim that Alias was an old friend from way back. Aloud she asked, And you knew her from the Dale Lands? Yes. 
Winterheart's head bobbed just a tad. Then you know what song she first sang in the tap room of the Old Skull Inn, Olive said offhandedly. It was the Standing Stone, Winterheart said, displaying the first trace of a smile. An old elven tune with words by Finder Wyvernspurn, the nameless bard. That was an easy one. You want to ask what her favorite color was? Her favorite color was blue, Olive lied, waiting for Winterheart to take the bait. Red, Winterheart corrected. Blue reminded her of her tattoo, which she thought of as a symbol of her previous enslavement. Shall I tell you how she first met Elminster, or how she nearly skewered Geogi Wyvern Spur, or in which boot she kept her throwing dagger? Olive smiled, delighted to be convinced of something for a change. What is it you can do, Winnie? she asked. The name is Winterheart, and I prefer Miss Winterheart, the younger halfling corrected. I would make a suitable lady's companion. I am trained in human customs and dress. I am also skilled with the sword, dagger, and bow, and can provide protection for the young mistress. Olive looked with some surprise at Winterheart. Think fast, she snapped and threw her half-full mug at the younger halfling. Miss Winterheart dodged slightly to her right, her left hand snaking up and staring the mug by its handle. She set it down smoothly without spilling a drop and slid it back in Olive's direction. Olive's reflexes were too deadened by drink to stop the mug in time. It slid into her lap, drenching her with its contents of liquor-laced ale. Olive stood up and cursed. Drinking is a filthy habit, Winterheart declared. I have no truck with it. Olive cursed some more as she tried unsuccessfully to brush the liquid from her leggings. And bad language is another thing, Winterheart added primly. Foul words lead to foul deeds. Olive did not reply. She studied Winterheart as carefully as she was capable of in her inebriated condition. The girl had fast reflexes and a strong will. If she was telling the truth about being skilled with weaponry and proved to have a modicum of halfling sense, she might be just the sort of woman suitable to take over as Thistle's bodyguard. There was something else about Winterheart that impressed Olive. It was not the woman's sobriety and primness, but what Olive sensed or imagined she sensed lay behind those traits. Winterheart had been hurt somehow in the past, and she held herself tightly in check so that she didn't fall apart. It didn't make her a powerful ally, but it meant she had just the sort of strength Olive lacked. Nothing Olive realized could take away the pain of Alias's death. With Winterheart behind her, however, Olive knew she would find the courage to avenge the swordswoman's death. She would make the night masks pay for Alias's murder, and if she found out Victor Dostar was involved, she would make him pay too. Had Olive been sober, such an unrealistic goal might never have occurred to her. She was far too cautious. She was not sober, though, and she saw in Winterheart not just a halfling seeking employment, but a sign from the gods. Mistress Ruskettle, do you have an answer for me? Winterheart demanded. Olive smiled grimly at the other halfling. All right, she agreed. I'll give you a trial period, but I'll be watching you like a hawk. Miss Winterheart nodded. I don't fear being watched, Mistress Ruskettle. As for trials, Winterheart's eyes focused on something in the distance, and her voice trailed off as she spoke. I am quite used to trials, she said. Olive watched the younger halfling's gaze as it followed the progress of the new Cromark's carriage away from the tower. Some trials are more difficult to bear than others, Olive muttered, though she spoke not to Winterheart, but for her own benefit. Blast them all to Bator! Lord Victor thundered as he strode into the main hallway of Castle Dostar. He threw his cloak at the footman. The butler appeared briefly, but upon seeing the look on his master's face, he retreated back into the servants' quarters, unwilling to deal with the young lord unless called upon to do so. Victor stormed into the library, where Kimball was calmly reviewing piles of Mentassin's books and scrolls. In the center of the table hovered a glowing sphere that the assassin had stolen from Blaze House when he'd retrieved the swordswoman's armor. "'Difficult day running the city?' Kimball queried as he rose and crossed to a sideboard. He poured a generous amount of Evermead into a glass and carried it to his master. 
Victor had thrown himself in a chair and sat there brooding. I think this land was once completely forested, the Cromark muttered. Then the bureaucrats invented paperwork. He took the glass of Evermead, gulping it down like water. There is a form for everything, sometimes two forms, on occasion three, and gods forbid you sign anything without reading it, or else some clan might receive a windfall, and the other clans will start screaming for your blood. And while you're reading every bloody piece of paper the city clerks put in front of you, the other clans are robbing you blind since you haven't got the time to address your own business. Why can't they just learn to shut up and follow my orders? That's why they made me Cromark, after all. Interim Cromark, Kimball corrected softly. Maybe I didn't kill enough of them, Victor mused. Any charges we can trump up against one or two of them? Make an example of them to keep the others in line? Most unwise, Kimball replied. It would be bad for business, and the reaction of those remaining would be distrust rather than fear. These are not nightmasters, but nobles, and even the young and inexperienced ones have believed all their life that power is their right. Besides, you already eliminated the most likely candidates. The irony, Victor snarled, is that I've kissed up to them for years to assure myself this rotten job, only to discover that I have to keep kissing up to them to keep it. We need a monarchy around here. I'm tired of all this open rebellion. He turned to Kimball sharply and asked, did you recover my mask? Kimball nodded. Durgar stashed it in a desk drawer, no doubt unable to come to grips with having covered up Lord Dostar's infamy. I replaced it with a stage prop of Jamal's, which I looted from Mintassin's lair. It may be some time before Durgar realizes it's not the genuine article, and, of course, I knew you'd appreciate the irony. Victor allowed himself a smile. Good old Durgar. There's some more irony. I think I impressed him, arguing that we should tell the truth about father. But Durgar was so anxious to preserve the established order that he concealed all father's crimes. An unsettling thought occurred to the young lord. You don't think he doubts if father was the faceless, do you? He does not appear to be pursuing the matter, Kimball replied, pulling a heavy tome from the pile and opening it to a page marked with a red ribbon. Now this is fascinating the assassin said as he perused the page. A fortuitous coincidence, no doubt, considering your interest in monarchy. What? Victor said. Kimball motioned for the crow mark to come and look. With some annoyance, Victor rose from his lethargic sprawl. He leaned over the tome, which had of late belonged to the sage Mintassin. The book was quite old, its cover cracked and frayed, its binding nearly disintegrated, its pages loose covered in ornate sweeping script. The writing is elvish and dates back to the last days of King Verovin, Kimball explained, but Victor held up a hand to silence him. I can see that for myself, the noble snarled. You know, father insisted I learn all the subhuman languages. The better to trade with them, he would say. Victor frowned with concentration as he poured over the text. This describes the procedures and protocols of King Verovin's court. I direct you to the fourth paragraph, Kimball said, on the right-hand page. Hmm. Victor ran his finger along the script, mouthing the word silently, too self-conscious to translate aloud in front of the assassin. It's about Verovin's treasure hoard, he whispered excitedly. It's under, no, tucked away in an interdimensional demiplane, guarded by a portion of the king's own soul. Planes and dimensions were a specialty of young Mintassins, Kimball remarked. At the top of Verovin's castle, there is a portal into this plane, Victor translated. Matches the common folklore, Kimball said. Verovin's castle, that would be Castle Vamos now, wouldn't it? How terrible that the population of House Vamos was decimated by the Iron Golems. The new lord of the castle is still, I believe, on business in Waterdeep leaving the castle prey to all sorts of thieves. I presume the new Cromark will want to step in and offer to protect this landmark until the new lord's return. The key to open the passage to the demiplane is described as a copper feather, Victor said. The new Cromark would need such a key before he tried anything so blatant. What's this scrawl in the margin? I believe that is a notation of the late 
unlamented mintassin, Kimball said dryly. But what does it say? Lily netted? Why do sages always have such awful handwriting? Kimball bent over the book, peering at the notation. I believe it says, Lady Nettle. The symbol of House Thalavar is a green feather, and the Thalavars are distant relatives of the Verovan line, Victor said excitedly. Copper patina is green. Doesn't... Didn't Lady Nettle always wear some kind of a garish green brooch? You don't suppose they buried it with her, do you? Kimball shook his head. I believe Lady Thistle is now in possession of it. She was wearing it at her grandmother's funeral. King Verovan's treasure hoard. Victor laughed with fiendish glee. The loot gathered from a lifetime of sucking Westgate dry. Why, the gold alone would be sufficient to build a small empire, and the key hangs on dear little Dervish's bosom. That sweet young girl who's been left all alone in the world, Victor chuckled nastily. Kimball raised an eyebrow. House Thalavar remains one of the most powerful rival houses. Forging an alliance with Lady Thistle could prove most useful when the Council of Merchants elects the next Crowmark. Victor snorted. Crowmark? Once I charm that key from Little Dervish, I can be king, with or without her support. Although, she could prove very useful, as the swordswoman was useful. She's popular, lovely, can't swing a sword, but at least she's of the proper class. And she is young and impressionable. She could be easily swayed by the interests of a kind and dashing noble, eh? Assuming that said noble wasn't still supposed to be mourning his last love, Kimball noted with a chill tone. I should call on Lady Thistle. We can commiserate with one another over our losses. A girl like that will do wonders to help assuage the sorrow I feel over the death of dear Alias. Chapter 21 New Contracts Kimball insisted it should not appear as if the new Crowmark was singling out Thistle for special attention. He arranged for Victor Dostar to pay a courtesy call on each grieving noble family to express his sympathies. The calls took two full days. House Thalavar had been scheduled last, and Victor came to think of it as a reward for the ordeals he suffered at all the other houses. At each call, one of the ruling survivors buttonholed him with some demand, request, or poorly veiled threat involving the family's continued support. Victor could only shake his head sadly at these people, as if to reprimand them for sullying such a solemn occasion with common business. He was received in the main hall of Castle Thalavar by Lady Thistle herself. The new head of House Thalavar was flanked by a pair of the ever-present halflings that plagued her particular household. Victor recognized the halfling on Thistle's right as Alias's ally, Olive Ruskettle. The halfling's suspicious questions in the faceless's lair remained ingrained in his memory. When he saw the icy look in her eyes, he wished he had thought to include her somehow in the party that had disappeared with Alias in the sewer. The furry-footed creature could have no proof of anything, but that might not keep her from spreading rumors. He reassured himself with the knowledge delivered by Kimball that the halfling seemed to be handling her grief over the swordswoman's death by crawling into an ale keg. The other halfling was a reed-thin, stiff-backed girl dressed in a black gown so austere that she reminded Victor of the deceased Lady Nettle. As if that weren't enough to make him uncomfortable, the halfling's bright green eyes seemed to pierce Victor to his soul looking for any smudge of evil with the relentless nature of a paladin's gaze. The nobleman found himself unconsciously reaching to feel for his amulet of misdirection to be sure he was warded from her penetrating glare. If these two were Thistle's advisors, Victor knew he might have an uphill battle for the lady's affection. Lady Thistle, however, proved to be as charming as her bodyguards were sullen. She was dressed in mourning, but her golden hair shone in the afternoon light, and her face was flushed with excitement. She wore the green feather brooch that had once been her grandmother's. Victor expected Thistle to try to show him how mature she was, and she did not disappoint him. Once she led the crow mark out onto the veranda overlooking the city, she asked if he would prefer tea or wine. 
After the other three visits he'd made today, Victor really felt like wine, and he was really curious to see what effect it might have on Thistle. But the looks on the faces of the halfling bodyguards cooled his desires. He asked for tea. Thistle rang for a servant and ordered a tea tray, then motioned for Victor to take a chair opposite her. The servant who returned with the tea tray politely disappeared back into the castle. But Thistle's two bodyguards remained standing behind her, like attack dogs restrained only by their mistress's will. The talk was irritatingly small, as it always was when dealing with other nobles. It started with stilted condolences on each other's losses, and then shifted to the weather. They discussed in a guarded way their latest shipments in from Thay or caravans from Am. They speculated on whether or not the night mask threat had abated or even disappeared entirely. Thistle expressed the opinion that if it were so, they owed it all to Alias. Victor agreed completely, giving him a chance to appear more aggrieved as he added that he wished the price had not been so high. In the end, to the apparent alarm of both halflings, Victor got what he'd really come for, a dinner date with Thistle for the next evening. Victor rose to leave just as a message arrived for Thistle, so Olive was assigned the task of escorting the crow mark from the castle. Victor paused at the door and turned to the halfling. I know you're hurt by what happened to Alias, he began. Olive scowled. How nice of you to remember her. Victor took a deep breath and pressed on. She knew the risks. And Olive Westgate is in her debt. I want to propose a statue in her honor. Would you like that? Olive was silent for a moment, then added, Lord Victor, have you mistaken me for a child? I'm sorry... I'm afraid I missed something. Olive sniffed. Yes, you did, she agreed coolly. And now I miss something as well, if you'll excuse me. Victor bowed and stepped outside. Olive shut the door firmly behind him. He's sorry, he says, the halfling thought cynically. If I find out he had anything to do with Alias's death, he'll be sorry, all right, she muttered as she stalked down the hall. Even if he weren't involved in Alias's death, Victor Dostar was a vain jackass. Statue indeed. He may have deceived Alias, but he was not going to ensnare Thistle, Olive resolved. Not if she had anything to say about it. Unfortunately, Thistle made Alias's impulsive nature seem positively reasonable. When Olive returned to the veranda, the young noblewoman was in a heated discussion with Miss Winterheart. I felt a little sorry for him, said Thistle. He's like one of those tragic figures in a sad romantic opera. He strives to break up the night masks, yet on the eve of his triumph, he loses both his father and his love. Triumph? Winterheart laughed in an imperious tone that in any other household might have gotten her bounced down the front steps. What triumph? Why, over the night masks, Thistle responded, flustered by Winterheart's attitude. Everyone agrees that since everything is quieted down so, the faceless must be dead and the night masks in chaos. Really? Winterheart exclaimed. Did you think thieves observed a period of mourning? She looked at Olive. Is she old enough to hear about the Grey Claws? She runs House Thalivar. I guess she must be. The Grey Claws, Olive began before Thistle could lose her patience, is the name of the thieves' guild in Tantris. Tantris is a dead magic zone, so murder is just a little more common there than in other cities. Should the Grey Claws Guildmaster meet an untimely demise, as happens every few years in that city, everyone knows about it immediately. There's blood in the streets for weeks, while various factions vie for control of the guild. The Tantrans call it a spell of red weather. I suppose there is a very slight possibility that it's different here in Westgate. It could be that the Faceless ran everything so tightly that his minions are afraid to make a move without him. It's much more probable, however, that the Faceless is still around, Winterheart concluded, and his grip on the night masks is as tight as ever. Thistle considered their assessment silently for several moments. It would be awful if that were true, she said at last. That would mean that Victor lost both love and father for nothing. That poor man... Winterheart gave Olive a frustrated, angry look. The elder halfling shrugged, resigned to the battle to come. It was going to be a fight to keep Thistle away from Victor, 
but Elishi seemed to have a reliably informed ally in the very proper Miss Winterheart. Victor noted that the door closed a trifle fast behind him. Not enough to merit an insult, but enough to make the halfling's point. In a few weeks, he thought, it might be reasonable for the night masks to make a reprisal attack on the halfling who was the friend of the woman responsible for killing their leader. Victor climbed into his carriage and set off for the tower. He didn't know how much longer he could tolerate the interminable paperwork and meetings. He spotted Jamal's street troop giving a performance, and, overcome by an urge to procrastinate, ordered the driver to stop. The faceless lived, at least on stage, though Jamal had replaced her stolen prop mask of coins with a veil of golden fabric. She was ordering her night masks about with a large wooden spoon, ordering them to be still. The night masks would freeze in impossibly ridiculous positions under the faceless's merciless eye. Jamal's faceless would smack an offender for twitching or swaying, and he would go catapulting forward. One night mask tried to surreptitiously pick a fellow thief's pocket, but was spotted and received a smack for his action. The audience, and it was a small one, appeared unimpressed as the faceless put the collected night masks through a precision drill. They dropped to the floor as one and jumped around like frogs while Jamal sounded the beat with the pounding stick. Victor noted that the various puppets representing the noble families were not in use and that there was nothing mentioning the new crow mark, either good or ill. He wasn't sure whether to be pleased by that or not. Jamal might have complained about her eviction from Intassens, but she might also have at least given the new crow mark credit for the relative peace in the city, even if she didn't seem to believe the faceless was deceased. Then up popped a figure wrapped completely in black bandages, save for its right arm, which was bare. The arm was marked with Alias's tattoo and wielded a wooden sword. Jamal's faceless quailed in the presence of Alias's disembodied spirit and sent the night masks out to stop it. The thieves were quickly bested, one after another. Then the spirit chased the faceless himself around the small stage until he tripped. As the villain lay on the ground, the arm pressed the sword into his breast. The shrouded figure cried out, Heroes never truly die, and lunged forward. The faceless shuddered and expired. Scattered board clapping broke out in the crowd, but that did not prevent Jamal and her troop from bouncing nimbly to their feet and bowing to the applause. Victor grinned with delight. Most of the populace was sick of the night masks, bored with dead heroes, tired of Jamal's proselytizing theater. If something happened to Jamal, there would be fewer questions. Of course, destroying potential threats took a low priority with all the other work to be done. With a sigh, Victor signaled his driver to continue on to the tower. There, annoyed at being kept waiting by the crow mark, a Thane representative awaited, a female red wizard who really only wanted to be reassured that trade would continue as it had under Lure's administration. The Thane was followed by a Sembian, various Dalesmen, and representatives of King Azun's court. Each in turn was similarly reassured. One of the surviving old nobles, Mayor Gurm Thorsar, had scheduled an appointment to lecture the Crow Mark on water Davian moneylenders. Victor was afraid he'd fall asleep before he was able to show the old boar the door. After Thorsar came the widow of Centaur Erdo, who was protesting a rumor she had heard that Alias would get a statue when none was being erected for the widow's dear departed husband and sons. Then, when Victor thought his schedule was finally cleared, Durgar arrived with the arrest reports, which required the Cromark's attention due to the delicate nature of some of the arrested persons. As it was, Victor was drained, both mentally and physically, when he finally escaped back to his castle. Yet not even then could he rest. He stood wearily as Kimball bedecked him in his heavy dark robes, tied on the porcelain mask that protected him from magical discovery, and finally covered him with the coin mask, which transformed him into the faceless. With a sigh, Victor stepped up to and then through the mirror in his chambers. The reflective surface parted for him like a pool of still water and deposited him in his latest secret lair. This one lay in a rough-hewn sub-basement beneath the currently empty Vamos Castle. The Nightmasters were as restless as halflings waiting for dinner. 
The irregularities of the days since the ball had strained their self-discipline to the limits. They spoke out of turn, often all at once, questioning his every command, and made demands of their own. They made the nobles in the surface world seem like reasonable, rational beings. For a moment, Victor considered turning his remaining golems loose among them, but only for a moment, for he still needed the night masters to keep the peace among the night masks. Later, he thought, when they've outlived their usefulness. When can we get back to business? Harborside asked. Do you realize how much money I'm losing? Thunside whined. People are saying that which Alias killed you. Why aren't you doing something about it? Noble relations clamored. How do we know you are really the faceless? Can you give us proof? Enforcement demanded. Victor let his frustrations drain away as he embraced his faceless persona. Once again, he was demanding, powerful, and sure of himself. He turned his face toward enforcement. Would you like the same demonstration I gave to Gateside? The faceless queried, a certain amount of amusement creeping into his magically disguised voice. All voices were silenced immediately. The faceless motioned for all to be seated. Alias is dead. Of that you had proof. Perhaps you would like me to leave her arm on this table as a centerpiece for a few weeks. Alias's allies and the Cromark who hired her are also dead. It is hardly my fault that people are fools enough to believe she succeeded in destroying me. Nonetheless, for the moment it suits my plans for people to believe in my demise. The new Cromark is far more pliable than his father was, and he will serve us well. But it is important that his power be more firmly established. Therefore, we will let him take credit for my destruction for the time being. As for how much money you are losing, Thunside, I really don't care. You've earned more wealth in this position than a dragon could hoard in its lifetime. If you could contain your urge to gamble, you would still have all that wealth. And last but not least, Harborside, your business at the moment is to contain your forces. This is essential to your continuing in your current position. I guarantee it will be worth your while. Having poured oil on their turbulent waters, the Faceless pressed on. As a direct result of our success against Alias and her allies, information has come into my hands regarding the treasure hoard of King Verovan. There was a collective gasp, just barely audible but unmistakable. The Faceless smiled. Now he had them by their pocketbooks. Verovan's legendary hoard was the secret fantasy of every thief in Westgate. The young fool Mintassin discovered the secret, the Nightmaster's Lord explained though the sage never investigated it. Just as legend has it, there is a magical gate from the battlements above. Unlike all who have tried before me to locate this gate, I have discovered the location of the key. Once I have that key, Verovan's hoard will be ours to pillage. A murmur of approval rose from the nine surviving Nightmasters, but the Faceless was not finished. He silenced them with a stroke of his hand. When they grew silent, their master continued. I want you to call together your lieutenants, their assistants, and their assistants' minions, along with whatever fighters, priests, and wizards you trust and choose to reward. We will gather in the main hall of Castle Vamos in three nights' time to loot Verovan's horde. Then there will be no doubt that it is the Night Mask who truly rule Westgate. Harborside led a round of applause, which silenced any other questions or doubts. The Night Masters filed out congratulating themselves on their good fortune. Seated on his stone throne, Victor, the Faceless, cradled a heavy head in his hand. It was exhausting managing a city, a family business, a criminal cartel, and a seduction all at once. When he finally had Verovan's treasure, he would turn loose his golems on this nest of thieves. Then there would be nothing standing between him and his eventual empire. Chapter 22 The Gathering Storm Olive's attempts to steer Thistle away from Victor were thwarted by the hardline attitude of her supposed ally, Miss Winterheart. The halfling newcomer, while capable, intelligent, and alert, had to be the most tactless halfling in Farron. Unfortunately, Olive did not discover this flaw until the morning after Thistle's dinner date with Victor Dostar, and by then it was too late. That morning, Olive was headed toward the dining hall, her mind on mushrooms and chicken omelets, when she heard Thistle, angry and strident, shout, 
It is none of your business what Victor and I did last night. All thoughts of breakfast took a back seat to whatever potential disaster was brewing with the mistress of the house. All of veered in the direction of the shout. She spied Thistle seated on the veranda, cornered by an irate winter heart. It is very much my business if it threatens you or your household, Miss Winterheart snapped back, just as Olive stepped outside to join them. Something amiss? Olive asked helpfully, hoping to instill some calm in the air, before the other halflings in the household heard the argument and began gossiping about it. This new halfling of yours, said Thistle, her eyes squinting with annoyance, is prying into my private affairs. Her manner has gone beyond mere halfling cheek and verges on full-fledged impertinence. If Thistle had been standing, Olive was sure she would have stamped her dainty little foot, but she was not, and so Olive was spared that bit of theatrics. She sneaked out to dine with Victor Dostar last night without a chaperone or a bodyguard, Winterheart explained to Olive, and she did not return until well after the midnight bell. I am the mistress of this house. Thistle retorted shrilly. I will not be given a curfew. Of course not, Lady Thistle, Olive agreed. Yet midnight is a little late for a dinner engagement to run, even in Westgate. Surely you can understand how Miss Winterheart must have worried for your safety. There was nothing to worry about, Thistle replied, her voice softening a little. It was just a dinner aboard the Gleason, a farewell banquet for the captain and the officers. Afterward, we climbed up the lighthouse just for the view. That's all. A likely story, Winterheart exclaimed. I beg your pardon, Thistle said with a shocked expression. You heard me, Winterheart replied. He didn't take you up there for the view. He took you up there so he could give you his little speech about how he dreamed of finding Verovin's treasure so he could use it to make Westgate the greatest city in the realms, greater than Waterdeep. How he'll make Westgate safe, fill it with scholars and musicians, irrigate the fields. Thistle startled at the mention of Verovin's treasure, but her tone was as cold as the great glacier when she answered, I do not appreciate my own staff spying on me. How dare you follow us? Did you believe him when he told you he felt he could conquer the world with you by his side? When he asked if he would have the support of a clever, beautiful lady? What did you tell him? Have you given him a token of your esteem? Winterheart asked snidely. The girl reached without thinking to feel the feather brooch pinned to her gown. I find this petty espionage most unappealing, she snapped back, but her face flushed scarlet as she spoke. How else can I be expected to protect you from such a devious scoundrel? Winterheart demanded. Victor, Thistle replied icily, is not a scoundrel. Mistress Ruskettle, I think you should find some other duties for Miss Winterheart. I simply cannot tolerate her as a lady's maid. The girl rose and strode imperiously back into the castle. Olive surveyed Thistle's untouched breakfast tray and plucked a piece of bacon from the plate. She crunched on it as she thoughtfully appraised Winterheart. The younger halfling glared back at her. How can she be such a fool to fall for that arrogant, conniving green grocer? Winterheart growled. She's a girl, Winterheart, Olive said, picking up a forkful of fried potatoes. Remember when you were a girl? when you argued with your mother about the relative worth or worthlessness of some boy who took your fancy, when you were certain you could take care of yourself without anyone's help, when no one could reason with you? I was never like that, Winterheart argued. Never? I'm beginning to wonder about you, Winterheart, Olive said, and wolfed down the forkful of potatoes. She motioned for the other halfling to follow her down to the lower courtyard, where Kreshmer, one of the few surviving members of Lady Nettle's guard, was drilling the new recruits Olive had hired. Olive pulled two wooden swords off the rack and tossed one to the prim halfling. Winterheart caught the practice weapon smoothly. It's time I assessed your reputed skill with a blade, Olive said. Is this another trial, Mistress Ruskettle? Winterheart asked. No, just a little exercise while we discuss tactics. Olive gave Winterheart's wooden blade a smack with her own. Winterheart responded by weaving her sword warily. I applaud your initiative following Lady Thistle last night, Olive said. I can't, however, say I think much of the way you gave yourself away. She struck a blow aimed at Winterheart's thigh. Winterheart parried the strike easily. Does this mean you will try to convince her ladyship to keep me on as her personal maid? Olive shook her head, parrying a blow of Winterheart's aimed directly at her heart. 
I can't afford to invite censure on myself. Someone's got to undo the damage you've done. Damage I've done, Winterheart squeaked, lunging with her blade at Olive's shoulder. Victor Dostar is the one who will be doing all the damage. That man is a menace, the younger halfling snarled. Agreed, Olive replied, leaping backward to avoid the lunge. If you know I'm right, you have to keep me close to Lady Thistle, Winterheart said, pressing her advantage, lunging again with her blade at Olive's shoulder. Did you see how she blushed when I asked her if she'd given him a token? Did you notice she left the veranda instead of ordering me away? Even she knows I'm right. It doesn't matter who is right to a girl like Thistle, Olive said with a sigh, smacking the hilt of Winterheart's sword away from her body. It matters who makes her feel good about herself. Dostar makes her feel like a woman. You made her feel like a child. You've practically driven her into Dostar's arms. I've got to try to make her feel like a lady before Dostar makes her forget her position. She struck a blow against Winterheart's hip. Winterheart's blade whipped back before Olive had a chance to parry. The tip of the younger halfling's weapon slid across Ruskettle's throat. Olive stepped back and saluted with her practice weapon. You have the drive and the skill and the reflexes, she told Winterheart, but you still have to learn when to pull back. I am assigning you to help Kreshmer drill the new recruits. That would be a better use of your skills, I think. Winterheart glared at Olive. More softly, Olive added, Should you happen to show any more initiative and follow Lady Thistle about, without getting caught at it, or letting her know afterward, that would probably be the best use of your skills. Winterheart smiled slyly and saluted Olive with her own wooden blade. Kimball stood in the center of the Faceless's new lair, turning slowly surveying the contents of the room. From inside his shirt, he pulled out a golden rod and began tapping it against all the magic in his sight, against the remaining iron golems, against the masks worn by the Nightmasters, against the enchanted staves and weaponry hanging on the wall. A tiny spark jumped from the wand each time it touched a magic item. A bell chimed, and Kimball turned to face the magical portal mirror as a figure stepped through and entered the lair. You're late, the assassin noted calmly to the new arrival, a comely halfling dressed very primly. I've been reassigned, Winterheart explained. Ruskettle's got me drilling the Thalavar Castle Guard. You've never seen a sorrier bunch of would-be warriors. I couldn't get away until lunchtime. You aren't eating with the others? Someone might suspect you're not a halfling, Kimball said. It will be over before anyone guesses the truth, Winterheart replied. So, you aren't Lady Thistle's maid anymore? Do you think you'll get a chance to snatch your brooch in your new position? No, but despite my warnings, Thistle is obviously crazy about your master. I'm sure he'll have no trouble sweet-talking her into handing it over to him. He'll probably enjoy that more than receiving it from one of us. An evil chuckle drifted around the pair. <laughs> so true, a disembodied voice agreed. Kimball whirled about. The little golden wand in his hand held out at the ready, but Winterheart stayed his hand. It's only the dragon skull, the halfling woman said. She turned to the corner of the room where the dragon skull sat balanced on an iron tripod, its eyes glowing like hot coals. Hail, Miss Dinar Paradnocles High Draco, the halfling said coolly. Hail, servants of the faceless, Mist replied and chuckled again. And what amuses you so, Kimball asked the creature. I have lost my life, my body, and my freedom, yet I still have my sight, Mist replied. Any dragon's sight is not easily deceived by invisibility, illusion, or other magic. Prove it, Winterheart challenged. Tell me what you know. Very well. You, Miss Winterheart, are no more a halfling than I, but I know what and who you are, Mist retorted. As for Kimball, I think the Faceless would be very interested to know the truth about his magically enslaved assassin. There is a way, however, to ensure my silence. You know what it is. Winterheart nodded. Once the Faceless has obtained Verovan's hoard for the night masks, I will grant you your boon. Victor Dostar sat in his office in the tower, listening to one of the city's accountants explain why the budget for the preceding month had been exceeded by 20,000 gold pieces, but how the deficit for the current month would only be half that amount if the Cromark passed the ore and sale tax. 
Fortunately, the crow mark was delivered from having to deal immediately with the budget nightmare by a knock on the door. Come, the new crow mark called out. A guard entered the room. Excuse me, your lordship. Lady Thistle Thalivar is here. Thank you. Please show her in, Victor said. To the accountant, he explained. I'm afraid my business with House Thalivar is more urgent than this problem. We will have to continue this discussion later. Make another appointment with my scribe. But, your lordship, we need... Dismissed, Victor growled with an expression that would brook no argument. The accountant gathered his books and pens and bowed. He bowed again to Lady Thistle as she entered the room. As the accountant exited, Victor smiled with delight. The Cromark had no appointment with Thistle, but on the off chance she would take it into her head to visit him here. He had left instructions that she be shown up immediately. What service can I do for your ladyship? Lord Victor asked. I can wait if I'm interrupting your work, Thistle began. Lady Thistle, you are the head of one of the leading families of Westgate. I wouldn't dream of keeping you waiting. As he rose from his desk and circled around to stand before the girl, Victor noted how his flattery caused her to straighten with pride. Besides, if I kept you waiting and you left, I would be disappointed that I miss seeing you. He took up the girl's hand and brushed his lips along her fingertips. I've given a lot of thought to our conversation last night, Thistle said. I'm feeling very unhappy that I would not, could not, give you the token you asked for. She touched the feather brooch pinned to her gown. After more careful consideration, I have decided to give you my wholehearted support, and you will have my token tonight. Oh, Thistle, my darling, Victor whispered. He swept the girl up in his arms and kissed her as if she were a woman. Lord Victor, Thistle remarked when the crow mark finally released her, I fear you've mistaken my meaning. Victor stepped back and turned his head away as if to hide his disappointment. Forgive me, Lady Thistle. I thought... I dared hope... Oh, Victor, Thistle whispered, stepping forward and taking the crow mark's hands. It's not that I don't... L that I'm not honored by your declaration. It's only that I meant something different by offering my support. Victor looked the girl in the eyes once more, confusion written on his face. What did you mean, Thistle? I meant I will deliver Verovin's hoard to you, so you can do all you said for Westgate. So you can make it the greatest city in all of Farron. A smile fluttered across the Cromark's face. Oh, Thistle, sweet lady, all that talk of Verovin's treasure, that's just dreams, fairy tales. Some day I will do all those things I spoke of, but when I asked for your support I was thinking more realistically. I was thinking of the kind of support a woman gives a man. Thistle, I love you. I want you to be my wife. Thistle beamed with pleasure, but she was still determined to prove herself. There is no position I'd like more, the girl replied, but I will give you Verovin's hoard. It's not a myth. Meet me tonight at Castle Vamos, and I will prove it. Victor shook his head. Darling, even for Verovin's hoard, I cannot meet you tonight. I must be at the Temple of Gond for the ceremony to initiate apprentices. If I did not attend, it would offend every artisan in the city, not to mention the priests of Gond and probably Gond himself. Thistle laughed. You are so dutiful. Meet me tomorrow night, then. You shall have Verovin's treasure, and you shall have me. Very well, the Cromark agreed. He leaned forward and whispered in the girl's ear. Tomorrow night, I'll let you prove whatever you like. The next morning, Thistle called Olive out to the veranda to join her for breakfast. The lady was watching Kretschmer and Winterheart drilling the castle guard. Marching in formation, the new recruits were beginning to look like a force to be reckoned with. Miss Winterheart is better suited to her new post, I think, Thistle commented. Miss Winterheart tells me you visited Lord Dostar yesterday afternoon, again without an escort, the halfling retorted. She followed me again? Of all the nerve! I want you to dismiss her at once. No, lady, I will not, Olive replied. Before the girl could protest, the halfling pressed on with an explanation. I authorized Miss Winterheart to follow you. I couldn't care less about your courtship of Victor Dostar, but if you're attacked by night masks, there must be someone present to defend you. 
I'm sure Lord Victor would agree with me that your safety is more important than your privacy. Yes, he probably would, Thistle agreed, her tone softening at Olive's assessment of the crow mark. He cares about me. Oh, Olive, he's so wonderful. I wish Grandmother were here. She would be so happy for me. I know she'd approve of my supporting him, don't you think? That all depends, Olive replied. Your grandmother was the most dignified lady I ever met. I think she hoped you would be like her. Are you offering this support in a dignified fashion or like a schoolgirl? Thistle straightened her back as if her grandmother had just chastised her for poor posture. Of course I will offer my support in a dignified fashion, she insisted. Good, Olive replied. Because however wonderful he may be, Victor Dostar is still head of a rival house. What was that thing your grandmother used to say about marrying into rival houses? You can marry into them, but don't offer to cover their losses, Thistle replied. Olive, Lord Victor doesn't need my money, but if he did, I would give it to him because I know he would use it for the good of all Westgate. Olive titched just as Lady Nettle might have done. Don't you halflings have any sense of romance? Thistle snapped with annoyance. Sense and romance, Olive sniffed. Now there are two words that definitely don't go together. Thistle harumphed and stormed off the veranda, just as she had the day before, leaving Olive in complete possession of her breakfast. After assigning duty rosters to the newly trained guards, Olive spent the rest of the day in her room, strumming nervously on her yarding. Try as she might, she could not shake off a sense of impending doom she had, not for herself, but for Thistle Thalivar. The halfling was racking her brain, trying to figure what Victor Dostar's game was. Thistle was a good match for any noble in the city. But men like Dostar didn't care about making a good match, Olive realized. They cared only about power. Jamal came calling on Olive at Castle Thalivar shortly after sunset. There's something very strange going on, the actress reported. Kel says there are all sorts of night masks out tonight. He followed a pair of them down to Castle Namos. He says he thinks they're all holding some sort of war council. Olive set down her yarding and began strapping on her scabbard. At that moment, Miss Winterheart burst into the room. The younger halfling was dressed all in leather and armed for combat with a human-sized sword strapped across her back in the fashion of warriors of the north. Lady Thistle has gone to Castle Vamos, Winterheart reported. But I didn't dare approach too closely. The guards are letting all sorts of unsavory types enter. But I do not think they will let a halfling pass. I know another way in. Follow me. Winterheart turned about and strode off with Olive and Jamal dashing after her. The younger halfling led them to her quarters in the lower regions of the castle. Olive was just wondering if there was some secret passageway Lady Nettle had neglected to mention when Winterheart plunged, like a diver, into a pond, into the mirror hanging on her wall. Olive's startled reflection rippled for a moment, and then was still. I'm probably going to regret this, the older halfling whispered, just before she stepped into the darkness of the mirror. Jamal was left facing her own reflection. There was probably nothing she could do, she told herself. She wasn't much of a fighter, and she doubted very much there would be any call for an actress wherever the mirror took her. Some cheap hero you are, she said, glaring at the aging face glaring back at her. Taking a deep breath, she leaped into the mirror, thinking, I know I'm going to regret this. Darkness seemed to fill the other side of the mirror. After a few moments, however, Olive's eyes adjusted to the dim light cast by a brazier. She stood in the center of an underground cavern containing items removed from the lair of the faceless. Most notable were the remaining iron golems, the empty rack for the masks of the Nightmasters, and the skull of the dragon mist, with the red light spinning in its eye sockets. Where are we? Jamal whispered. In the faceless's newest lair, I guess, Olive replied. Winterheart, how'd you get a magic portal mirror into here? What's going on, woman? Winterheart held up a finger to indicate Olive should wait for a moment. The younger halfling stood before Miss Skull, holding a small golden wand. Your associate is in the chamber above with the Nightmasters and their followers, the dragon skull was saying to Winterheart. 
There are over two hundred night masks waiting for the faceless to lead them to Verovan's horde. Verovan's horde? Olive gasped in astonishment. But were Lady Thistle and Lord Victor? she demanded. Lord Victor has taken Lady Thistle to the top of the Southern Tower, Mist reported. With no idea that her lover is the Faceless, Lady Thistle is showing him how to open the portal to Verovan's treasury. Dostar is the Faceless? Jamal gasped. Of course, Olive said. That explains how he managed to make it look like his father was the Faceless. Miss growled at Winterheart. I fulfilled all my promises to you, warrior. Free me now as you promised, the dragon spirit demanded. Winterheart stepped forward and tapped the golden wand on Miss Disembodied Skull. Rest now, worm, the halfling said. The light spinning about in the skull's eye sockets seemed to flow toward Winterheart's golden wand, then vanished. The bone of the skull crumbled into dust. An eldritch wind blew through the cavern, blowing the dust about in a cyclone. By the glow of the brazier, the dust seemed to take on the shape of a red dragon. Farewell, you red-headed witch, Miss Voice whispered, and farewell to you, Olive Ruskettle. The wind increased, knocking Winterheart to one knee before carrying the dust away to some far plain. Olive had her sword pointed at Winterheart before the other halfling could rise to her feet. You've known all along that Victor Dostar is the Faceless? Of course, Winterheart replied. In the blink of an eye, the prim halfling had drawn her own sword and crossed the blade against Ruskettle's. That's why I led you here, so you could witness his moment of triumph. Chapter 23 Battle with the Night Masks With Winterheart on one knee, Olive pressed her advantage before the other halfling had a chance to demonstrate her superior skill with a blade. Olive circled to Winterheart's left side and lunged with her blade. But the younger halfling switched her sword to her left hand and parried her opponent neatly. Ruskettle, you're making a mistake, Winterheart declared. I'm not working for the Faceless. Oh, no, Olive replied sarcastically. You just have a secret entry to his lair so you can come for tea. As the two halflings faced off against one another, Jamal looked around for something, anything she might use to help Olive fight Winterheart. A two-handed broadsword hung on a wall behind the iron golems. The actress grasped the weapon by its hilt and slid it from the hooks that held it in place. The sword was unbelievably heavy, and Jamal was unable to raise it without her arm shaking from the exertion. Perhaps you would care to try something smaller, Jamal. A man whispered behind her. The actress swung around, trailing the broadsword with her, but unable to raise it to defend herself. Kimball stood in a doorway, eyeing her with cruel amusement. She glared at the assassin who unfastened the scabbard about his waist and tossed it at her feet. Distracted by the sound of Kimball's voice, Olive retreated a step from her opponent, giving Winterheart a chance to get to her feet. Winterheart, Kimball barked, you haven't got time for this. The Faceless is about to address his troops. You'll miss your cue. The assassin retreated through the doorway. Winterheart dashed after him, calling out, Come on, Ruskettle, Jamal, you don't want to miss the fun. She disappeared into the darkness beyond the door. Olive exchanged a confused look with Jamal. Then the halfling raced after Winterheart. Jamal dropped the ridiculously heavy broadsword. She considered for a moment the sword and scabbard Kimball had given her. It could be a trick, but she needed a weapon. I really wish I'd read the script before I jumped into this play, she thought as she followed Olive. On the other side of the doorway, hewn into the bedrock, was a stairway. There were more than a hundred steps, and Olive was breathless when she reached the top. The door was a pivoting section of wall, which someone had propped open with a spike driven into the floor. A tapestry hung over the door on the far side, concealing it from view. With her dagger, Olive poked a hole in a threadbare spot in the tapestry and pressed her eye up close. She looked out on a dais and, beyond that, a cavernous chamber. Once, long ago, this had been the audience chamber of King Verovan, but when the castle had fallen into the hands of House Vamos, it had been converted to a dining hall 
with feasting tables on the dais and in the hall below. Now night masks pack the room, hundreds of them, dressed in costumes as varied as the citizenry of Westgate. There were merchants and priests, sailors and drovers, pickpockets and cutthroats, all wearing domino masks and all of them armed with deadly weapons. All had their attention focused on the dais. Ten figures wearing black robes and half-masks of white porcelain stood on the stairs leading up the dais. Olive recognized one of them as Kimball, despite the mask he wore. A man dressed in a blood-colored robe of velvet stood at the top of the dais. His face was a magical blur of colors. He stepped forward, and a buzzing sound spread through the room as hundreds of night masks realized he was their master. The faceless, Jamal whispered behind Olive. The actress had poked her own eye hole farther up the tapestry. Kimball motioned for silence, and a hush fell over the room. You see, I live while those who oppose me have perished, the Faceless thundered. The magical distortion of his voice, caused by the mask that obscured his features, sent a shiver down Jamal's spine. The nobles oppose me, and they are no more. The Cromark oppose me, and he is no more. The Cell Sword Alias and her companions opposed me, and they are no more. This night I claim rulership of this city and all of you who are loyal to me will be rewarded. A cheer went up from the crowd. Tonight begins a new era for Westgate, the Faceless continued. The treasure of King Verovan is ours to take. At the mention of treasure, another cheer rippled through the crowd. Gold always had a way of rallying the troops, the Faceless thought. He waited patiently for the din to die down. There will be danger, the Faceless warned matter-of-factly. Verovan's treasure lies in another plane, and like most treasure hordes is guarded by creatures that dwell in that plane. Your lives will be at risk, yet your reward will be great. All of you who survive will receive a share of what is looted from the horde. Once that share is yours, you will no longer be criminals, but the wealthiest men and women in Westgate. There was another cheer, but the Faceless cut it off with a sharp motion of his hand. I am the one who made the Night Masks the most powerful guild in the Heartlands. I am the one who destroyed your enemies. I am the one who will lay Verovan's treasure at your feet. But first, you must pay my price. The Faceless paused. The room went silent as each Night Mask worried what that price might be, and each considered what price would be too high. I demand your fealty, the Faceless announced in a sepulchral tone. Not as a crime lord, but as your king. I will make Westgate the greatest empire in the realms, and you shall all share in the riches of that empire. If you share my vision, if you accept my terms, kneel now before me. Like faithful worshippers, the night masks below the dais knelt as a body. The night masters on the steps did not seem certain whether or not they too were required to join in this physical display. But when Kimball knelt, the others followed. If any one of them held a Republican sentiment or inwardly questioned the wisdom of agreeing to so empower an anonymous crime lord, they did not share it with their fellows. All hail the Faceless, Kimball cried, King of Westgate! The Faceless, the crowd shouted, King of Westgate! The Faceless, surprised but very pleased by Kimball's call for the crowd's allegiance, held up his arms and basked in the adulation of the thieves of Westgate. Unfortunately, his moment of glory was followed immediately by an uncomfortable silence as hundreds of night masks grew anxious for their reward and wondered if it was too soon to get off their knees. All hail the faceless, a shrill but clear voice called out from the back of the dais. Master of an honorless, greedy mob, traitor to his duty and family, murderer of his father and his lover. The speaker leaped up on the feasting table behind the faceless so that all could see the red-haired halfling woman in leather armor, Winterheart. The sound of her sword slipping from its scabbard slithered through the length of the hall. She aimed the blade at the faceless's neck. My gods, Olive gasped under her breath, she's going to get herself killed. But if that isn't an entrance to die for, Jamal whispered, I don't know what is. The aura of Puissance momentarily faded from the Faceless as he retreated from the point of the halfling's weapon and nearly took a tumble down the dais steps. Maybe we could grab her and escape down the stairs, Olive whispered. 
She began to pull back the tapestry, but Jamal set a heavy hand on her shoulder and held her back. Wait, the actress whispered. Heroes never truly die, she added with a delighted grin on her face. She's as crazed as Winterheart, Olive thought. The night masks held their breath, waiting to see what their master would do. From behind his mask, the faceless glared with fury at the insolent halfling facing him. It would not look particularly valiant for him to skewer the vermin, but none of his nightmasters showed the least inclination to grab the creature and throw it at his feet. All were no doubt afraid of losing a hand to the steel weapon still pointed in their master's direction. Even more aggravating were the charges the halfling brought. How had she discovered his secrets? He would have to make a joke of her. It was not the dignified beginning he imagined for his reign, but he had to keep her from making further accusations. Did you intend to challenge me all by yourself? The Faceless asked with a tone of amused derision. Miss Winterheart smiled. Well, to tell the truth, I did bring a few friends. Olive's heart leaped to her throat. Surely this crazy halfling didn't expect the three of them to fight a horde of night masks. Did she expect Olive and Jamal to step out from behind the tapestry and make another dramatic speech? Apparently, Winterheart had not been counting just Olive and Jamal among her few friends. The halfling swordswoman gestured to the back of the hall, just as platoons of the City Watch marched toward the back ranks of night masks. The soldiers all wore leather armor and copper helmets and were armed with swords and crossbows. The room rang with the echoes of their boots stomping on the stone paved floor. Durgar the Just stood at the front of his troops in his silver plate armor, carrying his mace like a staff of power. In the name of the Watch, the priest bellowed, I order you to lay down your weapons and surrender. Failure to obey will be met with lethal force. This is your only warning. The night masks, who for years had considered the watch a joke, were not about to surrender to them when the largest treasure they'd ever looted was nearly theirs. The thieves charged first, with their weapons drawn. The front ranks of the watch knelt in a precision maneuver, leaving the second rank clear to toss out great capture nets. The kneeling first rank let loose a volley of crossbow bolts. The night masks at the battle's front, who were not dragged down by the heavy-weighted nets, were felled by the shower of missiles. The night masters and the faceless began moving toward the door hidden behind the tapestry. Winterheart leapt down from the table in front of them, blocking their escape. The faceless and four of the night masters drew swords. I guess this is what you call a cue, isn't it? Olive asked the actress. Jamal nodded grimly. She pulled back the tapestry, and, with swords drawn, the pair burst onto the dais to back up Winterheart. In the back of the hall, swordsmen of the watch maneuvered right and left on the thieves, and soon steel clashed against steel. There was a burst of light as some thief, equipped with a powerful amulet, teleported from the hall. Three thieves standing behind their fellows aimed wands at the watch. Blasts of eldritch energy issued from the wands and five swordsmen were knocked back by an invisible rain of blows. Moments later, however, all three wand-armed thieves became pincushions of crossbow bolts, a warning to any other night masks that those using magic would be favored targets. On the dais, those night masters not armed with long blades shrank back from the naked steel presented by the two halflings and the actress. The remaining four flanked the faceless. Winterheart squared off against the Faceless and one Nightmaster, Jamal against a second Nightmaster, and Olive against the remaining two. Winterheart dealt the Faceless an immediate blow to his sword hand with the flat of her blade, and her return sweep parried a blow from the Nightmaster who stood beside him. Faceless lost his grip on his weapon. The blade spun across the dais. The leader of the Nightmasks was forced to retreat to retrieve his weapon. Jamal remembered immediately why she'd given up adventuring twenty years ago. The thought of a sharpened steel blade slicing through her skin, her flesh, and her innards filled her with a nauseating fear. In his scornful offering of a sword, Kimball had challenged one of her greatest fears. She wished desperately that she was wearing some kind of armor or carrying a shield. But she knew that in the shape she was in, the weight of the armor would be too great, and she needed both hands to keep the sword before her steady. The goddess of luck must have been looking out for her, though. The nightmaster before her seemed to be neither an aggressive nor skilled fighter. 
Perhaps he'd drawn a blade only to impress the faceless. Jamal held her own, parrying the blows the Nightmaster delivered. She even managed to draw first blood across his arm. Olive was not feeling so fortunate. One of the two humans attacking her was a burly man, quite skilled with his weapon, while the other human was so tall that she had trouble keeping her sword high enough to parry his blows aimed at her head. She'd only managed to ward off a stroke that might have decapitated her, but the cost was accepting a smack to the ribs. Her leather jerkin kept the blade from cutting into her, but the force of the blow knocked the air out of her and left her side throbbing. As if that weren't enough, it appeared as if the assassin Kimball were about to join the two swordsmen in their attacks on the older halfling. Kimball placed his hands on the head of the taller nightmaster facing Olive. An aura of ball lightning erupted from the thief's head. His hair stood upright from his scalp, and Olive could see bolts of energy crisscross the flesh left exposed by the mask. The nightmaster fell forward, steam pouring from his ears. Olive gaped at Kimball with astonishment. If she'd told every halfling in Westgate that the Doe Star assassin had helped her, not one of them would believe her. She didn't believe it herself. Kimball blew on his hands. With a sly grin, he asked, Haven't you ever seen a shocking grasp spell before, Mistress Ruskettle? The remaining Nightmaster, engaging Olive, was distracted just enough by the fall of his fellow for Olive to deal him a critical blow. Kimball moved on to give another shocking grasp to the Nightmaster battling Jamal. In the meantime, Winterheart dispatched the Nightmaster before her with professional precision just before the Faceless returned to the fray. Olive turned to a corner where two Nightmasters without swords cowered, waiting for the tide to carry them one way or the other. Olive barked an order for them to surrender or fight. To the halfling's delight, they surrendered. Jamal and Kimball bullied the remaining three Nightmasters into lying with their hands over their heads. Olive looked out across the hall. The superior teamwork of the Watch was delivering the victory to them. For years they had fought their enemy in the streets, where the thieves could too easily go to ground. Now, however, the Watch's more conventional combat training had the Nightmasks pinned, and the thieves were surrendering in droves. Some lay down or played dead with the plan of creeping off once the battlefront crossed over them, but these were thwarted by the Watch, who dropped heavy nets over them before moving forward. Durgar was in the middle of the room charging the dais, his glowing mace administering his judgment against those who had disobeyed his command. Kimball, Olive, and Jamal stood back and watched as the Faceless attempted a powerful strike against Winterheart, which she parried with a strength beyond any Olive might have credited to a halfling. "'Admit your guilt, Victor Dostar,' Winterheart demanded, "'and surrender to the Watch, or you will pay for your crimes with your life.' The Faceless snarled like a beast, but admitted nothing, and neither did he surrender. He and Winterheart battled on. It soon became apparent which combatant had more skill. Every stab the Faceless delivered to the halfling she matched and bettered. Olive was just beginning to realize that there was something familiar about Winterheart's parries and attacks when the Faceless's blade caught on the fabric of the young halfling's sleeve and tore it away from her arm. Olive gasped and even the Faceless stepped back in surprise. Winterheart's right arm was marked by an azure brand, a tattoo of thorns and cresting waves, with a blue rose at her wrist. I knew she had to be a cheap hero, Jamal declared with a chuckle. Beside the actress, Kimball muttered some unintelligible spell words. A shimmer of light rippled across Winterheart's body, and the halfling began to transform before their eyes. Her frame grew to human size. Her muscles took on the definition of a warrior in training, and her plump cheeks and rounded chin grew more drawn and angular. She became the former defender of Westgate, alias the Cellsword. With the polymorph magic dispelled, the chainmail armor, boots, and cloak she'd worn upon her transformation into a halfling were now revealed. The scar from Victor's ring still blazed across her cheek. Alias swung her weapon with an uncustomary fierceness and let out a blood-curdling battle cry as she dashed at the Faceless. Shocked, the Night Mask retreated three steps, stumbled on his long robes, and fell on his back. The swordswoman stepped up to her foe and set her booted foot down on his sword hand, keeping enough pressure on it to prevent him from raising it. With the tip of her blade, she pried off the coin mask, which obscured his features. 
Victor Dostar's face appeared at her feet. I should make you pay for your crimes now, with your blood, Alias said coolly. But I will give you instead to Durgar for trial. The quick death of a warrior is too good for you. Alias, my darling, no, Victor cried. It wasn't me. It was Kimball. He was never enchanted to serve my family. It happened the other way around. All those years ago, he put me under his spell so he could use my family and finally destroy them. I tried to resist, but he was too strong. All I have done has been at his command. He is the true faceless. Why did he help us in combat then? Olive demanded. And why, Durgar said, climbing the stairs on the dais, did he turn over all the Nightmaster's books to me and dispel all their magic yesterday? Victor glared up at the assassin standing beside Jamal. You will pay for your treachery, he screamed. Pointing a ringed finger at the assassin, he snarled, Gregarish! Kimball grabbed the sides of his enchanted mask, screaming as Melman had when he had been branded. Enough, Alias commanded, smacking at the nobleman's hand with the tip of her blade, leaving a crimson streak across his fingers. Victor whimpered like a child. But a moment later he laughed at the assassin. The brand is permanent, Kimball. You'll never be rid of it. You shall always feel the pain, the vanquished faceless gloated. Kimball tossed aside the white mask with a hearty chuckle. His face was untouched. Sorry, old boy, he said. But not only do you have the wrong man, Kimball's figure began to glow and shimmer as Winterheart's had when she had transformed into Alias, and in a moment he reappeared as none other than Mentassin the Sage. But a magic ring like that hasn't held power over me for decades. If you're not Kimball, Olive asked, who is? Why, Kimball is, of course. Mentassin replied, though at the moment he's chained in the dungeon of Castle Dostar and looks like a feeble-minded sage named Mentassin. And where's Dragonbait? Alice looked up at Mentassin. Where is Dragonbait? she asked. In the swordswoman's moment of distraction, Victor Dostar slid his wounded hand deep into the sleeve of his robe and pulled out a twisted glass vial. He smashed the vial against the floor. Quicksilver dribbled from the broken glassware. The liquid metal glowed white-hot until it bathed Victor Dostar in a glaring light. When the light faded, a moment later, Victor Dostar had vanished. What was that? Jamal asked, blinking away the spots on her eyes. He slid through a dimension door. He could not have gotten far, Mentassin explained. Spread out, Durgar ordered a patrol of his men. Search the entire castle. I'll check the lair in case he tries to escape by one of the portal mirrors, Mentassin said. Silverpath. Faceless's lair, the sage murmured, then vanished. Thistle, Olive cried. He would go after Thistle and try to snatch something from Verovin's horde. Miss said she's at the top of the South Tower, Alia shouted. The swordswoman dashed from the hall with Olive and Jamal at her heels. Chapter 24 Verovin's Horde Thistle Thalivar paced anxiously on the roof of the southern tower of Castle Vamos. Her heart was heavy, her mind uneasy. The evening was not turning out as she had imagined it would. In the daydreams she indulged in all day, Victor had been amazed when she proved she really did know how to reach Verovin's treasure. He had recognized how clever she was and had considered her his equal. He had made her his confidant on all matters of state. Once again, he had declared his love. In her fantasy, they had spent the rest of the evening in one another's arms. In reality, when Thistle had used her grandmother's feather brooch to open the magical portal into the treasure hoard, Victor, although pleased, had not seemed particularly amazed. He had accepted the feather brooch as her token with a warm kiss. But he had been unable to hide his annoyance when he discovered he himself could not use the token to open the hoard. When Thistle explained, that only someone of Verovin's bloodline could use the brooch, the crow market bristled. Thistle realized with sickening dread that Victor was sensitive to the fact that she was descended of royalty and he was only a noble. Even worse, no matter how loyal and loving she was, the nobleman did not like having to rely on her to reach the treasure. The final disappointment came when, instead of spending the rest of the evening alone with her, the Cromark had asked her to wait on the tower while he assembled his forces to help clear out the treasure. Now Thistle waited alone, trying to convince herself 
that Victor was still worthy of the treasure because he would use it to make Westgate a city of beauty and justice admired by all. She suspected, however, that he was not the lover she had dreamed of. The interdimensional portal to Verovin's treasure hung twenty feet from the edge of the tower. By stroking the spine of her feather brooch, Thistle could cause the portal to open just a crack. First a section of the sky would ripple, causing the stars to shimmer. Then a searing white light would flash out from the eldritch rent in the planar fabric. As soon as the girl removed her hand from the brooch, the portal snapped shut, leaving her standing in the dark, beneath the starlit sky. If she held the pin long enough, the portal grew into an oval eight feet across by eight feet high. Once the portal was completely opened, it sent out a dark, arcing bridge to the edge of the tower. Thistle stroked the feather brooch, causing the sky to flash as if with heat lightning. Something hissed in the darkness behind her, and Thistle turned around slowly, more curious than startled. Dragonbait stepped out of the shadow of the tower battlement. He had been hiding there since Thistle and Victor had arrived at the castle. He had seen how Victor had played on Thistle's affections and had watched as she had demonstrated how to use the feather brooch to reach Verovin's hoard. Thistle had arrived with Victor giddy and carefree, but now she was solemn and melancholy. The Sariel hoped that meant he could now convince her to come away from the tower, for he was growing nervous for her safety, for the safety of all of Westgate. Each time Thistle stroked the feather brooch, cracking open the portal, the paladin Shensight sensed a bolt of lightning and went momentarily blind, leaving him with a stabbing pain in the back of his head and a throbbing sensation in his teeth. His Shensight was being overloaded by some great evil that lay beyond the portal, within Verovin's horde. Whatever it was, Dragonbait did not want to risk its release over the city. The pallet in motion for Thistle to come away from the battlement and go with him down the tower stairs. I can't, Thistle replied. I promised Victor that I would wait here for his return. Dragonbait made the sign for danger in the thieves' hand cant. I know all about the dangers, the girl said. Grandmother first told me the tale of Verovin's hoard when I was six, just in case she died suddenly and I became the keeper of the key. Thistle turned away to look over the tower battlement as she explained the history of the key to the paladin. King Verovin's greed is legend, she said. He was so obsessed with hanging on to his treasure that he exchanged a piece of his soul with a lord of the abyss to create a planar pocket to hold his treasure hoard. When Verovin died, the lord of the abyss ordered his minions to loot the king's hoard. Their lord gave them the piece of Verovin's soul encased in amber, so they could use it with the key to open the portal. My grandmother's grandmother, Jen, was the king's third cousin. Jen was an adventurer, a paladin like you. Luckily, he was in Westgate when Verovin died. He sensed the evil things swarming to the royal castle and followed them. He waited until they had opened the portal and had rushed inside. The minions of the abyss left the key and the piece of Verovin's soul on the battlement with a single guard, a true Tanari. Jen battled the Tanari and destroyed it. Then he smashed the amber, freeing the piece of his cousin Verovin's soul. But the piece of soul flew to what it loved most, the treasure. Once the soul was separated from the key, the portal closed. Jen fashioned the key into a brooch, hiding it in plain sight making a green feather the trading badge of our family's house. Dragonbait shook his head at the girl's foolishness. If her ancestor had seen fit to leave the portal closed, why couldn't she do likewise? A lifetime of city dwelling, even in so dangerous a city as Westgate, had left Thistle innocent of the greater powers of evil. Grandmother warned that the treasure might not be worth the price to be paid for opening the portal, but I believe Victor should have the treasure. He will do good things with it, Thistle insisted. Dragonbait shook his head again and wished this girl understood Sauriel, so that he could lecture her on Victor Dostar. He considered dragging her from the tower, but with the battle raging downstairs, the noblewoman was probably safer up here. Thistle stroked the feather brooch again, releasing a streak of light from the portal and delivering another momentarily blinding blow to the paladin's shensite. The Sariel snatched Thistle's hand and pulled it away from the brooch. The girl looked puzzled. She hadn't a clue as to the source of the paladin's anxiety. 
There was nothing left to do, Dragonbait realized, but guard Thistle until Alias came to the roof. The swordswoman could tell Thistle about Victor's crimes. He leaned back against the battlement and waited patiently. The paladin was taken unawares by the sudden appearance of Victor Dostar. The nobleman manifested on the roof with some magical spell. His robes were torn, and he was bruised and bleeding. Catching sight of him, Thistle ran to his side before Dragonbait could hold her back. Victor, you're hurt, the girl exclaimed. What happened? she asked, as she tenderly touched a bruise on his face. There's a battle going on downstairs, the nobleman explained. Night masks and Durgar's men. Kimball has framed me. You must open the portal so I can hide from my enemies. Victor, you did not give me a chance to explain fully before. There are evil things trapped inside with Verovan's treasure. Thistle, there are evil things in the castle down below coming after me. If you loved me, you would not argue. Now open the bloody portal. Dragonbait stepped forward and hissed, but Victor had grabbed Thistle by the waist and aimed a dagger at her belly. Don't try anything foolish, lizard man, the nobleman said. Open the portal, Thistle, quickly. Thistle's face colored with anger, and for a moment Dragonbait thought she might argue with Victor. The moment passed. Thistle collected what was left of her dignity. Giving the nobleman a chill look of disdain, she touched her hand to the brooch. Light spilled out on the tower as the portal grew. A crystal bridge, as dark as the sky, arced over the battlement. Victor collapsed his hand about Thistle's so that she could not remove it from the brooch. You first, the nobleman ordered Dragonbait. The paladin looked aghast at the portal. The waves of evil spilling out sickened him, but now he sensed something worse. Hunger. Something within Verovan's horde was eager to devour whatever came its way. Move it, Victor screamed, poking his dagger into Thistle's side until she whimpered. I haven't got anything to lose by killing her, he snarled. Dragonbait climbed up the bridge and made his way toward the portal. Victor followed, dragging Thistle after him. Just as he reached the other side of the bridge, the paladin drew his sword. He was not going to be devoured without a fight. Victor did not seem to object. The nobleman's eyes had the look of frightened prey, and his mind seemed to be occupied with other thoughts. Alias dashed up the stairs three at a time and burst out on the roof of the tower just in time to see Victor pull Thistle into a magical portal hanging in the sky beside the tower. The swordswoman leaped up on the battlement and stepped onto the bridge leading to the portal. At that moment, the bridge began to retract, knocking Alias from her feet. She grabbed hold of the end of the bridge and hung on for dear life, knowing better than to look at the ground hundreds of feet down. When the end of the bridge came within a yard of the portal, Alia swung herself backward into the planar pocket with only moments to spare before the bridge vanished. The portal snapped shut behind her tumbling form. The swordswoman gasped and choked as she breathed in the mist drifting along the floor. The vapors shone with a yellow radiance and smelled like sulfur. They swirled so thickly they obscured the floor. Alias could see no walls, and overhead there was only darkness. A few feet away, Dragonbait stood as alert as a hunting cat. The tip of his tail and the tip of his sword twitched in nervous apprehension. Alias noticed that the mists, which swirled about her legs, seemed to swerve away from the paladin. Victor, clutching Thistle about the waist, stood off to one side of the portal. He tore the feather brooch from Thistle's gown and slid it into a pocket of his robe. Alias stumbled to her feet and moved toward the girl, but she halted when she saw the dagger Victor pointed at Thistle's throat. "'Where is the treasure?' the Cromark demanded. "'What difference does it make, Victor?' Alias snapped. "'You're never getting away with it.' Victor smiled slyly at the swordswoman. "'No one knows where I am. Noasaurus, enter here. In a few hours, they'll have given up the search, and I can leave with Thistle. You and Dragonbait, though, will have to remain within.' Might as well get used to it. Alias glared at the nobleman, desiring vengeance more than ever. The man had tried to take her life only hours after proffering his love. If not for Mintassin, she and Dragonbait would both have been dead. Mintassin and Dragonbait had counseled her against killing the noble, and she had agreed to turn Victor over to Durgar. 
Now, however, seeing him threaten yet one more innocent, Alias wanted to tear the nobleman's heart out. Yet she realized she had to remain cool. Why don't you let Thistle go, the swordswoman suggested. You don't need a hostage now that you've escaped. But I need to keep you and your lizard friend in check, he argued, pulling the girl closer to him. Alias noted that at least now there was nothing in Thistle's eyes but contempt for the nobleman. The girl maintained a dignified silence. Dragonbait began moving deeper into the planar pocket. Where are you going? Alias asked. I sense evil everywhere, the paladin explained in Sariel. But there is a stronger mass in this direction. Don't we want to stay away from anything like that? Alias demanded. There is not much point to that now that we are in this place, the paladin replied solemnly. He continued onward. Alias followed after the Sariel. Behind her, she heard Victor ask again, Where is the treasure? Maybe there isn't any, Victor, Alias taunted. Perhaps the Thalavar clan frittered it away over the past century. No, Grandmother said no one had ever touched it, Thistle replied. It must be here. Alias rolled her eyes, wishing the girl had been savvy enough to agree, or at least say nothing. Then the swordswoman halted in her tracks. She had come upon an island in the Sea of Mists, a great glowing yellow sphere larger than a man. Just beneath the surface of the sphere, misty shapes writhed and flowed. The swordswoman reached out and touched the sphere's surface. It was as smooth as glass and warm to the touch. It's a giant pearl, Thistle whispered. Dragonbait stepped out from behind the sphere. He spoke to Alias and Sariel. At its core, I sense great greed. The piece of Verovan's soul, Alias guessed. Probably, the paladin replied. What's surrounding it? the swordswoman asked. Dragonbait pointed to the mist on the floor. A pearl might actually be a good analogy, he said. The soul shard is like a piece of grit in an oyster. These creatures have coalesced around it to soothe the irritation it causes them, Dragonbait replied. Alias looked down at the mist. You mean this mist stuff is living creatures? Unformed manes, the paladin whispered. Alias swallowed hard. She would have leaped above the mist if there had been anywhere to leap to. Manes? Are you sure? she asked in common. Dragonbait gave her an aggrieved look. To remind her that he was an authority on evil would be to state the obvious. Manes, Victor asked. What's a main? They're what the Lord of the Abyss sent to loot Verovan's treasure, Thistle explained. But what are they? Victor growled. The form the dead take in the Abyss, Alias explained. Dragonbait says the mist is unformed manes. Victor whirled about, dragging Thistle with him, as if he could shake the mist away. Alias noted there was considerably more of it drifting about the nobleman than around herself. Why so uncomfortable, Victor? That's what you'll end up as when you die, Alias declared. Dragonbait made some comments in Sariel, and the swordswoman chuckled. Pardon me, Victor, she said. Dragonbait says you are not chaotic enough to end as a main in the abyss. More likely... You will be a lemur in Bator, though it is possible you will become a larva since your selfishness is so great. Why are the manes unformed? Thistle asked in an anxious whisper. Alias listened to Dragonbait's reply in Sariel, then translated. They have existed in this place for over a century with nothing but a bit of Verovan's soul to gnaw on. So they've gone misty to conserve their energy. As soon as they sense there's something here to devour, they'll begin to take shape. They'll eat us? Thistle asked with a whine in her voice, her sophistication finally crumbling beneath the weight of her fear. Don't be ridiculous, Victor snapped. She is just making all this up, trying to get me to leave so I can be captured. I want to know what happened to the treasure, he demanded. The Sariel tapped his sword on the floor. Dragonbait says we're standing on it, Alias explained. Curiously, she knelt beside the Sariel, where the mists were thinner, and examined the floor. He's right, she replied. With her dagger, she pried up a brick of solid gold and held it out for the others to see. The floor's paved with these, and there's another layer beneath this one. I wonder how many layers. Victor motioned for Alias and Dragonbait to move back. Dragging Thistle down with him, he knelt on the floor and investigated for himself. He pulled up a second brick of gold and stuffed it into a pocket of his robe. 
He smiled coldly as he stood up. Bits of main mist clung to his back and swirled now as high as his hips, but the nobleman did not seem to notice. Alias exchanged a look with the paladin. She was tempted to say nothing, but Thistle was still in the nobleman's hostage, and what endangered him endangered her. Victor, are you going to wait for those things to draw first blood before you come to your senses? The swordswoman asked, pointing to the mist swirling about the nobleman. Let Thistle open the portal so we can get out of here before we're eaten alive. I am not some foolish peasant you can deceive with your adventurer fairy tales, Victor snapped. It is just mist. A strand of mist swirled about the nobleman's head. Victor swatted at it irritably, then tried to back away from it. His eyes widened and Alia saw fear in them. He seemed to be struggling to move. It was Thistle who verbalized the problem. My legs, she shrieked. Something's holding on to my legs. Victor let out a scream as though he'd been hurt. He released Thistle and slashed with his dagger at the miss about his legs. Alia seized the opportunity. She threw herself at Thistle and managed to jerk the girl away from both Victor and whatever was holding her. The swordswoman and noblewoman tumbled backward on the floor. They came to their feet, choking on the mist, but free of Dostar. Dragonbait moved forward to help the nobleman, but Victor straightened, thrusting out his dagger to warn him back. The paladin snarled and stepped back. The mist still seemed to be evading him, so Alias pushed Thistle in his direction. Then she turned to deal with Victor. The nobleman backed away, apparently having stabbed to death whatever had hindered his movement. There was blood on his hands and dagger, but some of it Alias suspected was the nobleman's own. Victor, we can't stay here any longer. Give Thistle the key, she ordered. Victor smiled coldly. Not a chance, he said. Victor, we could be swarming in mains any minute. We can't fight them all. We'll die. You'll die. You've destroyed everything I have worked years for. At least I'll have the satisfaction of knowing I had my vengeance on you, bitch. Alias shook with fury. She drew her sword and took a step in his direction. You can give me that key or I can slice you in half and loot it from your body. Victor pulled the feather brooch from the pocket of his robe and held it up. Alias reached her hand out. The nobleman laughed and flung the brooch away. The piece of jewelry arced over Dragonbait and Thistle and disappeared into the mists. It made a tiny clatter when it hit the floor. You've gone mad, Alias growled. To Dragonbait and Thistle she said, You'd better start looking for it. Hurry! I'll keep Dostar still. She raised the tip of her sword to the nobleman's throat. Dragonbait took Thistle's hand and led her in the direction Victor had thrown the brooch. Maybe you should give them a hand, Victor joked. Alias kept her sword leveled at the villain's throat. Then again, the nobleman said with a smirk, I don't suppose that will be necessary anymore. Behind her, Alias heard a hiss, then a growl. Alias whirled around and backed up quickly so that Victor would be at her left hand instead of her back. Advancing toward her was a halfling-sized creature with pale white skin, a bloated torso, and razor-sharp claws and teeth. Pus dripped from its mindless white eyes. Alias waited until the mane was just within reach of her sword. With a single stroke, she cleaved the abyssal creature in two, and it dissipated back into a stinking mist. Alias gagged from the stench. My, how valorous, Victor taunted. Alias did not reply. Her attention was focused on the horde of creatures rising from the mists, all as disgusting as the first. Ten, twenty, thirty, she counted to herself, knowing there would be more. Too bad it's vaporized, the noble continued. You could have had it mounted. Show off your... Victor went silent. Alias sensed the nobleman backing away. Dostar, stay at my back, she barked. It's our only chance. Whether Victor chose to abandon the swordswoman or simply panicked, Alias would never know. Whichever it was, the nobleman turned and ran. Alias glanced over her shoulder and saw him trip and fall into the mist. More manes rose up surrounding the down noble, then leaped upon him, rending his flesh with their claws and teeth. Alias had turned away to keep her eyes on the larger horde of manes approaching her, but Victor's screams filled the air all around the swordswoman. The nobleman's death gave her no satisfaction, but neither did she feel any regret. With ice in her heart, 
she charged a flank of the mains, switching her sword fast and hard, felling instantly each creature she struck. They were not tremendously powerful monsters, but Alias knew better than to be heartened by her victories. They could reform again within a day. The real strength of mains, however, lay in their numbers and their mindless compulsion to attack, regardless of any danger to themselves. It was only a matter of time before enough mains formed to overwhelm her. She could choke on the poisonous vapors of their dissipating corpses, or slip on a patch of their slick blood and find herself beneath a mound of their bodies, or just grow exhausted and fall unconscious. The longer she kept the monsters interested in herself, though, the longer Dragonbait and Thistle would have to find the feather brooch so they could escape. As the mains closed in on her, Alias worked at felling their flanks so that she could not be surrounded. She was beginning to regret that they did not remain corporeal. She could have used their bodies to make a defensive wall. In the nightmare of endless slaughter, Alias began to lose track of time. A few of the beasts had managed to evade her sword long enough to slash at her back and arms or sink their teeth into her legs. The wounds were all minor, but they burned like fire. She tried not to think about how much she was bleeding. Then came the moment she knew she was doomed. Her legs would not move. Something held them frozen. She slashed downward with her sword, but the blade thunked against something hard at her hips. She looked down to find herself encased, just as the shard of her oven soul had been, by the mist of unformed manes, which had hardened into a pearl-like shell. The swordswoman switched her weapon from hand to hand, trying to keep the manes from reaching either side of her body, but she was blind at her back. One of the monsters sunk its teeth into the back of her neck, and it took her several awkward stabs before she managed to dislodge it. Alias! Dragonbait shouted. Alias twisted her head, her heart pounding with hope at the sound of the paladin's call. The paladin came rushing toward her, his sword blazing with fire, cutting down manes like a farmer skiving hay. Once at her side, he wheeled to protect her back. We found the key and opened the portal. I sent Thistle out. I think the sooner we leave, the better. I'm stuck, Alias explained, like the piece of Verovan's soul. Dragonbait tapped on the casing about the swordswoman's legs. I didn't know mains could go hard like this, Alias said. The mains that make up this mist are not like ordinary mains. This planar pocket, or the years they spent trapped in here away from the abyss, has altered them, Dragonbait said. He smashed his sword against the casing without effect. The scent of violets wafted from the Sariel's throat, the sense of his fear. Alias, listen carefully, the paladin ordered. These manes are hungry for more than your flesh. They want to devour your essence, your spirit, and your soul. But they can only do that if they can find a weakness. The paladin paused to slash through another wave of manes, then continued. They look for open wounds on your soul and spirit, and drink from them like flies. You have to rid yourself of those things that make you bleed inside. What's going on? Mentassin's voice called out. The sage was drifting across the mists, flying just high enough to remain out of reach of the mains. Lady Thistle's outside, holding the portal open. She said you might need some help. Can you teleport us out of here? Alias asked. Afraid not. Something in the makeup of this plane resists alteration magic, the sage explained. Upon spying the shell surrounding Alias's legs, he gave a low whistle. That looks bad. Perhaps it can be dispelled, he suggested. Dragonbait shook his head. It's not magical. It would be more use if you could circle us with protection from evil, he said. The sage must have already cast a spell to understand Sariel, for he immediately began circling the warriors, casting the protection spell Dragonbait had asked for. When he'd finished, the mains all began moving away. They lingered at the edge of Mentassin's magic boundary, waiting for it to dissipate. The mist, too, flowed out of the circle of protection. The shell about Alias's legs, however, remained. Trying desperately to conceal his own anxiety, Dragonbait spoke as calmly as he could. Concentrate on your feelings, he instructed Alias. Clear your heart of everything that poisons it. Verovan's soul was cut by his greed, Victor's by his lust for power. Victor's dead, Alias said softly. The mains got him. I know, the paladin replied. 
He did not mention that he could feel the man's evil spirit hovering nearby, no doubt waiting to witness the swordswoman's death. You have to let go of your anger and hatred for Victor Dostar. Alias did not reply immediately. She didn't know how to tell the paladin that she didn't wish to do as he bid her. She cherished her anger and hatred of the nobleman. Victor had deceived her in the worst way. She had every right to be angry, to hate him. The Sariel sighed, realizing how hard it must be for Alias to give up the powerful emotions. They had fastened themselves so strongly to her essence that losing them would feel like losing herself. She could not accept that there was so much more to her being than these poisonous, wounding feelings. He ran his fingertips down the brand on her sword arm, trying to kindle a spark of the link that bound their souls together. Alia shivered at the paladin's touch. She could sense his great serenity, his compassion, his tenderness and concern. She knew, though, that she was nothing like him, would never be, could never be as good. There were times she wished she were, but wishing did not make it so. Dragonbait looked up suddenly at the manes massing behind Alias. He could feel their evil darkening, growing more powerful. Alias struggled, but she remained trapped in the mist shell. Alias, please, the paladin begged. Let it go. I know you can do it. I can't, the swordswoman snapped. I've tried. You can, Dragonbait snapped back. No, I can't. She doesn't dare, Mintassin interjected. It's her only protection. Protection? Dragonbait growled. It's trapped her in this evil place. How is that protection? If she gives up her anger and hatred, there's nothing left but bitterness and despair, the sage pointed out. Why would she want to feel them? The paladin nodded. Bitterness, the shadow of anger and despair, the evil without a color. He wasn't very familiar with them, so he'd forgotten them both. Mentassin knew them, though, intimately. Alias, what Mentassin says is true. You're holding on to the anger and hate because you're afraid of the bitterness and despair. You know they'll hurt you even more, but you can shed them, too. Trust me. I am not bitter and despairing, Alias shouted. I'm just stuck in a damned rock. Go get Durgar. Maybe he's got some priest prayer that can break this thing open. Behind Alias, the mist was taking on a serpent shape and the serpent was rising up. Alias, there isn't time, the paladin insisted. Your life depends on it. Let them go. I have no reason to be bitter or despairing, Alias argued. Victor was a monster, and I'm well rid of him. He wasn't worthy of my love. I know that. It's not the loss of that worthless man that brings you pain, Mintassin said. It's the loss of the love you felt. Your love was good, and when it died, it left you empty. The Miss Serpent began winding around the border of the spell of protection. Alias glared at Mintassin. I don't have time for stupid conversations with sages. What do you know about my love? You don't know anything except what you read in your dusty old tomes. Oh, don't I? Mintassin replied, holding her eyes with his own. Do you think it was easy for me, watching someone I cared about, fling herself at someone as unworthy as Victor Dostar? Alias felt as if the wind had been knocked out of her, as if she'd run into a wall of understanding. When she'd first arrived, the sage had cared less about Westgate than she had, but for some reason he'd been there to save her life. Then he'd thrown himself into her quest for vengeance. Now he stood in the stinking, godsforsaken, evil-ridden pit of a planar pocket arguing with her. The swordswoman flushed with embarrassment. Why did he have to tell her this? So the question is, Mentassin said, if the lowly sage survived his battle against bitterness and despair, why won't the great warrior woman risk battling them too? Alias squeezed her eyes shut, trying to keep tears from falling out of them. Mentassin was right. She missed her love. It had made her feel warm and safe and happy. But she could feel those things without it. She knew she could. Besides, she might even love again. Maybe. Dragonbait sighed with relief as the shell of main mist began to melt from Alias's legs and drift away from the adventurers. What in Meister's name is that? Mentassin whispered, finally noticing the serpent-like evil wrapped about the circle of protection and hovering over them. The mains have found a focus, the paladin said, a leader to organize their attack. 
Alia spun around and looked up at the serpent of mist. She looked into its bright blue eyes. She gasped. It's Victor! Move toward the portal, the paladin instructed, taking Alias's arm. The circle of protection should move with us. As the three adventurers shifted their position, the serpent hissed with anger, but it uncoiled and let them pass, unable to withstand the magical constraints of Mentassin's spell. It followed them to the portal, devouring mist as it moved, growing larger and larger. The portal loomed ahead like a hole of darkness. Dragonbait stepped out onto the bridge and held his hand out to Alias. As Alias stepped into the night sky over Westgate, she took a deep breath of the cool air and laughed. Mentassin flew out from the portal and swooped over the bridge. Dragonbait gasped and spun about. His Shensite suddenly perceived a hundredfold increase in the evil emanating from the main serpent. Mentassin's circle of protection had dissipated when he had flown through the portal. The serpent wavered over Alias's head and struck before the paladin could pull her out of danger. From the top of the tower, Jamal, Olive, Thistle, and Durgar watched in horror as a huge dark serpent swung down over Alias and coiled around her body. Dragonbait thrust his fiery blade into the creature and Alias stabbed at it with her sword. Little bits of glowing mist seeped from the creature wherever it was hit, but the beast remained intact healing over the cuts almost immediately with some otherworldly power. Mentassin hovered over the beast and sent five magic missiles shooting into the creature's hide, but they passed right through the monster and fell to the ground. The serpent brought its head down to survey the warrior woman in its embrace. Noxious poison dripped from its fangs. It opened its jaw and brushed its tongue along her face. It was toying with her before it devoured her, lording its power over her, just as Victor had when he had embraced and kissed her poison-paralyzed body. Close the gate, Olive shouted to Thistle. If I do that, the bridge will collapse. They'll fall to their deaths, the girl argued. Durgar, Lady Thistle said the place was full of manes. Aren't they some sort of undead? Jamal asked. Maybe this thing is too. Use your power to turn it away. Durgar looked exceedingly doubtful of the actress's suggestion, but he began a prayer nonetheless asking Tyre to compel the monster to flee. "'It's working!' Olive shouted. The serpent began to turn translucent, all except the tongue, which took the shape of a man and fell from the monster's mouth to the ground far below. The body of the serpent began to turn to mist, which drifted quickly back through the portal. Unfortunately, the part of the serpent that had been coiled about Alias was no longer over the bridge. As the coils dissipated, the swordswoman fell with a shriek toward the ground, to be caught by the arm of a flying sage. Mentassin set the swordswoman down on the roof of the tower just as Dragonbait stepped off the bridge. They turned to watch the last of the mist escape through the portal, fleeing from the power of Durgar's god. Thistle flung the brooch across the bridge and into the portal. The bridge retreated and disappeared, then the portal snapped shut leaving the top of the tower in darkness. Olive leaned over the battlement and stared down at the ground. Members of the watch held torches aloft as they surveyed the dark shape that had fallen to the ground from the top of the tower. It's Lord Victor, one of the watch shouted. He's dead. He just fell from the tower, another guard cried out. No, Olive whispered to Jamal. He fell a long time ago. Chapter 25 Curtain Call The day after Lord Victor Dostar, Crow Mark of Westgate, was found dead at the base of the southernmost tower of Castle Vamos, Mentassin the Sage held a private tea party to celebrate with four close friends. The Faceless was dead. The Nightmasters and many of the Nightmasks had been killed or captured. The deadly magic once at their disposal had been destroyed. Citizens of Westgate were tossing the remains of bullies and thieves into the harbor. They had a lot to celebrate. Mintassen sat at the head of the table in his workroom with Jamal the Thespian and Olive Ruskettle on his left, and Alias the Sellsword and Dragonbait the Paladin on his right. The boy Kel had been banished to an upper room to work on learning his letters with his new tutor, Mercy. The former Night Mask had accepted his and the half-elven girl's banishment with such grace 
that it caused Olive to mutter, Who's teaching whom and what's being taught? After taking a sip from her mismatched mug of tea, sweetened with five sugar cubes, Olive returned to her interrogation of the conspirators, as she had come to call Alias, Dragonbait, and Mentassin. So let's see if I have this straight finally, the halfling said. After Kimball shot Dragonbait and kidnapped him, Mentassin followed Kimball and knocked Kimball out. How'd you get the drop on an assassin as sharp as Kimball? My superior tactics and skill with weaponry, the sage said. He was invisible when he stuck up on Kimball. He hit him on the head with a rock. Dragonbait signed in the thieves' hand cant. Jamal laughed. Then you rescued Dragonbait, polymorph Kimball into yourself and yourself into Kimball, and feeble-minded Kimball, all so you could find out what Victor was up to. Mentassa nodded. Yes, actually the double polymorph and feeble mind was Dragonbait's idea. Figures, Olive said. Paladins are a sneaky lot, and Dragonbait's the sneakiest of the sneaky. You stayed in character pretty well, Jamal noted as she poured a hefty dose of brandy into her tea. Especially considering Dostar brought you a dying alias. You must have some acting blood in you after all. If I'd known at that time that Dostar was the faceless, that he was upstairs poisoning alias, the sage said softly, I would have come up and stopped him without bothering to stay in character. Fortunately, knowing the Faceless had iron golems at his disposal, I had actually prepared a slow poison spell. Because iron golems sometimes breathe poison gas, Alias explained. But the golems at the ball were the cheap Thane kind, so they didn't, Olive noted. Then you faked Alias's death with a phony tattooed arm. Where did you get the arm? the halfling asked. Hamhawk with a polymorph spell cast on it, Mentassin said. Before that, though, came the hardest part of the plan. What? Convincing Alias not to go storming up into Castle Dostar and run Lord Victor through with a sword. But why did you turn her into a halfling? Olive insisted. Because it fit with our plan, Alias said. When I recovered from the poison, I told Mentassin about all the things Victor had ever said to me. Learning of Victor's fascination with Verovin's hoard gave Mentassin an idea. He knew Lady Nettle's brooch was the key to the hoard. You knew about Verovin's hoard? Olive exclaimed. Mm, for about eight years, the sage answered. And you never did anything about it? Mentassin shrugged. I don't need gold. Bite your tongue, the halfling demanded. Such blasphemy! As if it isn't bad enough that Thistle drew the key back into the portal so that no one can ever reach all that gold again. She was also making sure the mains didn't escape, Olive. To get back to your plan, Jamal insisted, you knew Victor would go after Thistle, so you became a halfling to help protect her. Since House Thalavar trusts halflings and hires them, Jamal guessed. Yes, Alia said, although I didn't do a very good job. Thistle fired me. I guess I didn't make a very good halfling. You weren't so bad, Olive critiqued. A little too bossy and crabby. Well, I did use you for a model, Olive, Alice pointed out. Olive did not comment on the swordswoman's claim. Instead, she asked, Why couldn't you tell me, though? And me, Jamal seconded, glaring at Mentassin. I'm really sorry, Jamal, the sage apologized. But at first, we didn't realize how much Dostar relied on Kimball for all his information. If Dostar had other spies watching the two of you, he might have learned you weren't really grieving. I made sure Blaze House had room for you before I followed Dostar's order to evict you from my house. As it turned out, Victor left everything to Kimball. He trusted me alone in the Faceless's secret lair. I was able to use a wand of cancellation on all the Night Mask's magic. That's also how I managed to get so much damning evidence on Victor and the Night Masters. I needed it, too. Durgar was hard to convince. He insisted on interrogating Dragonbait, too, using another mage as a translator. But Durgar still isn't willing to admit Victor was the faceless? Jamal said with disgust. No, he admits Victor's guilt, Mentassin replied. He just doesn't want the rest of Westgate to know. He's a phrase it will cause unrest. Well, it certainly makes me unrestful, Jamal growled. He put the fox in charge of the henhouse. So Durgar is going to stick to the story that Victor died trying to find Verovin's hoard in order to make Westgate a better city? Alias asked. Why is Thistle letting him do that? Thistle has her own agenda, Olive said. 
as does a certain actress who had agreed to go along with the tale. Alice looked at Jamal in surprise. Thistle is going to get Durgar elected the interim crawl mark. Thistle and I like the idea of the interim crawl mark owing us a big favor, Jamal explained with a grin. Why? Alias asked suspiciously. The noble houses are in disarray. This is the time to push for giving the people political power. Before the end of the year, I intend to see that every man and woman in this city has a vote. Everyone? Halflings too? Olive asked. Oh, really? She's not that crazy, Mentassin said. He threw up his hands to ward off the looks he received from both the halfling and the actress. Just kidding. Didn't mean it. Thistle has agreed to grant votes for other merchants and small shopkeepers and craftsmen, artisans and scholars, Jamal explained. I'll talk her around to the rest. Back, though, to the conspirators, Jamal insisted. Did you ever find out why Victor hired you to go after himself? Wasn't he taking an awful risk? Alias looked at Mintassin. The sage leaned back in his chair. According to information Durgar gleaned from Kimball, Victor was very concerned about rumors that the Harpers wanted to clean the night masks out of Westgate. Harpers? Olive asked. Harpers, Mintassin explained. They're this semi-secret organization who are supposed to work for good. Yes, I know all that, Olive said. What do they have to do with it? Nothing, as far as I know, Mintassin replied. But Victor learned that Alias had connections to them. The nameless bard was her father, Olive said. Yes, yeah, she told me, Jamal answered. But she's not really a harper, Olive said. Well, when Alias started fighting with night masks her very first evening in Westgate, Victor thought she must be a harper agent, the sage explained. But why hire her? Because with the magical misdirection that's cast on her, Victor couldn't scry on her. If he hired her, she would report right to him. He was careful to make it look like Lure's idea. You still look puzzled, Olive, Alias noted. Well, I'm just wondering about the rumors Victor heard. It wasn't me the Harper sent to Westgate. I came down here for some time away from them. I hadn't even heard that they had any interest in the area. I wonder who else is down here. Why would the Harpers send someone to Westgate when they have a perfectly good agent here already? Jamal asked. She flipped up her collar to reveal a silver moon and heart pin. Olive's eyes widened and she laughed. So now that you've taken care of the night masks, where are the Harpers going to send you? She asked. You misunderstand, Jamal said. I've assigned myself to Westgate. My next assignment is making sure everyone in this city is given political power. Jamal is like you, Olive, Alias said. Jamal is like you, Olive, Alias said. Finder befriended her when he was in Westgate and pinned her before she knew what she was getting into. You aren't the only rogue Harper. Olive laughed. Finder always did have a soft spot for troublemaking redheads. I was actually hoping you might assign yourself here, Jamal said to Olive. We can make our own little rogue contingent. Now that has possibilities, Olive said. What about you, Alias? I know Dragonbait wants to get back to the Lost Vale, but your name will carry some weight in this town for years to come. Interested in politics? Thank you, Olive, but no. I've had my fill of Westgate for a while, Alias said with a smile. I'm heading north to the Lost Vale. Too bad. Well, we'll still have Mintassin. He can be our honorary advisor, like Elminster the Sage is for the big boys up north. Mintassin coughed politely. I'm afraid not, Mistress Rustkettle. I've got a few adventures planned away from the city. Where to this year? Jamal asked. Beastlands? Arcadia? Astral? Lost Vale, the sage replied. Why? Olive asked. There's nothing there but Sariels. Dragonbait chuckled. Alias asked me to visit, the sage said. Dragonbait and I could use a mage when we travel, Alias explained, and Mintassin wants to learn more about Sariels. In the alcove, Mintassin's tea kettle whistled. Be right back, the sage promised, heading toward the back of the workshop. Let me give you a hand, Alias offered, following him. She's taking away our honorary advisor, Olive pouted. Yes, Jamal said with a mock frown. Dragonbait drained much of his tea and set it down on the table. He knocked for attention. 
Haven't they both just taken care of the night masks for you, Harpers? He signed. Yes, both women agreed grudgingly. Shouldn't they both be rewarded? Jamal and Olive nodded. I move that Alias and Mintassin be allowed to adventure happily ever after, Jamal said. I second that motion, Olive agreed. All in favor? Two hands and a reptile claw went up. Any opposed? No. Motion carried, Jamal announced. In the alcove, Alias stirred tea into the pot as Mintassin poured the hot water. The sage leaned forward. The swordswoman leaned forward. Their lips hovered inches apart. Unable to contain the giddy feeling inside her, Alias turned her head away and giggled. Mintassin scowled. Are you sure you want my company? he asked, trying to hide his fear that she was laughing at him. Alias looked back at the sage. Light danced in her eyes, and she smiled. I'm sure, she said. The sage grinned and leaned toward the swordswoman, and they began the dance again.